enough, then you're not trying hard enough. I think I've got that quote a little bit mangled, but there is some truth to it. If it's not, if it's not audacious enough, keep trying because I think the audacity of science is part of its charm. Thank you, Janet. I'm just, uh, I'm, we're just checking our, we're having a little technical issue. It was not, it was supposed to be uh, streaming live to Facebook. Um, we have, I see a very nice snapshot of you on Facebook. <laughs> Somebody took a little virtual photo. You're, I think you're smiling. Sometimes they get awkward. You're like, oh, that's a weird photo. Uh, there are a few pictures out there hanging at me during the Explorer, uh, the Human <laughs> Mars Summit. We're like, oh, yeah, who, oh, you know, so, <laughs> so no telling. What I would interject is that for those, including my team, um, to um, change any of the messaging that we've gone to YouTube and it's 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 streaming there on my YouTube channel. So that uh, will 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 to give us a little time to to uh, transition that. Um, I will encourage people to. We have a um, a book website out called SpacesOpenForBusiness.com, and if they go to I think it's slash bonuses or there might be a button. We've got this really incredible array of bonuses. And it was influenced by the one and only Tim Ferriss. A friend of mine said, you got to check this out. And 10 years ago, Tim Ferriss did something called the 48 hour land rush. And he wanted to break some record and use bulk sales and bonuses or bulk sales to encourage uh, bonuses to encourage bulk sales. And he did it over a couple of days. And I said, well, that's neat, but spaces even more outrageous. And I wanted to really manifest and articulate um, the democratization of space and show the breadth and diversity of space products and experiences, whatnot. And we have bonuses that are free. And then we have some that, that will truly take your breath away. And so I encourage people to check that out. And for those who have not actually seen the book, I'll kind of stand up and it might blend in a little weird here because it's similar to my VR background is here's a copy of the book. This is actually the hardback one. It looks good. Pretty it good. looks great. I'm, I'm Art is beautiful. The art draws you in. Who is your artist? The artist is a company. Um, they're called Humoring the Fates. Um, I think their URL is fates.com. They have a specialty in animation and, and really have a specialty in 2D animation. And they, um, uh, their lead and some of their illustrators did some wonderful hand-drawn um, hand drawn illustrations. And I wanted that to sort of lighten up the feel of the, of the text um, distinctively because it kind of is a nice counterpoint. Sure. No, it looks so beautiful. I am so super proud. I just, I'm, I'm excited for everybody to get their hands on your book and uh, and read it cover to cover, dog ear the pages and go, oh, I got to come back for this one. This one is good. So well, I wish you all the best, my thank dear. Thank you so much again. Have a wonderful day. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. And, and, ne and next we're going to have a, it's going to be a little bit of a recorded call from um, some sponsors from uh, a guy named Tim Draper, who created Draper University. He is a multi-generational, I think he's almost a second or third generation venture capitalist. Um, he started an educational program called Draper University, more for adults, uh, you know. And, he, and so some of his uh, team are gonna share about um, Draper University and they're also participating in the bonus uh, packages. So Janet, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, everybody. That was Janet Ivy of Janet's Planet. So we're if, going to. If it's not outrageous Whoops. enough, then you're not. Oh, okay. So YouTube is working there. So give me a second, friends. I'm going to share my screen. I think we're going to do this. A shared computer sound. We're going to uh, bring in our friends from uh, Draper University. So let's hear. Without further ado, we're going to hopefully let's try this one more time. Okay. <laughs> 
Oh, Hi, this is Robert that. Jacobson again. I want to welcome, well, excuse me, welcome um, uh, two new friends. I have Fatih and Alexandra from Draper University. Welcome. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much for the invitation. We are extremely excited uh, for being here and being a partner in your book launch. Congratulations about that. Thank you so much, Alexandra. So you guys are both, uh, I think you've got, you're in Colombia and Fati, you're in Barcelona. To just tell, give us a little introduction. What, what, what's your role at Draper University and do you get to spend any time at the, when they do have the, uh, I guess the in-person on campus events in San Mateo, are you periodically there as well? <laughs> Sure. So let me introduce myself. My name is Alexandra. Everybody calls me Ale. Uh, I am the admissions director and manager of the deal flow for Draper University. So basically, I support all the entrepreneurs throughout their journey in Draper U. Um, yes, uh, whenever we have a session at the U, we really enjoy to be around all the entrepreneurs and support them uh, throughout their journey and their program. Uh, we also enjoy Survival Week with all of them. So, <laughs> yes, we love to be part of the program, too. Yeah, awesome. and this is Fatih here. I'm the program manager at Draper University. I basically lead all of our entrepreneurial programs. And it's always awesome to be around entrepreneurs and, you know, like-minded people, uh, like, around us. And it's awesome to be near San Mateo and, you know, like, hosting all of our all of those entrepreneurs from all over the world. Very cool. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, Fatih. So tell me a little bit about what the um, about why Draper University was established and a little bit about the online program, which is one of the bonuses that we're, um, we're including as part of the book launch. Sure. So um, Draper University was founded by Tim Draper, who is a third generation venture capitalist from Silicon Valley. Um, he decided to create Draper U in order to really support young entrepreneurs. So he has a really big um, entrepreneurial ecosystem in San Mateo. Um, and uh, the program was mainly focused to really uh, connect with entrepreneurs in a really, really early stage uh, and support them throughout the whole journey. So we have, uh, we go from research to funding. So uh, Draper University is the educational portion in order to connect entrepreneurs with the Silicon Valley and also give them all the tools they need in order to succeed. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and, and maybe I can give a little yeah, more information hey, jump about in, online jump programs. Out. So since like COVID this year, unfortunately happened and we had to cancel our physical programs because our programs are, you know, in residence, so in the building. So we need to host our entrepreneurs in the building in San Mateo, but due to COVID, we couldn't do that. And we basically turned everything online for this year. And in our online program, we basically teach entrepreneurs uh, how to be an entrepreneur, how to start their businesses, how to start their startups. And we basically teach them and give them a little bit of taste of being an entrepreneur. And, and that's been great so far for this year. Yeah, and it also gives them the opportunity to really connect with entrepreneurs from all over the world. So it will help you grow your network. Uh, and also you will get the opportunity to have mentors that will give you some feedback about your business, some feedback about your pitch. Uh, and you will get the opportunity to also apply for a demo day. So you will get uh, a chance to really pitch your business to Team Draper and get maybe feedback or hopefully or we don't know, funding. funding. <laughs> Cool. And are, are students uh, and uh, applicants welcome to apply from around the world to the online program? Actually, yes, almost all of our students are international. So in the first session, we have students from 36 different countries. This, it, this is unbelievable. We have people from almost everywhere in the world. Uh, our classes are super diverse in terms of countries, in terms of ages, in terms of industries. We have people working on blockchain, working on space, working on AI, like e-commerce, software, anything. So like we have basically a, like super diverse classes. 
Awesome. And there was something you hinted to that I was unfamiliar with, f- familiar with but I'm guessing, uh, I can guess what it is. You were talking about, was it Survivor, Survivor Week? Or <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about that. It sounds like there's, um, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, to, to inform us a little bit. <laughs> Sure, Fatih, you can, you can explain more about Survival Week. You love Survival Week. <laughs> we can't really share much about okay. it, but it's basically a leadership and team activity. So we basically take our entrepreneurs to a remote area, somewhere in California, and teach them how to survive uh, under different circumstances because we really think that uh, life of an entrepreneur is kind of similar uh, of a survivor. You know, like this, yeah. like everything pretty much changes every day. Market changes every day. Your customers, you have customers one day, you don't have customers on the other day. One day is really good with your startup. The other day is like, you know, kind of chaos. And you don't really know what's coming next in your entrepreneurial journey. So we see a lot of similarities in between survival life and entrepreneurial life. So we basically teach them, you know, how to deal with um, surprises, how to deal with different circumstances, and at the end of survival week, they realize when they become a team, basically, when they act like a team, everything is like being easier. And as, as, as soon as they adapt themselves to circumstances, I mean, changing circumstances, they better do, I mean, they, they better enjoy the survival, they better do things hundred percent. And as you can see, uh, our type of education is completely different and disruptive. So uh, for the online program and for the in-person program, we really try them uh, to work on their business. Yes, work on their business plans and uh, the goals that they need to achieve, but they also need to work on themselves as an entrepreneur because at the end, they're the ones that are really pushing the company. Uh, and without an entrepreneur, there's not a company. So that's why we really focus in, in support them uh, and build them as an entrepreneur. And resilience, it probably build up a lot of resilience because it's hard work and, and you know, you need to just kind of toughen up yourself. And if there's an area we've all met, you know, we all have things that we don't like to do, but we have to sometimes work on them to try to improve because in, when you're in a leadership role, especially as an entrepreneur, you sometimes just have to do the things you might not be comfortable with. Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. 100%. Uh, so, so you you talk you hinted to the the verticals that you're that Draper is particularly interested. in. I know uh, it sounds like blockchain and artificial intelligence, and space is also included. And I think space is kind of a fun one because it's interdisciplinary and it's a lot more than just building rockets. It's actually about um, many different um, topical and domain theses that that can um, be informed and inform. It, it, it's just very, it, in a lot of ways, it's very interdisciplinary. It's just not, it's not space. As I said in my book, it's not a monolith. It's actually a lot of different types of things. Yeah, yeah totally. Well, yeah, Tim always says, uh, like we teach feature instead of history at Trip University. So space is definitely the feature. And space Definitely. is one of the fields that, you know, like when you apply to the Rick University or when you apply to any, other, any of our programs. So we ask what industry are you working on and space is one of them. And we definitely support um, like entrepreneurs thinking future and like focusing on 10 years ahead, 20 years ahead, like maybe 50 years ahead. And space, as I said, is definitely the feature. And we really uh, support and we would we love to see work, entrepreneurs working on space or working something related to space. And do you find that with, with that, those who are working in an area, do they get opportunities to connect with um, either other alumnus from the program or other entrepreneurs that are maybe, you know, a space lady or guy entrepreneur, can they maybe you know, collaborate or say, hey, there's somebody else working on something very interesting, virtual reality or something. Are there opportunities for at least them to network and, and effectively? Absolutely. So when they, when someone joined Draper University, they become the part of the Draper ecosystem. Draper ecosystem includes basically Draper University, Draper funds, all of our alumni and like many other things that we basically provide to entrepreneurs. And we basically like uh, onboard like all the participants to our ecosystem, which means that they have the chance to talk to our alumni, they have the chance to talk to our like portfolio companies, 
which Tim invested in a lot of like space related companies, including yeah. SpaceX. So he, he, he is one of the investors of SpaceX as well. So we basically intro them to our alumni, intro to our portfolio companies so they can grow their network in space business, basically. And also, um, we, in the in-person program and also the online program, we get the opportunity to bring mentors. So uh, if we get the opportunity or we see a huge uh, amount of people working in an industry specific, so we make sure that uh, these needs are covered during the program. Oh, we cannot hear you. Oh, excuse me. I was using your mute, mute function. Um, um, so I want to encourage um, those who are um, listening to the party today to check out Draper University. It's a, a featured bonus um, as part of the book launch. And it's been really excited to have uh, Tim and his, his this big ecosystem that he's been growing because um, cause I, cause I know that uh, he, he, he sees it like I do, that things like blockchain and space have they might not be obvious at first when you think about how do these things connect, but they actually really do because what we're talking about of new systems and new ways of being and potentially new transparencies, new applications and new infrastructure. I mean, we're really talking about building the Star Trek, Star Trek future we've all seen on TV today. And this is actually happening, I think much more rapidly than, than many people um, might, might believe. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. We are looking forward to also read your book. Congratulations about this launch, uh, and we are really happy for being part of this uh, book launch. Uh, and we wish you a lot of success. Well, thank you very much, Ali, and thank you, Fatih. Thank you for spending some time here, and we'll continue to be in touch. So, everyone who's watching the live stream of this, you know. You can check out uh, Draper University and we'll make sure to be posting some links in the stream. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Okay, friends, let's see here. Let me go back to uh, just one second and go back to our. Uh... Let's see. Okay, let's just see. Um, just get a comms check. Hopefully we're all good here. Okay. Wow, that was, thank you so much for Ali and Fatih from Draper University. Um, the founder, Tim Draper, had some very nice words to say about the, the book. And the Draper University is there, they're providing bonuses as part of the book launch. So what I would encourage people to do is if they've not yet checked out the bonuses, you can, uh, you can go to the, um, spacesopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses and check that out. And also look up Draper University. I want to thank uh, Tim Draper and his team. Um, I just learned um, that let's that the book debuted number one on um, in two, a couple different categories, um, which is pretty awesome. And I'm just checking this here. It says uh, apparently in... Um, private equity, um, I think private equity, and then biotech, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so number one there, thank you so much people for supporting and please share. Um, let's just see. It said that the um, video may have disappeared for a moment, but we're back. So uh, before I bring on my next guest, I wanna just share, um, say thank you to my fantastic team um, I had uh, production help in, in making the book, you know, the physical design of the book. Um, Julie Karen, who's, who lives out in Europe, she's a Canadian living in Europe, fantastic interior designer. Um, and, uh, and then I had my book editor, Vanessa DeHorsey, my gosh, in collaborator. I mean, she's been incredible, fantastic help. And then on my social media team, I've having Leandro Taub, Remco Timorans, Marco Van Deb, who's been doing a kick-ass job and on the e-commerce side and um, kind of landing pages, Jonathan Taub doing a fantastic, wonderful job. And, and also I wanna take a moment to thank some of my sponsors for the um, initial part of the book project, which was Hypergiant Industries out of Austin, Texas and Space Chain and um, co-founded by Jeff Garzik, who is a well-known blockchain entrepreneur and also now um, astropreneur. 
So now I'd like to bring on um, a dear friend of mine. We've, we've been friends for over two decades now. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, we had an amazing adventure in Indonesia. And I know there was a reference earlier by Janet to a, a guest on the um, broadcast from Indonesia. So Salamat Malam, I think it's the evening there for our Indonesian guests. I have a, um, our next guest and I have definitely a soft spot in our heart for Indonesia. I was actually married there um, in, in Bali, Indonesia and, and, and have spent some time in Indonesia before. So I really, um, really have a fondness for the people of Indonesia and the country of Indonesia and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to make the book accessible to, to people in Indonesia too. Um, cause so I'm going to bring on my next guest who, um, her name is Tanya T bird Ridgely. Um, she is an artist, an entrepreneur, um, an amazing performance artist using the flute and her voice and movement. And she has been spending some time living in China, um, teaching, uh, about entrepreneurship and leadership skills in schools and universities in China. And she most recently developed something called the Impossible Summit, which continues as something known as the New World Network. And I, in, in, I've been kind of, I guess, um, sharing a bit about my passion with space with T-Bird for a number of years and get in. And now it's great to see that she is collaborating and bringing some of her other communities with people in the space community. And I think it's just going to be a really awesome mashup what she's been developing. So without further ado, hello, T-Bird. Good morning. <laughs> it's so great to be here this morning and to thank you for that warm welcome, as well as the reference to Indonesia that we love. And I just want to say congratulations. It's, this is really exciting. Um, I've been watching you develop this for a long time, and I think that you're bringing really important work into the world. And I am just I'm just so thrilled to be in your life and to watch it happen as well as to however little bit of part that I can be a part of. Um, I feel like this new way we're entering into at this time, you know, with space and what's going on here, going on here on earth. So this is fantastic. Congratulations, Robert. Thanks, T. <laughs> and, 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 and so you're going to be participating as part of our bonus package. I think they're, they're sort of some of the mid-level packages and, and sort of curating a, a very special experience. And, and maybe you'll have to find some videos to post of, of some of your works. It's, it's something that has to be kind of more experienced, but if you can maybe just share a little bit about, about that, that would be awesome. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm so glad that you asked me because everybody out there um, who has heard or seen me perform, it's funny because, um, you know, space and music and I think frontier and pioneering and just cosmology, all of these things that I connect tend to get translated, I think, in how, um, you know, I just, it's kind of our display. I feel like I'm, 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 I'm a vessel that brings um, this kind of music through that is very, gosh, I feel like it's from another world um, and sort of a combination with all the music that come here that comes from earth from classical world to experimental music but somehow i feel like outer space the universe constellations planets all influence the style of music that i make so when you asked me to be a part of this i was thrilled because you know these last couple of years i've been leadership facilitator running business though my music is one of my superpowers and um, it was such an honor to say, yeah, let me put together something very special as an artist. Because um, <laughs> I have to admit, I do miss a lot of that um, as I've gotten older and, and stepped more into businesses. You know, we went to CalArts together and here we are now. <laughs> yeah. um, so everybody, you know, um, I'm putting together something very special that incorporates storytelling, um, that incorporates looking at... Um, things from multiple perspectives, bigger view. Um, yes, you'll be watching and also sometimes um, we'll be interacting a little bit because I've always, even when we were able to be live, always felt it was important to 
be in connection with the audience. So it didn't feel like I was here and you were there. So I'm always aligning um, all of my work together. So we'll be looking at bigger views, the importance of where we're going next is humanity, um, tapping into our imagination, um, what are our roles in all of this thing called life. And it'll be done in a way where I'll be telling stories, playing music, as well as getting you involved. So I'll just leave a little bit of that mystery there so that you can utilize your imagination, but we'll be hanging out for about 60 minutes and um, it's going to be a blast. So I'm very excited to be a part of this and to just play. <laughs> Thank you, T. And, and, and a reminder that um, one of our mutual friends had reminded us in a call last week that I always love is that, is that you always bring us right back that it's all about love and engender that and you really inspire me to try to do that more because you know I'm a dude and I get into interest in like the hardware the the techie thing <laughs> and you know it's like guys and their toys that kind of stereotype and and you <laughs> remind us that like hey it's actually a, a, there's there's other things going on the human wear not mm -hmm. just the hardware is really important and 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 like earth is our most important in our first spaceship. So mm -hmm. besides this expansion into the heavens, it's it's about you know improving life for the lot of everyone here on Earth, and it, taking care of our environment here. So it so I want to remind people it's not like an either or. It's mm -hmm. kind of like it's a big party. We we'll want everybody to participate, and we want to take care of everybody along when we as we as we move forward. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, thank you for bringing that in. And it is, I love that I'm being, that I'm represent that for a lot of people. And it really is about love and not about some hallmark fluffy thing. It's about a certain kind of consciousness and even learning how to love people that we don't like. And I feel like we're living at a really important moment in our evolutionary process. Um, and I think part of my job is to help everyone see themselves um, in the bigger picture. Uh, and what I love about how I'm sort of a shape shifter and ambassador between many different communities is pulling all the communities together to show how important space and what we do here on the planet and what we do in our hearts and what we do in our personal relationships all relate. I mean, we have to, in, in many ways, learn how to work together better, how to support each other better um, and, um, and I believe that that comes from bringing our head into our heart space, particularly when we're starting to have to work with difference, have to get out of our own silos with everything that's happening. And so if we can merge our head and our heart, um, we're able to find safety, similarity, excitement, um, allow even more innovation, diversity to come about. So I feel like part of my, um, role is to is to help people feel that way and to get excited about experimenting with um being in the heart while bringing all of our gifts and talents and our intellect right around it so i'm very excited about this and i think that this is also going to be a lot about what um my offering will be about how it all connects so thanks for bringing that in Robert. Oh, you're welcome t can mm -hmm. you also share um just where people can, can find you and they can learn a little bit about the the network you've been developing maybe the overview collective a little and, and the possible summit share maybe share a few of the urls we can put them share them we'll share them out on social media or, or, or end in the zoom chat absolutely so um a couple of things everybody so um I'm up to quite a bit a lot um, since uh, getting back to the US in many ways. Um, as Robert mentioned, I've been living in China and I'm actually one of those people who got displaced because of the virus. So I'm back over on this side of the planet and, um, and doing a lot of different things. So um, right now uh, I'm in the process of um, building out something called the New World Network and we produce the Impossible Summit in the spring that brought together people who've done seemingly impossible things to unpack it as a roadmap um, to engage in conversation of what's our bigger story or, uh, around us as humanity, where do we go from here, what do we need to move through discomfort. 
And now we're getting ready to um, launch an event continuing off of that. But the topic this time is building impossible relationships, bridging difference and engaging the paradox. And um, so I'm always curious about, you know, what would happen um, if opposites not only attracted, but actually instead of competing with each, with each other, completed each other. And so it's sort of an appropriate time to bridge difference. And I've got some really amazing people on board, uh, some from the space sector, uh, some from arts, some from um, the political sector, uh, you name it, empathy, storytelling, difference, um, learning, you know, uh, how to love people we don't like so that we can all take care of this beautiful earth spaceship together. So if you want to kind of stay in the loop about that um, and find out more, you can write to connect at the new world network .com. Uh, You can also visit our Facebook page called the impossible summit. Um, and uh, RJ, I don't know if you need me to put it in the chat, but I can always send. Yeah, you can throw in any things in, in, in the chat. Yeah, certainly. Okay. And um, <clears throat> you can also Catch me on LinkedIn, um, T Bird Love, to leave me a message um, to find out some of the work that I was doing in terms of bridging difference and team building through the heart over in China on T Bird Love. And if you want to learn a little bit more about my music, um, which I'm so happy that you're bringing back to life because these days, um, unfortunately, only a special few have been blessed by that as I've been taking a different role. Um, but all coming back. You can connect me at tbirdloveinfo at mystrikingly.com and I'll also put that into the chat. And um, yeah, so I, I look forward to connecting with you all. And um, by the way, you also mentioned the overview effect, which is um, where I tend to hang out on Wednesdays. Also with you, um, inspired by Frank White um, and uh, just a great group of people uh, there um, who are all about space as well as what's next for us as humanity and so many of the folks in that community I've become dear friends with and are and will be a part of the impossible summit in sort of this bridge work to bring space more out into other communities so that they can recognize the importance of it as well as bring diversity and more other communities into space to continue you know opening it up so I'm, I'm just really excited about where we're going and thank you again for having me inviting me and i'm just so thrilled excited proud and honored to be in your life and to witness you really in a lot of ways wow. helping to lead culture forward it's such an honor robert thank it you really i love you so much um, i love you so, so much, much. Mm -hmm. and and uh, actually many years ago i wrote a piece for T-Bird. It's called T-Bird Love. You can find it on, I think, you know, the iTunes of the world. And, uh, and it was, it was kind of this little bit of tribute to somewhere with just a little bit of like even a little Indonesian influences, I'd almost say in the in the composition. So they could check that out. And I, I want to answer a couple questions. Somebody asked about is the book going to be made um, an audio version? Yes, the audio version will be done pretty soon. It's close to being done. And the narrator is actually going to join us today after 5 p.m. Eastern. So if you stick around or come back, you know, 5 p.m. onwards, you'll get to, to meet the, um, the narrator of, of, of the book. And also want to give a shout out to one of, uh, some of my early um, marketing help with the book, Danny Salinas. Um, who, who really inspired some, uh, some of the crazy ideas. Thank you so much. And so T, um, I want to thank you very much for your, um, your time today. Um, so it's um, Tanya Tiber Ridgely. Thank you very much. And we're going to move on to our, our next Sounds guest. Good. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everybody. And Robert, I look so much forward to continuing to connect. And um, thank you, Mary Liz. Much love, everybody. Bye, T. Okay, I'm going to bring our next guest is the is Rachel Lyons, and Rachel is the executive director for Space for Humanity, which is a an amazing organization. And I've heard that they were recently ranked as one of the most influential nonprofits in social media, which is just um, kudos to you because Rachel, you guys are a fairly young organization, and to have 
um, risen so quickly and become so influential in our world and really our solar system because that's we're talking about like uh, Earth through space is really impressive. So welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for ha for inviting me, Robert. Yeah, thank you. So Rachel, tell tell me a little bit about your your story and your background. What's your sort of origin story in, for space? Mm hmm. Totally. Um. Yeah, and it is, it's super exciting. We're in the top 100 nonprofits in terms of online engagement. And I have to say that's because of our amazing social media manager. His name is Seb and his main account is called Boss Planet and they have really great space content. So definitely recommend Boss that. Planet. Boss Planet. Um, so, yeah, Boss Planet, B-O-S Planet. And then you can follow, if you want to follow us online as well, which we, we're more over, I heard you guys talking about overview effect. We're more overview effect focused. Um, that's at Space Humanity. Um, my personal story, which um, is, yeah, I, I saw Mary Liz commenting in the chat box. Mary Liz, I, Mary Liz and I just talked about this last week, um, is when I was 19 years old, I never had a, I did not have an interest in space. It wasn't anything that I cared about. Um, and then I watched the first episode of Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos and I just had like an awakening experience. It, it was like my own version of the overview effect. And um, I knew after that, like just everything changed and I was already studying engineering, but at that moment I knew I was like, I wanna be in aerospace. So I switched over to aerospace as a student. I got involved with all things space, um, said students for the exploration and development of space the AIAA, all that. And then I met Frank White at a conference a few months later when he announced the overview of, he, he talked about the overview effect. And, um, and it was with that that I realized that that was why I was there. It was the, it, the potential that space can have to shift our perspectives and how that perspective shift can change our behavior in the world change the way we treat each other and change the way we treat, change the way we interact with our planet. I think you're, oh, you're muted, Robert. Oh, so when, when you first met Frank at a conference, did you ever think that you would later, like he would become an even, I mean, I mean, you talk with him all the time. I mean, you probably see him once a week, you know, at least weekly. Uh, did you have any idea that, you know, back then? No, no, but if I told 19 year old me that that happened, she would be thrilled, like awestruck. Yeah. And what about, we both share um, a common interest, something I haven't done this year, 2020, of scuba diving and spending time under the oceans. Mm -hmm. what, what have you found about the kind of that experience of being underwater as maybe compared to, 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 to space and like alien mm -hmm. environments and weightless and... Totally. Yeah, I love that you're asking this. Um, you have a good memory. So <laughs> yeah, I spent a lot of time scuba diving when I was a teenager. It was before I ever loved space, but I loved exploring those underwater worlds. And, um, and I do, and I think that that opened my mind to like the possibility of different kind of environments that where life can live or just different kind of environments in general. Like I feel like it primed my mind to like allow for the imagination that that space um, uncovers. So, so I think that it was like the exploration of those other worlds, which are our, which are the seas that then made me, once I like primed my brain for being so passionate about the exploration of, of outer worlds. Have you, have you thought about the, um what is it? Um, is it Europa where they're talking about doing an underwater mission, you know, using a submersible on Europa. And I think that is just, I mean, I think the helicopter on Mars is cool, but I think a submersible on Europa for me, just because I really like being underwater is just mm -hmm. gonna be an amazing thing when, when we have that, um, that tool, that ex exploration tool out there, what we might discover. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there's so much, there's so much to think about, about like what could be possible in those, like underneath the surfaces of those. Um, I love, yeah, thinking about all the possibilities. And then I think about what was that movie? Um, there was a movie when 
like aliens come from another planet and they're like oh. these like aqueous creatures. Yeah. Um, they were found underwater, but they were found discovered underwater. Um, mm -hmm. okay, somebody from the chat, it's the abyss. Is it? I don't think that's what I'm referring to, but it's possible oh. that there's more than one. Does anyone? Yeah. Um, does anyone in the chat know what we're talking about? Yeah, I know that. There was a film that Cameron James Arrival. Cameron did. Arrival. Yeah, that's yeah, much more recent. They kind of look like I think they're kind of based on like squid. They kind of had squid octopus like features to them, and mm -hmm. um, in the language, and that was all about time and language and relationships. It was yeah, beautiful film. I loved the Arrival. That was a really mm -hmm. um, a different type of film that I was initially thinking of, but it might be worth seeing. It'll probably look kind of hokey to you. It's called The Abyss. I think it's a James yeah. Cameron film, but it's mostly underwater. It's more of an action film, but I don't want to give too much of it away. But there's, I'll say, aliens underwater. I'll, I'll leave it, leave it at that. Great. Um, yeah, but it, I would love it's to got watch some, that. Amazing, some of the cinematography and what they had to do back then was amazing because they actually shot it underwater, and um, it was, I think, it was borderline dangerous. Some of the things that they did, but. Um, but I don't think anybody was was hurt on the filming of that. Something else I wanted to ask you about, and it's and it's probably it's a hallmark feature for me of what of what Space for Humanity is creating, is this opportunity for citizen astronauts. And I know you're gonna have an application coming open in 2021. Can you share what you're doing, why you're doing it, and then how people could could part potentially participate or how they can you know apply? Totally. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's interesting now I'm like in an alien world in my mind. Um, I'm just want to add that we, so one thing, so, okay, actually I'll start from the beginning is that, yeah. so I'm really passionate about the overview effect. The overview effect completely changed my life. Like I had my own experience of it, like I said, and I see from the moment I learned about it, I was like, what if everyone had this perspective? How would it change the world? How would it change everything? And um, so then I was lucky enough to be in the audience and Taylor announced um, Space for Humanity. Also, it says my internet connection is unstable. Are you hearing me okay? Okay, great. Um, You're good, And Rachel. he... Thank you. And he said that basically what Space for Humanity is working to do is sponsor people from all around the world, all different cultural backgrounds, all different um, places in life to go to space commercially with Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, the space perspective, um, to, so that they can have that overview effect experience and then come back down and share it with their communities. So what Dylan talks about is that space is a tool for transformation. It's like it's like how that first episode of Cosmos impacted me at that level. It is a tool that we can use to transform people in the world. And so that's what we are working to do. And by sending people who aren't just NASA trained astronauts or um, from, from that very small demographic, it's like people who are leaders in their communities, people who can um, speak to their communities and inspire their communities about the, the potential of this perspective. Um, and then, oh yeah, this is what I wanted to say before is that um, we're launching, so like I have been working on this project for, I don't know, maybe three or four years now and I've been the executive director for almost two. And, um, and what I've realized is that like me thinking about space and thinking about the overview effect and speaking about this mission on a daily basis has like trained my brain to think from that global perspective. And that's like, that is literally the goal here is like to have people think from this global perspective. And so because of that, we're, we're working on some educational content right now. So first, what we'll be, we'll be releasing the next two weeks is the overview sessions. So it's a talk series where people talk about different global challenges, or, um, or their perspective on space or something else. And then it's all in the context of that overview perspective. And um, we'll be interviewing steady people in the next few weeks. So just more, if, if people like the alien talk, the, we'll, be, we'll be having a lot of that. Excellent, that sounds awesome. And so, and so how can a, a potential, a future citizen astronaut um, apply for the, I think the um, the applications that are reopening in 2021. 
Um, they can go to our website, spaceforhumanity.org. Um, and then they will just, yeah, they just submit an application. We're working on the process right now. We're looking, like I said, for people who are leaders in their community, people who are committed to making an impact, people who have done, you know, ha have shown their commitment to um, bettering their communities in the past. So people who are really gonna use this trip for good. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so people, even if you think you're, if you, 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 maybe you're saying, oh, I'm not an astronaut material, I could never do that. Go to Space for Humanity's website, look at the content they're creating in their mission and give it second consideration because I actually think you might actually be qualified. You know, don't mm -hmm. doubt yourself. Um, you know, you might, you, Space for, for Humanity is going to provide hopefully many people uh, at, mm -hmm. over the years to be able to actually go to space, hopefully have um, a paradigm changing cognitive effect known as the overview effect, bring that back, be an ambassador, because um, it's really about helping our helping our world, and this is a really great uh, a great mission. Mm -hmm. So, Rachel, thank you so much. So this, we have Rachel Lines, the executive director of Space for Humanity, who uh, who uh, you know you're a space humanitarian. Thank you for your work um, that you're doing mm -hmm. daily. I appreciate. I really, thank you for for um, spending some time with us for the book launch today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Okay, talk to you later, Rachel. Bye bye. Bye. So before we go to our next guest, I'll, I'll just uh, share um, some other uh, shout outs. Um, I wanna thank my uh, couple business partners of mine, uh, Keegan Kirkpatrick. Um, we are partners together in Space Advisors and it's a spaceadvisors.com, it's a consulting service. Um, we help define space strategy for companies and that are looking to define a space strategy. We work with other space companies um, also another partner is Nova Spivak, a really renowned inventor, uh, founder, co-founder of the ARC Mission Foundation. Um, he's just incredible, incredible person. I'll give shout outs to them. Also want to thank um, another one of my early, um, uh, people who did uh, a marketing partner, um, Yasmin Denari. Um, Yasmin, if you're looking, if you're if you're out there today, hope you're safe and well. I think she's uh, I think she lives in a fire prone area, and hope uh, her and her family and her her doggy are safe and well. And we thank you her for her help. Um, so I think we're gonna maybe just show a little video next before we bring on our next guest. So for those who are on the the backstage feed on Twitter, you can kind of see me doing the backstage stuff. So here. We're gonna next, let's see, bring on, hopefully, I'm gonna do gallery view, speaker view, screen share, desktop. Okay, peeps, we're going to share, hopefully, this is my, hopefully, can you all comms check? Can we, uh, hopefully, hopefully we can see this it's a short video, so let's just uh, give me one second. We're going to play this video. This is from Scott Farr, who probably almost no one knows on this call, but he's. I'll let, get, let him introduce himself. How's it going? This is Scott Farr. I'm a flight instructor over here at Whiteman Airport in Pacoima, California. And I just wanted to say congratulations to Robert on the book. Robert and I have known each other for over 20 years. We've had a lot of great adventures in aviation and uh, exploring the space industry. And I'm so happy space is open for business. It's a great book. And I just wanna say we've had some great adventures from the time out in uh, Mojave Air and Spaceport when uh, we witnessed Mike Melville pilot Spaceship One the first civilian spacecraft into space. It was a pivotal, inspirational moment for both of us. Um, it inspired Robert to continue pursuing the commercial space industry track, and it inspired me to pursue aviation and go on and get pilot certificates and become a flight instructor. 
you know, it was a very pivotal time for both of us. So I just want to say congratulations. And I am so excited to check out Space is Open for Business. All right, congratulations, Robert, and I'll see you soon. Space investor and entrepreneur Robert C. Jacobson is releasing his first book, Space is Open for Business, to provide readers with an insightful guide to the evolving space industry. Over 100 experts, including industry leaders and investors, share their insights into the economics and strategies for leading the trillion dollar race to commercialize space. Jacobson has spent over a decade working and investing in private space flight and provides a comprehensive overview of this transformative industry. This book allows everyone to understand the integral role space plays in our lives and how it will continue to transform our world. Hi everyone, I'm back. Thank you so much, that was Scott Farr. So yeah, Scott Farr and I go way back. We were both really affected deeply by that, that first pre-competition flight as part of the XPRIZE competition. It was the pre-competition flight of XPRIZE of Spaceship One, which we saw on June 21st, 2004. He is an outstanding um, flight instructor. He is also uh, a great teacher, you know, kind of math, physics, and he's a incredible guitar player. I mean, this guy plays guitar. He is, it's, um, he has, uh, he's a big fan of guys like John McLaughlin, for those who may or may not know him. And Scott has an album that I helped co-produce many years ago called The Jazz Farm. Recommend checking that out. It's, it's a fun, fun recording. Um, I also want to give a few uh, uh, thank yous to um, some other production people who, who helped me along the way on this, on this ongoing journey. My um, video editor, Shin, CalArts alum, I, I forget, I don't have her um, website right in front of me, so if somebody could dig it, dig it up, that would be awesome. But Shin is a wonderful um, videographer and video, uh, a, a video artist. But she also is an editor and helped me create that video you just saw. And I want to thank my my the voiceover on that, um, who who, who I'll, I'll keep her anonymous for now. But she's as she is, she's so close. It's well, uh, she's my wife. Okay, I gave it. I couldn't couldn't hold that back. But my wife did the um, did the uh, beautiful narration on that video. Um, so I think we have a um, a, a vid we have a question. Um, Let's just take a couple of questions. Um, what stock market listed space companies can people invest in it? So that is a great question. So Virgin Galactic is now a publicly listed company. Um, I think their tick, ticker sim, sim, symbol is SPAC, something like that. Um, it's, that's the holding company that owns Virgin Galactic. There's also now things like mutual funds, ETFs, essentially that hold other stocks that have aerospace, um, that are either aerospace companies. Um, there is one called uh, UFO. It's, um, it's run by a company called Procure and they um, run a, so the UFO ETF owns and, and trades um, space and aerospace focused publicly listed companies. We have not seen many um, recent uh, public initial, initial public offerings in um, part because there's been a more active um, uh, M&A market 
um, where companies have just chosen to not go public and, and remain private or been acquired by their private companies. But I, I think over time, I don't know uh, really, um, I can't tell you when, but I think we will see more companies going public. Um, um, I think there's been, there's been rumors of some, I'll say satellite constellation companies going public, but they're just rumors, no, um, none that I've know, know have, that have listed just yet. Um, also, again, I want to um, thank my, um, my book editor, uh, Vanessa DeHorsey, who, who did a Herculean job and it's been great uh, working with her. Um, so I'm going to take a quick um, check, comms check here on like checking, making sure everything is kind of going going relatively, I think everything's going smooth. And I think our, our next guest, um, I'm going to see if he's actually here. Um, I don't know if he's not on just yet, but um, we could actually bring him on early if he is um, um, Rick. If Rick, Rick, if you're if you're around, um, you're welcome to join join me early. But if not, we'll we'll still bring you on as is. So I'm just gonna like check here where it's an interesting thing where the people again on the on the Twitter feed are able to to kind of see backstage. But that's just that's kind of cool. So we'll kind of like vamp here slightly for um okay so i think we're i want to maybe bring in let's just see kind of like looking all these new questions okay so again we're we're live on we're live on twitter which is 62 mile club we're also live on YouTube and that YouTube, what is that YouTube uh, link? Um, I need, I'm going to try to find it here so we can share it. The YouTube link is, um, it's the channel, it's, let's just see, I think if you look, it's called Launch Party of Space is Open for Business by Robert C. Jacobson. And the channel is my name, Robert Jacobson. It's got my headshot. Um, See if I can find a little more, it's uh, the details. So I don't quite know if there's a the specific URL on YouTube, but that's where we're streaming on YouTube is Robert Jacobson's YouTube channel. I look for my headshot and it's the launch party. And we've got, um, let's just see the, uh, oops, uh, let's just see. We've got, um, we've got some people who are um, checking out both and both streams, so that's good that they're working. And let's just see some of the tags that we've got here. If you need to look for tags or new space, my name, Robert Jacobson, space is open for business, that hashtag. Um, okay, a few questions. Uh, what's my personal favorite chapter of the book? Um, but I, th I think the culture, I think the culture, there was the one and specifically some of the stories, um, there's some stories about a, a Chinese film that came out in winter 2019. It's called The Wandering Earth. And I went to go see it um, as soon as uh, my friend who, who uh, uh, Adi, um, told me about this film. And he said, this is gonna be an important film in China. And it's gonna talk about it, it's speaking to the Chinese people on why they're going to space, how they're a spacefaring nation, how um, engineering and science will, will um, be effective solutions. It's kind of an outrageous film. It's sort of 2001 meets Armageddon, but it's really fun. I think it is streaming on um, on uh, uh, English speaking um, streaming channels now. It's worth seeing. Um, I think that was kind of a, a favorite a favorite chapter. Um, and what about what black swans? What we night? Uh, um, this is from Mary Liz Bender. What black swans might we not be seeing in the future of space tech? Um, well, I don't know. I, I think there could be, I mean, I would say, I don't know if this is a black swan, but if we had, when we have um, other humans killed, whether it's in an industrial testing accident or a flight accident, I think that might take, cause some momentary pause, but um, human sacrifice has, is gonna be part of this endeavor, for, unfortunately. Um, throughout our whole history, you know, to, to push, you know, sometimes to innovate, sometimes people have had to make, you know, life sacrifices. So 
I think we just tried to, <laughs> we need to attempt to be mature and proactive um, about this. Um, but in terms of black swan businesses, I think areas around life science and maybe material sciences could be some, in, potentially have some interesting discoveries in space that'll be beneficial to earth. That's just uh, my guesstimate. And that first question was from uh, Z, uh, Zev Kirsch. Um, and there's another one. Um, what do you think, what role do you think art plays in advancing the space industry? Maybe this one was from Mary Liz Bender. Um, well, I think arts are, arts allow us to the, the freedom to navigate somewhere between the conscious and the unconscious. Describe whatever you want to think as unconscious, whether it's spirit, whether it's, you know, universal creative energy, uh, create, you can use whatever label you want, but I think that when we're involved in the creative flow, whether we're, we're programming something, whether we're painting, whether we're writing poetry, whether movement, you know, you get into this when you're when you're in a in a state of focus, and you're not stressed, but it feels really really great. You're in a flow state. You can you know that's when new things, thing being whether it's an innovation, an invention, a piece of art come to potentially fruition, and I think arts have a way of helping articulate the stories around space. Um, making us feel space, giving us other, other measure, other, other tools for measurement, not even measurement, other ways to, to feel, be, absorb what this ginormous um, topic we're talking about. Because space is interdisciplinary. It's, it's um, international. Um, I mean, right now we have astronauts of I'm assuming of different nationalities, at least Russian, U.S., and maybe European, and, 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 and maybe Japanese. Not sure right now at the moment. I don't really keep track of like who's usually on on the International Space Station. But every day, it's a it's a tool for cooperation and diplomacy. It works, despite all of our challenges here on Earth. We're making it happen. I hopefully, I answered that, and we can come back to that. And maybe I'll ask my next guest a bit about that, about um, the role for. Um, for arts in space. So without further ado, um, I want to bring um, my dear friend, um, Rick Tumlinson. Um, he's a, uh, he, he, he's a entrepreneur. He's, he helped, he and his colleagues at the Space Frontier Foundation, which he co-founded, helped um, create the word, the vernacular that we're using, things like the word new space. That's from Rick and his colleagues. And Rick is also the chairman and, and um, co-founder of a venture fund called Space Fund. I see, see he's wearing their, the hat today while representing it. Um, he, um, interesting dude, he's leap year guy, born in the UK or lived in the UK, lived in California for a long time now, very happy in uh, the Austin, Texas area. So Rick, welcome to um, the launch party. Hey, Roberto, thank you. Can you hear me well? I'm using a new uh, webcam here. So. I think you could be a little bit louder. We can hear you, but if you could be, maybe turn your input on the mic up a little bit or get closer proximity to the microphone. Right, here's what I'm gonna do. It's gonna change dramatically. I'm just gonna yank it. Okay, we'll just give a pause there for-, for Let's See if we can- uh... Uh, Hang on. Yep. Well, yep. Can you hear me? Your audio is good, but we don't see you. So you might need to go into your preferences. On yeah, maybe, uh, I'll do that while we're talking here, but uh, so, hopefully I can talk. Yeah. yeah, so Rick, you know, what are the role, uh, I just I want to, I'm going to piggyback or, or continue a question that, that I think Mary Liz Bender had asked in one of the chats is the role of the arts in, in space, in yeah, um, we go out into the frontier, as I call it. Uh, we go out there as, uh, as humans. Um, and as humans, that means we take with us um, all of our culture. Um, and that includes uh, business, technology, science, and art. 
So it is part of the human experience. It is a uh, critical element, in fact, of our human experience that we're able to go out there um, and bring and bring that to it. Because remember, the the concept of art, poetry, um, um, uh, music, uh, literature, these kinds of things, those are in many ways our predictive capabilities come out of that, but also our, um, our celebration. Uh, so we're not just going out there to, to, to make money. We're going out there as human beings, uh, fully realized cultural human beings. So I think that we're going to be seeing um, as costs come down, thanks to the work perhaps also of Space for Humanity, uh, other, other groups like that, we're going to see more and more um, artistic endeavors in space. And, and it's not just art, like let's go up there and do a painting of the earth or something. Um, I'm interested, frankly, let me see if I can get this thing to work here. I am uh, diligent. Um, so I'll be a passenger in the back of the ship. They won't let me near the tech. Just, just to be clear, but... Um, there we go, Rick. There we go. Can you hear me and see me now? Yeah, um, I think so, yeah. Maybe sit a little bit closer. Let's just see. Let's Can you just hear see. Me now? Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So that little camera is cool, but they're fighting with each other. Tech does that. So anyway, look, I, I'm excited by it. You know, there's so many things I want to see in the artistic realm as far as uh, opening up space. I, I would love to see a multi-axis, three-dimensional pirouette by a ballerina. Right. Or, you know, or a ballet dancer. Uh, I mean, there's so many different things. And we'll start seeing that as we get more access. But the key right now is to create that access, to open that up so we can get those folks out there. And as you know, Robert, um, and, and is as part of your book, is that we have to get the costs down for it to be opened up for people to go. But the more the merrier. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the art. R so Rick, a, a common question that you and I get asked is with all the challenges on the earth and some of our fellow species members being um, maybe not as mature as others, how do we make sure that we're gonna like, you know, behave well in space and take care of our planet? How do, how do those sort of maybe contradictions connect with um, what we're trying to sort of pushing the envelope and moving into the space frontier? Well, you, you set me up there with the, the word contradiction, so I'm going to have to contradict you, my host. Thank you. Um, it isn't a contradiction at all. It's the same. Look, we, we live in space. People haven't realized that, right? We are literally in a tiny little bubble floating in a vacuum that is basically infinity wide. And it is the awareness of, of who we are within that bubble that is to me potentially transformative. I know you, I think you got Frank coming on next. Yep. But I don't want to step too much on his uh, philosophical uh, realm. We can let him take a, a lot of that on. But I'll tell you this I, I believe that going into space is the next level of uh, interacting with our possible maturity. You know, we, we are imperfect. Right now, we are apes with guns and rockets. We're only a few thousands or tens of thousands of years into this whole being human thing. We haven't gotten it figured out. We still go back often to our lower tendencies. But it seems that every time we move forward, we get a little tiny bit better, a little tiny bit better. And I believe that by going out into the frontier, um, that gives us a new place to, to get even better. I believe that we're gonna end up saving the planet partially from the things we do in space. But it is really a realm that is, is critical to our, our growth as a species. I love the Earth. You know, you know me, you know I'm a green, I'm hardcore, um, and my uh, nonprofit Earthlight is all about protecting the Earth and expanding the domain of Earth. And I'll end with that point. The point is that so far in human history, the growth and um, in, 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 in industrial evolution of human society has been an outright attack on the ecosystem in this planet. As we move into the frontier, we're going to be able to start reversing that. 
We're going to be taking life to places that are now dead. We are going to be using the tools we are able to create in space to sort of lower the levels of damage we do here. And we're also going to be interacting differently. The frontier is based partially on the concept of reuse, recycling, repurposing. You don't throw anything away in a frontier philosophy. So that is a, is a great model for the future. I think it fits perfectly if we shift from the Cold War space program model into this new model. Thank you, Rick. Um, shifting a little bit to um, business, uh, which is part, part of this greater discussion and, and the title book, Space is Open for Business. Um, congratulations on closing um, one of your funds. Um, so so space, fun, space Fund Fund One, I'll call it that, whatever the, I'm sure there's some legalese name for it, but congratulations on that. And Rick is, and his peers are um, investing in promising, enabling startups, kind of this frontier technology, if you will. Um, Rick, what do you see any opportunities in the lesser known area of uh, consumer space, space consumerism, uh, business to consumer, those opportunities? Yeah, I think that um, this is something I've been big on for a while, but it's really kind of, you know, we grab onto these things and, and uh, I think that one of the big breakthroughs that, that is coming in terms of um, creating profitability in space, in, in terms of creating an economy in space, is the development of um, products that are sellable to consumers. Um, now, right now, there is basically one product that is sold directly to consumers, and that's like Netflix, you know, DirecTV. Uh, the beaming down of, of imagery, uh, of, of information that is in on your TV set. I think that there are companies coming along that are going to build on that. Uh, we've just invested, I guess I'm announcing it here. Um, we've just invested um, um, in a company called Sen, uh, which is uh, looking at sending down 4K video from space. Uh, just imagine, you'll be able to look on your you know, your, your iPhone or your, your Android or your Apple Watch and see where you are on the earth live in video. Um, that's a product. Um, I see other products that I can't get into, but we are talking to one company that is the kind of product that can be manufactured in space and you could literally go to a store and buy it. Now, of course, it being made in space is part of the prestige branding thing that you do. Um, and um, it will be expensive, but these kinds of products are going to, to start showing up. And I think that those are some of the products that are really going to um, uh, open space for businesses, one might say. Very cool. Um, there's some, a couple things I was reminded of. Um, that one was from Mary Liz Bender in the chat. Um, she talked about uh, Dr. Adam Diaper is your man regarding um, creating beauty through movement and weightlessness. And he is actually participating in our bonus packages where we're going to have um, an opportunity with Adam where he is one of a handful, there's probably just two or three people in the world who are experts at the using the human body in microgravity. He started his career as a circus performer, earned a PhD in physics, and has done essentially um, choreographed dances in microgravity environments. And I think there's a, also uh, a dancer choreographer in France. So that's gonna be, um, he's, uh, Adam's part of that. And that's a kind of a, a, cons a consumer opportunity uh, where people can learn, you know, what are new ways to just use my body thinking about like the space environment. So I think we need to think really broadly about what will be all the uses in space or, or, or here on earth in terms of how a a regular person consumer to use things, but points taken regarding um, satellite TV and communication services, which we've had for a long time, but we're now using new types of satellites to deliver some of those capabilities in other frontier areas and even other areas that are just remote, whether um, that don't have things like high speed internet. Some people don't even have dial up modem access on this planet. And I think when we start being able to give millions, if not billions of more humans on the planet access to internet and education, I think that is gonna be also a very enabling um, uh, opportunity. I mean, just having internet and that's gonna be because of, uh, because of space. 
and I really like this idea um, that Rick was talking about, you know, using this um, this company's, I guess, satellite sensor sense to be able to see our Earth anytime, 24-7. I mean, that would be a beautiful thing. Um, really wonderful. Um, if people go to um, spacesopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses, they'll see the different packages because we have uh, pa bonus packages. And there's a number that are actually including some new opportunities for space consumerism. So look through the list and, and check that out. We're trying to, again, Rick, try to really manifest and engender this uh, the idea of, of the de democratization of space in showing the full breadth and width of some of the opportunities that are available today um, to, to people. Uh, and not just like the, uh, you know, just a few, you know, just a few, but to many. Um, so Rick, I want to thank you so much for joining us, joining us today on the, um, on the launch party. Super, super fun to have you and wish you and the Space Fund and the Earthlight um, teams well. Are you going to be having, question, will you be having an event this fall? Because for the past two years, I have been a no-show at Rick Throws, a really great party, but I, I, ha I had good reasons, but, 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 and I know there's COVID going on right now, but I want to know what is going to, are you going to have something for this November? Sure. Um, we're probably going to go ahead. I actually, it was funny, the International Astronomical Conference in uh, Earthlight New Worlds, which I'll explain in a moment, um, were the first two conferences to cancel this fall because we thought it might be a little hairy. Um, and that was back in, I think, February. Um, we are uh, going to skip on over to 2021 in the fall. Um, and it's, uh, it's going to be exciting. And I, I should explain just real quickly, um, Earthlight is sort of a, the home of a philosophy. It is, it's about this concept of our purpose um, in the universe. And what you'll hear a lot more of, because we've got a new team working on it, we're going to roll out a website soon, is the New Worlds Institute which is the same brand as the conference. New Worlds Institute is sort of like Dr. O'Neill's original Space Studies Institute in that we're focusing on the technology, the tools, um, and building that sort of uh, engineering infrastructure, et cetera, that you're gonna need to live and work in space. Now, the reason I mention that is New Worlds Institute will be managing the conference next year. Um, it'll be here in Austin, and of course, of course, we are coming back with the Space Cowboy Ball. And awesome. we're going to um, transform both. The, we're, we're taking this interlude uh, and using it as a moment to transform both events. So you'll start hearing more about that uh, probably in about a month or so. We are considering doing some webinars on specific topics under New Worlds. Um, uh, we're looking at things like um, technology that we might use in space to help save the planet, um, space resources, those kinds of topics with sort of world-class experts. Um, so yeah, it's, it's gonna be an interesting fall, but uh, we'll be back for uh, real to real. You know, it's funny though, one person suggested that we should go ahead with the Space Cowboy Ball because it is a costume ball about a hundred years in the future. So like everybody could wear spacesuits, but we thought, you know, it's kind of cool, but eh, you know. Um, Robert, I, I wish you so much the best on this. Uh, I know how much work you've put into it. And um, the more translators, the more speakers, the more communicators we have using their own voices to explain the immense possibility of what is happening right now uh, and the potential it has for everybody, not just the rich boys and their toys, not just for the, for the government or some elite group of people, but for everyone. Um, the more people like you we have, um, the better it's going to be for everybody. So I'm honored to be here, and I really wish you well on this book. I think it's going to do uh, magnificently well, my friend. Rick, thank you, brother. I, I, I really appreciate you being here today. Wish you continued success, and, um, and we'll see you again soon. So that's Rick Tomlinson, um, co-founder of Space Frontier Foundation, Earthlight Institute, Space Fund, among others. We'll list his his uh, website, we'll put, I think his primary website, we'll, we'll send a couple of them out. You know the what you should say, Bob? You should just say Rick Tomlinson, professional ADD guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that, Rick. Rick, be well.
<laughs> Talk to you later. Okay, everyone, we're gonna, um, before we bring our next guest, we're gonna have a, a, a video. Um, so let's see here. I gotta share my screen again. Videos also for those behind the scenes are an easy way for me to take a quick break because I'm a real human here. So I'm gonna put share screen, come back. Let's just find, let's just see here. I had a really cool space background going on here, but it seems to have, uh, it is not here right now. That is okay. Okay, we're gonna, whoops, wrong video. We're going to bring on uh, Nahum. Uh, Nahum is an artist and also um, on faculty and instructor at the International Space University. And um, Nahum and I were, uh, were uh, colleagues at the International Space University. And he was not able to be here live today, but we're going to bring in a conversation we had via video. Welcome, Nahum. The cloud. Okay, we're recording. Hi, Robert here again, and I'm with my good friend and former colleague from ISU, Nahum. Nahum, thank you so much for joining today and welcome to the virtual launch party. We had to record this because um, it was just a lot easier logistically. Um, and Nahum, tell, tell the audience a bit about your, yourself and your work. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Robert. And one, once again, congratulations for the book launch. Uh, it's phenomenal. And I've got my copy here. So there you go. Everyone should get a copy of this. So, uh, so what we are planning to do is uh, an artistic experience. I'm an artist. And for the last decade, I've been uh, involved in space activities, but from the artistic uh, uh, side, uh, I have uh, done uh, space missions with the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. We've been doing performances in zero gravity. Currently, we have an artwork in the International Space Station that interacts to people's heartbeats on Earth, and so on, so on, so on. But what we are planning to do for this book launch is to uh, take you into a journey, into a journey that happens in your mind, but it will feel real and it will become part of your memories and your experiences. And it involves walking on a very remote celestial body. That is awesome. And um, what, what inspired you to create this experience? It started with a critique that only a few men and only men uh, walked on the moon. So I wondered uh, what if we could change that? What if today more people on Earth uh, remember having that experience on their own. So we employ something called hypnosis uh, to have this experience. Um, so we started, I started doing it in theaters all around the world and, and the stories and the memories and the experiences that people were narrating after the hypnotic uh, trip uh, were fantastic. So I kept doing it uh, with really beautiful results. And, and, and so you had said that you had been typically doing this in theater experiences. So since we're, as we're speaking now during the times of COVID-19, um, I think you've shared in previous conversations with me that you can successfully do this with a smaller group um, with an online live experience. Exactly, this uh, will be the first online experience, but the beauty of hypnosis is that you don't need much. You only need two things to listen and my voice, so I can take you into that uh, place. I, I like to think that uh, hypnosis is the ultimate virtual reality experience that we can have, and the most profound one, because it, it happens in our minds. Imagine that it's a theater of the mind, so everything that you need is here. 
Thank you so much. Um, so Nahum, where can people find you um, online and learn more about your work? And um, and we'll put some of these links hopefully in the, in the chat too as this is being played. Fantastic. Well, you can find me in every single social media with the handler at Nahum, my name, N-A-H-U-M, artist, all together, Nahum artist. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you name it. Cool. Well, Nahum, we're so we're so excited to be able to um, have you as part of the book launch in the virtual book launch today, and hope that people, will, um, a lot of people, get to experience um, this you know this journey to another celestial body. So, thank you, Nahum, for joining us today. Thank you, Robert, and congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Let, let's see. Okay. Uh, Quick comms check, wanna make sure everyone can hear me. Um, um, let's just, uh, I've got a couple questions here. Um, let me just, uh, for those, uh, for our panelists, you should have received an email directly from Zoom. It could have been sent over the past few days. Um, it's the panelist uh, private uh, URL that you will need to check in your email. Um, and also I see in the chat, uh, Rick Tumlinson's link, we've got it posted, which is ricktumlinson.org. And we just um, had our friend Nahum. Thank you so much for uh, Nahum, for Nahum's participating in the bonus package experience. I felt like I was burying the lead on that. It's a, I haven't done it, but I've seen Nahum's work. I've known him for a few years. We've been colleagues at ISU. He is a tremendously talented and creative guy and, um, He's got some very deep, deep thoughts about space, um, really profound, I'll say profound thoughts. And um, I've included, uh, he's in the book, he's a, con a contributor into the book. Um, hopefully I would like to actually publish the full length, the full interview I had, I had conducted with him. Um, that'll probably be uh, some type of bonus material at some point. Um, uh, let's see. So for those who have not checked out the bonus page, go to spacesopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses. Um, we have a very impressive array of bonuses there. We're also, what we're essentially trying to do is if you promote purchasing the book from me, we're offering bonuses. And even if you purchase it elsewhere, we're essentially saying if you show us your receipt, um, we'll provide some, we'll honor that and provide some bonuses there too. But we're really trying to encourage some, uh, um, you know, the, the direct bonuses as well. Um, I want to thank my friend Rick Tumlinson again and, and some of the people who've asked some, some of the questions. Um, we had mentioned Dr. Adam Dip uh, Dipert, Dipert, who um, is participating in the bonus opportunity um, or the bonus offer, if you want to call it that. Um, again, I'll show you copy the book and sort of see here. I'll have to bring it in kind of close. I'll have to stand up against the background. Let's just sort of see. Uh, let's see where I have to go. There it is. There's the book. Ta-da. This is one of the hardback copies. Ta-da. There's my photo. The back. Some really nice comments on the back from Nova Spivak, Rich Smith from The Motley Fool, Lori Garver, former NASA deputy administrator, um, I want to thank them again, and, and, and Dr. Matthew Weinzerl, um, who um, from, from Harvard Business School. And my forward was written by David S. Rose, who's actually going to join us later today. Um, so yeah, Nahum's work is very inspirational. I see that in the chat. It, it's, he, he's, he's really cool. So he will take you on an experience to going to another celestial body using hypnosis. I think it's, uh, um, I, I've, I've used hypnosis myself, or I've been hypnotized. And um, it's, a, it's a useful tool. Um, let's see, okay, so I think we, if we have our next guest, we could bring him on now. Um, so Frank, are you there? There's Frank. Let's see. I am here. Hey Frank, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I love your, your, I, I, I so, um, gosh, um, the view is great from where you're at. And it looks no. like, <laughs> well, you know, I'm very busy here on the space station, but they said I could take a moment to talk about your book, which is a well, very important book. 
I want to, I want to, I want to th think management. <laughs> yeah, you can't tell, but I'm floating. It's zero G here, of course. So, so Brent, let me just uh, hold hold the qu quick moment here. Um, hopefully, um, so Frank, tell the uh, for those who don't know you, you're the creator of the term the overview effect. Can you tell tell the audience what that is? And and how what a bit of the origin story um, of of the of the of the overview sure. effect? Sure. Um, hold on, just a minute. Want to be sure I'm plugged in here? Yeah, we yeah, hear you sure. well. Uh, first of all, I want to just give credit to Charlie Slatkin for creating this beautiful background for me. He's a member of the Overview Roundtable, as you know. Um, yeah, so the overview effect is is defined as a shift in worldview experienced by astronauts when they see the Earth from space or in space, from low Earth orbit or from a lunar mission. So, for example, this is a view from low Earth orbit, obviously. And you can see the Earth and you're looking from outer space. But on the other hand, you see the darkness there. It is in space. And those are very important, two very important aspects of it. The origin story many of you have heard, but I'll repeat it for those who have not. Credit goes to Gerard K. O'Neill, one of the giants uh, in thinking about human evolution into the universe. I found a home at the Space Studies Institute in the late 70s and early 80s started thinking about what would it be like to live in outer space. And of course, O'Neill's vision was not on the moon, not on Mars, not on a surface of a planet, but in a, um, a community between the Earth and the moon at one of the Lagrange points, L5. Many of you have heard of the L5 Society. So I was thinking about it constantly and I was flying cross country and not anything to do with space exploration, staring out the window consistently and over time. And I had what I could only call an epiphany, which was, oh, people living in an O'Neill community like that, they would always have an overview of the earth. They would see it as a whole system, interconnected, interwoven, um, a lot of the things astronauts have come to realize, no borders, no boundaries. The term overview effect came into my mind and I immediately decided I had to start interviewing astronauts because, well, there were no space settlers then. There aren't really any now in the sense of people who would, who would live permanently off the planet. So I started interviewing astronauts, and I can tell you the story of that if you like, but to get to the essence of it, I saw astronauts as proxies for space settlers, but there was one difference. Everyone who's gone into orbit or the moon was born on planet Earth. They had the experience of seeing the Earth from a distance when they went into orbit or went to the moon. And I had conceived of the overview effect as an ordinary experience. Oh, there's the earth, you know, you'd see it in the sky all the time. Well, it turns out it's extraordinary for those of us who were not born in outer space. And so in a way it shifted a little bit. It's not completely different from what I envisioned, but it is a little bit different and, and uh, it, it's more focused on the experience of uh, surface dwellers who leave the planet rather than those who are permanent residents of uh, the solar system or uh, uh, space community. Thank you. Um, so why is this cognitive shift potentially so critical for our survival and hopefully our ability to, to continue to thrive as a as a species and maybe become something and, and I'll let you talk about you've coined a term and I don't want to give it away of of what we could be post homo sapien. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, well, well, we'll save that for a moment. But 
an interesting development since the book was published in 1987. And let me just say for a minute, Robert, you know, there are books and there are books and uh, I don't know, you can't see it because of my background, you've already showed it, but this is a book, everybody. Uh, I know what it takes to write a book and publish it. And I can see the enormous effort that went into it. Um, and when my book, The Overview Effect came out, uh, you know, back in 1987, I really wanted to start a revolution in thinking. I really wanted to have an effect, an effect, if you will, on how human beings thought about the earth. Uh, the first astronaut I interviewed was Joe Allen, and he said, uh, for all the reasons pro and con for going to the moon, no one said we should do it to look back at the earth, but that may in fact be the most important reason. So in a way from the beginning, I was trying to say to people, this is about our consciousness of life on earth as much as it is about space exploration. And, you know, Rick Tomlinson was one of the earliest supporters and advocates of this perspective. And he talked about it a little bit just today. Um, but for a long time, I really felt like nobody was paying attention. And recently, because of many things, including the advent of the over of the internet, uh, the uh, making of the film Overview, which is seen by over 8 million people on Vimeo, et cetera, many things have happened. But there's now a movement to bring the overview effect down to earth. Many people are working on this, a global movement. And the reason is we believe, those of us who are working on this, that when you look at an issue, a problem or a challenge that faces humanity on the surface, it is this perspective that will bring us together and help us to see a a whole systems approach to resolution. And it's overview thinking. Uh, we need overview thinking prior to tackling an issue like climate change. Um, one of the aspects of overview thinking, and you can see it in the background behind me, a planet has no sides. And yet we human beings are very adept at creating sides. And we need to move beyond that. As you know, as everybody watching probably knows, you know, there's less than 600 people have directly experienced the overview effect. And so our goal is to increase that number dramatically, either through uh, people going on Virgin Galactic or uh, Blue Origin, space perspective, other opportunities, space, space for humanity, uh, one of the great opportunities, or through virtual reality. And now that I've heard Nahum, how about hypnosis? I think I need to talk to him. Um, and, and I believe fundamentally uh, that experiencing the overview effect by hypnosis or virtual reality or commercial space flight should be a human right. I think we owe it to everyone to have the astronaut experience. And one of the things I would just close this particular commentary with is, if you talk to any astronauts, they will say, I came back with a deep responsibility to share this with everyone. It's not just for me. It's a message. Well, this is what I say, they don't say it, but this is a message from the universe to humanity about who we are, where we are, where we're going. Again, Rick said something to the same effect. And I think that's why it's so important. I think you're muted. Thank you, Frank, uh, for the reminder. Um, you, had, you talked about that all, all astronauts all to date have been born on the earth. And we've only had one or two second generation astronauts um, like Richard Garriott, who's a private space astronaut, whose father Owen Garriott was a, a NASA astronaut. Um, we're gonna need 
we, we we're pretty sure that that to, to develop a, for the a fetus to develop into an embryo to becoming you know full term pregnancy, you probably need one G gravity. And it seems like that's not necessarily getting talked a lot about is that we're the studying of of art that we're probably going to need artificial gravity if we're going to ha- um, be in, in space for long periods of time. So we're going to procreate. Um, so it, it, I don't know why this doesn't why, why NASA isn't funding this further, but it's it's always a question that I've had. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm I'm actually teaching a course at Kepler Space Institute where we're going to get into the challenges for large scale human expansion into other parts of the solar system. And I do say other parts of the solar system because, you know, the Earth is part of the solar system. Uh, Again, as Rick said, we are in space. The dichotomy between Earth and space is false. Uh, We're in space. We've always been in space and we will always be in space. Uh, We just happen to be on one of the planets in space. But you're, you're mentioning something critical and it's not mentioned a lot in relation to the overview effect, but I basically said in my book that weightlessness is a big part of the experience in the sense that not only do you have the visual, but you have this remarkable experience of floating freely. And it's very clear in talking to some of the astronauts I've talked to that that experience was a big part of why the overview effect was so powerful for them. Probably too, if you think about it, we know that low gravity affects the body and the brain is part of the body. And I believe that weightlessness enhances the effect. However, on the other hand, we also know that weightlessness or low gravity uh, causes really fundamental changes in the human body. And if everybody who went to the International Space Station or the moon or on a shuttle flight planned to come back to Earth and therefore they exercise a couple of hours every day. Can you imagine, Robert, do you exercise two hours a day? I barely can try to get in 10 minutes, you know? I know. <laughs> so, and even so, you notice when, when people come back, they're lifted out of the capsule because it's difficult to adjust to uh, Earth gravity. And so there are many, many challenges. And uh, one of the reasons that O'Neill in his vision assumed there would be areas within his space communities where there would be one G or some kind of gravitational pull was this concern. Now, if you go to the the moon or Mars, you will have some gravitational pull, but still much lower than we're accustomed to here. And so, Uh, One of the issues we have to think about is, are we going to adapt to this new environment? Are we going to allow evolution to take its course? Are we actually going to modify ourselves to be more adapted to the environment we're in, which incidentally includes a lot more radiation than we get on the Earth? And I think one of the things you were alluding to is that in writing the book, I talked to Peter Diamandis, who uh, informed me about speciation, which I'd never heard of before. Uh, But he talked about the outer space environment as a very uh, congenial environment for speciation, which happens when some members of a species are um, isolated from the main body and they're in circumstances where mutation is more likely. Mutations tend to be overwhelmed if they happen when you're part of the main body of the species. But if you're isolated, like on an island somewhere, they can take hold. And so Peter clued me into the possibility that our descendants may be very different from us and in fact might be a different species. And I created the term homo spacians uh, to, to describe this mythical future 
creature. We have no proof that this will occur, but we do know we cannot avoid the fact that if we, again, procreate, as you point out, even in zero gravity or low gravity, we know that people are going to change. And, you know, one last point I would make is that some of the people we're talking about aren't going to want to come back to Earth. They're not going to want to exercise two hours a day. And they are going to allow the changes to occur. And so uh, on the one hand, this is a challenge to our evolution into the universe and also an opportunity. And it, it's one reason the subtitle of my book is Space Exploration and Human Evolution. And I do want to mention, Robert, I, there's an awareness of that in your book. I mean, it's not really just about business or commercial development, which I think is one unique feature of what you've written. Frank, no, we had not talked about um, speciation in, uh, in the book, but I think that's a, a fascinating thing to talk about and, or just to think about. I know in the, in the, it's a TV show, fiction, but in The Expanse, they, they touch on that. So for those who've not seen what maybe fictional uh, vision opportunity, you know, what it would look like through a TV show, they have people on, um, essentially those who grew up on the asteroids look different. They're a little taller, they're tall and lanky because they're living in a, a lower gravity situation. Now this is speculative, but, um, but uh, interesting to ponder. So again, I want to thank thank um, my special guest um, Frank White, uh, and I know he he's had um, you know I, I wish Donna well. I hope she's doing better today. We've had some we didn't know if you'd be able to make it today. So thank you so much uh, for being here today, and I, I, I wish you and Donna well. And we're gonna post some links um, to uh, the Overview Collective and Frank White um, in some of the uh, the channels. Frank, thank you again for being here today and for and for uh, contributing this, uh, you know, your your continued work. Um, so everybody, go, you know, check out Frank White's work, read his books, plural. He's got several of them, and and there's more to come. Yes, thank you, Robert, and thanks for your good wishes for Donna. And uh, I do want to urge everyone to read your book, which is quite informative and just makes the point that it's going to be an entire human endeavor to uh, really create this adventure that we're looking ahead uh, to embark upon. And um, the business sector, the commercial sector is going to be a critical part of that. So thanks, Robert. Really great to be with you. Thank you. for That was Frank White. And uh, we're going to transition to our, our next guest here. I'm running some of the technical stuff here, so just bear with me. We're making a, a quick order change here. So my uh, our next guest, um, just before, give me just a second, um, is someone who contributed something really important to the book. His name is David S. Rose, and he contributed the foreword to my book. And David is, oh, he's an entrepreneur, an investor, um, author, and in, in one of his entrepreneurial activities is used by hundreds, if not thousands of people through, through his Gus platform that he, that is uh, essentially his baby. <laughs> David, welcome to the uh, virtual book launch. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and congratulations on the book. Thank you so much. So in the forward, you know, you, I want to reference um, the, the, um, is it the wrist Mac software that you developed back in? Can you share about how would a, a bit about, a, a, in maybe a compact way about that journey and what the realization you had with uh, developing that product? Well, that was actually, so my first space business, my first space product was 1988. 
Uh, and it's a very funny story, which I'll try and abbreviate, um, because that's how I actually got started in the tech business. Um, so back in the day, I was in the real estate business, which is my, my first uh, background. I've got an MBA in real estate finance. I was developing properties. Uh, and on the side, I was an early computer, if not hacker, at least computer enthusiast. Um, so I had uh, my Apple II from 1979 on. Uh, and when the online world began to emerge, this is way before the internet, back when it was there was uh, CompuServe and the source, um, even before America Online, AOL, uh, I was involved there. And having gotten very involved in the online world, I, I ultimately became a sysop, a system administrator for the Macintosh forums on CompuServe. Uh, which was a lot of fun. And so I spend as much time, I spent as much time then on CompuServe on the Mac forums as I do now on Quora and other places answering questions. Uh, and I got to know a lot of the people, these early, early enthusiasts and hackers who were uh, on the uh, on the platform. Um, and this was actually before the Mac launched. This was the Apple forums originally um, in, 19, in the 1980, mid 1980s. And then in 1984, when um, Apple introduced the Macintosh computer, um, we then opened up Macintosh forums on CompuServe, and I was just up for those. And then a couple of years later, probably 1987, there were enough Mac owners uh, in the universe for there to be a trade show devoted to Macs, and that was called the Mac World Trade Show. And these days, people have sort of forgotten what trade shows are because everything is now virtual. Um, but that was used to have a, you know, take over an entire auditorium and thousands of people would come in and all the, the uh, companies would exhibit their, their wares and their new products and stuff. And so the first Mac World trade show was held in Boston. Uh, this was before Silicon Valley was clearly the center of the world. Boston was still very much in contention as a computer place then. So the Mac World trade show was held in Boston. And I go to this first Mac World trade show in 87. And it was really, it was an eye opener. It was really cool. All these amazing products and stuff that were out there. And Adobe and, and Apple had these giant booths and stuff. But then around the edges of the convention center, there were these little tiny 10 foot booths um, with these really sort of cool, funky products. Now, today we would call these a startup, but back then, this is in the 87, people didn't have the term startup then. Uh, but it turned out that these were, were broke. <laughs> you know, this shows how far back it was, right? Um, anybody who was actually doing a startup back in 1987 in the, in the early stage Apple world was clearly online, right? So I ended up knowing all of these guys, and they were all guys. There were virtually no women in, the, in the, that universe back then. Um, and so I had known them all online. And then I came to a realization in 1987, which was that they, these guys were all getting invited to the cool parties because they were exhibitors and I was just an attendee and I wasn't. So I figured I had to rectify that. So I figured the next year I'd get invited to the cool parties too um, by uh, becoming an exhibitor. So I got a booth from Mitch Hall Associates was the organizer of the, of the show. So I rented my little 10 foot booth um, too. So now I can be an exhibitor. Now, if you look at the sequence about this, you notice that there's sort of one thing a little bit, little bit backwards over here, which is I now had a booth, but I had nothing to put in the booth, nor a company. Um, so, okay, well, I had to put something in the booth. So I looked around to figure out what I could show off in this booth that I had just rented to get to the good parties. Uh, and in a remainder catalog, and by the way, if you're listeners who are too young to remember what catalogs are, they were like websites on paper where they would arrive in your mailbox delivered by a person called a letter carrier instead of email. And then you would look through these things and you would decide to buy it on this sort of, you know, physical web page by calling a number or whatever. But in any event, uh, and, and uh, this remainder catalog had a digital watch in it, um, the RC4000 that had been done by Seiko. Uh, and Seiko was way ahead of its time. This watch had 2K of RAM and a little serial port and a connector to your PC. And their marketing material showed a couple in bed with a wire connecting their watches. You know, you can exchange data with your significant other, you know, at night. Um, and their other marketing piece, you know, showed um, a girl going to a Madonna concert with, with, you know, long painted fingernails and whatever it is. For some reason, back in 1985 or six, when they did this, nobody bought these, <laughs> this particular product. So it turned out to be an unmitigated disaster. It was cool, cool technology, but a mitigated disaster is a sales thing. 
so since nobody was buying them, they decided to put all the, re the remaining units they had in the U.S. back on a boat and sent them back to uh, uh, to Hong Kong or something to avoid uh, dumping charges. Um, and there were, you know, so 10 of these watches had escaped and gotten into the remainder catalog. So I said, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, I bet we can do software for the, for the Mac computer. And so we, uh, you know, I got the last 10 units that they had in the catalog, you know, paying, I don't know, 100 bucks a piece or something for them. Uh, and then since, of course, I knew everybody in the Mac universe at that point, because the Mac universe consisted of about 10 people, um, I, you know, I pulled together a virtual team before there were virtual teams. And so the, the cable for, to connect this uh, watch to a Mac that you should ship with a PC cable that didn't work in a Mac, because, of course, Steve Jobs never did anything that anybody else did. Uh, so the cable was designed by a guy named Dennis Brothers, who was the original engineer engineer who invented the HQX protocol, um, worked on BinHex, the original Mac data protocols. The um, software was uh, to uh, you know, run on your Mac to send data to the watch was written by Richard Reich, who had written the HP 12C calculator software, an absolute genius. Uh, the manual was written by Neil Shapiro, the founding editor of Mac User Magazine. So anyway, so I pulled together all these funky people. We did this thing. I, I, I took this product to uh, the, the trade show. I had 10 of these watches. I figured it was a, you know, a funny thing to show off. And I had a big you know, background from my booth with a picture of the watch. And I was you know, you know, showing it off. Oh, you know, it's the dice does all this amazing cool stuff. And somebody in the press room was overheard, you know, saying, you know, the most interesting thing here at the show is that watch. But what a cheesy salesman. Uh, <clears throat> so in any event, I, I was showing off this watch. And so some guy comes along uh, and pulls out, you know, 200 bucks and says, OK, I got to buy one. And he, and he buys my watch. Um, and it turns out to be a guy named Fred Smith. And I don't know who Fred Smith was, but Fred Smith turned out to be an entrepreneur who had founded a little company um, that, that did shipping logistics that uh, you know, was called FedEx. Um, yeah, so uh, that was my first sale. And then my second sale, another guy came along and said, oh, this is so cool, I got to get one, uh, was a guy named Bill Atkinson, who actually had written you know, half the Mac operating system and you know, all the Mac graphics and stuff, part of the, the original core Mac team. So now I figured, oh, I actually have my have a product here. Uh, but this was a you know a fun thing I had done as a as a, as a little side gig. So when I came back um, to New York, uh, I figured, hmm, maybe there's actually a, a market here for these things. So I, I uh, reached out to Seiko and said, hey, you got any more of these things that I just picked up at this remainder sale? And it turned out that they were all going back on this boat to China. So I said, hey, tell you what, take off the boat, you know, redo the batteries, and you know, put it back in here, and I'll and I'll buy them all from you know from you or you know pennies on the dollar. So they said, great, nobody else wants them. So I picked up, you know, I got this whole container worth of, of uh, watches and all kinds of different colors, um, you know, metal and plastic and pocket watch versions and so on and so forth with fresh batteries. We had new software, a new manual. Um, and so we produced the Wrist Mac. Um, and this is again, back in a day when you couldn't call something now called the Wrist Mac and not get in trouble with Apple's trademark attorneys. But back then, oh, you know, <laughs> you, know you know, who knows, who cares, right? Um, uh, uh, so, um, funny side note on, on that and trademarks and stuff, when Richard Reich had done the HP 12C calculator, he did it as a sort of a, a programming tour de force to show off, you know, on a Mac, how you could actually take an exact simulacrum of the, uh, of the HP 12C, which was the iconic calculator. And it was perfect, this whole thing. And so, you know, he was, of course, afraid that HP would come down and tell him to cease and desist. So he gets this official note from HP and HP, you know, he figured it was going okay, to shut up and go home. But they said, you know, <clears throat> you spelled our, our name wrong and there's something over here. Just correct it. <laughs> we said, OK, fine. You know, so so back then, a lot less concern about trademarks than there was now. But anyway, so Apple had no problem with my calling it the wrist Mac. And we had a little design, a little logo that had the, the, the watch on it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, th so this we put this thing in the various catalogs. There were, you know, Mac catalogs and accessory stuff and, um, you know, names that are now lost in history, but that's where you used to buy your stuff because you couldn't go online. Uh, and all of a sudden, it sort of went flying off the shelves and it, because it was a very sexy thing. Remember, back in, this is now late 1980s, to have a watch that could connect to your computer and send, you know, data and stuff down there was really cool. So then a year or two later, um, and into this, uh, I get a, a, a funny a call, an interesting call um, from somebody at NASA. Um, and NASA says, hey, uh, we're actually <clears throat> going to be uh, flying a, a MacBook, uh, a, a portable Macintosh on the space shuttle, STS-43, uh, to do experiments and see what it's like to have a personal computer in space. Um, and one of the challenges we have is that the astronauts on the shuttle often can't hear the enunciators on the craft because uh, of the ambient noise. And so we're wondering, you know, you think your watch might work to let us load the alarms from mission control into the watch and have them have a direct personal you know, beep. 
I said, well, of course it would do that. Um, and so, uh, you know, and so and it so happened that we had actually started off shipping um, like the plastic versions and I still had the uh, the titanium silver versions, whatever is not more titanium, the silver versions, steel versions in stock. Um, and so we sent, we sent Apple a whole bunch of the, uh, NASA, a whole bunch of these things. Um, and we you know, started doing, doing a little work supporting them and some of the other folks who are working on the program. Uh, we actually, our risk back was on the mission patch for STS-43. They did a, a, a special patch for all the experiments that were flown there uh, on, on board. Um, and so it flew on the on the mission. And now, of course, ta-da, we had the space shuttle watch, um, which meant that at the next trade show, I could come back in. And we had, I mean, again, back then in the old days, there were things called booth babes, um, now completely um, politically incorrect, and you wouldn't have them. But back then, you basically had attractive booth staff who would come in. And so, of course, our booth staff was all dressed up in NASA jumpsuits and astronaut jumpsuits. And, and we handed, handed out, you know, free, you know, freeze-dried astronaut ice cream and stuff. And it was now the space shuttle watch. So, uh, so anyway, it turned out to be a precursor of a whole very long and crazy and interesting entrepreneurial career. Um, but that's how I got started with my first space business in 1988 with the RISMAC. I was young, but I think I do vaguely remember this this RISMAC um, question. A little fast forward in a few years, did you ever have a Newton? Did I ever have a Newton? Excuse me, I am the only person to ever have made money off the Newton. We actually wrote the, so, okay. So I, I gotta keep, so keep going on that little path there sure. on my entrepreneurial journey. So here, so here we have this this watch, which I really did as a, as a hobby. Um, you know, it was a, my, my, this fun thing for, for the trade show. And all of a sudden people started buying it and that was very cool. Um, and so it was in these catalogs, it was flying off the shelves, um, but there were only so many watches because I got the last remaining supply of watches. So I figured, okay, well, you know, what could we do for a, our follow-on product? So I went back to Seiko and said, hey, tell you what, could you give me like a do a custom version for me, OEM it with like more RAM and more this and the Mac thing and serial port. And they said, well, you know, we could do that. You know, tooling costs about, you know, 3 million. And so, so I said, oh, no, okay, well, that's not going to work. Uh, so I said, hmm, um, hmm, okay. So I started looking around and that's just when Motorola introduced a wristwatch pager. Remember, uh, for those on your audience who are a little too young for that, a pager prior to text messaging on your on your mobile device, uh, there were these little things that were beepers. Um, that was a little thing you carry with the AA battery or AAA battery and would actually beep when somebody called it on a phone. And so Motorola um, had come out with uh, the first wristwatch pager. They were actually, the, Motorola was, did, was the king of pagers. Uh, and this was a pager beeper you could wear on your wrist. And so I figured, okay, well, you know what? I'll OEM that. Um, it'll be the 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 wrist Mac wireless wrist Mac, um, and so we figured out how to get into uh, paging systems where, where the operator dispatch systems for paging had a protocol where you could send a text message in um, uh, by dialing into their systems and have it sent to the uh, the the pager. And that was radio. Anyway, was that rate? Was that done through radio waves on the uh, paging? Yep, radio. So pagers were on a special paging frequency, um, and uh, that were that you you would license by. There were two national frequencies, uh, and uh, they were otherwise they were all done locally, and you have to aggregate them locally. Whole other story, which we can get into. It's all the about business. But in any event, so uh, here, so here, I had you know, we we figured out how to get into these paging systems. But then we realized that the Motorola wristwatch, um, you know, pager was about you know the size of a of a of a, of a coffee saucer, and nobody was going to wear this big clunky thing. And besides, it was only a numeric pager; it could only show you numbers. It couldn't even do text. So, ma, well, forget that. But now we know how to get into paging systems. Uh, and Motorola at that point introduced the first text pager. Um, so for the folks who are like SMS text messaging, it's like the first thing, imagine a thing devoted just to text messages and only one way you could receive it, you couldn't send them. Uh, so, but now we know how to send messages to, from a computer to a text pager. Um, and so falling backwards into this whole thing, we then, um, you know, I said, okay, well, we'll do software. Our, our next product will be software to let you send a message to a pager from your computer, personal wireless messaging, which didn't exist <laughs> before us. Uh, so we did that. And then, then, I, then I, get, I get a call from um, a group called Telocator, which was a trade association in Washington, DC. And they said, hey, we're the trade association for the, the paging industry. Um, and, you know, you're doing paging software. So um, we'd like you to, uh, you know, join our trade association and uh, be on our technical committee. 
So I said, okay, fine, what do I know? Uh, so that's how I ended up on the telecare tech committee. And you know, being a good boy, having no idea what I was doing, I read up an old material that they sent for the next meeting. I go to the next meeting. Um, and there, um, the Motorola, it turns out, was on this committee also, obviously, is about to introduce a new pager, a data pager, something, a little paging device that could connect to a computer and send data, 8-bit data into a computer, um, which you couldn't do with just a 7-bit text pager, which was just designed to show text. Um, um, and so, so Motorola had suggested a, an upgrade to the po to the protocol that would allow you to send 8-bit data in it. And they circulated this thing. Uh, and Motorola owned the pager market, but a company named Glen Air, based in Vancouver, Canada, actually owned the paging systems market that sold the, the, the tower things, the, not the tower, the, the paging um, terminals that sent stuff out over the air to the pager. So you had sort of two behemoths. One air in Canada with the systems that the paging companies had and Motorola with the pagers that they sold to, you know, doctors and lawyers and plumbers and whatever. Uh, and so uh, Motorola came up with this protocol and Glen Air looked at this protocol and wrote back basically something saying, well, that's a piece of crap. And so you, <laughs> it really should look like this. And so I read all these things. I come into uh, the, my first meeting of the pager of the Telecator Paging Technical Committee, uh, and they and we hear we have these two dueling proposals from the two behemoths of the industry. Uh, and we go around the table, and all the other members of, of the committee, it turns out, were radio jocks. They were all people you know, from these paging companies knew how to do antennas and RF stuff and so on. But they weren't computer guys because back in the you know 1980s there weren't a lot of computer people out there. Um, and so everybody looks at these two competing proposals looks sort of blankly around the table, looks at me and says, well, you're a computer guy, so which one should we go to? Uh, and, and I said, well, you have this and that. And they said, oh, no, it's, it's, we clearly need to, to create a committee to create our own standard for the new committee. So since they could put neither Motorola nor Glen Air in charge of it, they said, okay, you're it. And so that's how I became the editor of the paging industry in the United States technical standards. Um, they kind of eventually telecator renamed itself as PCIA, Personal Communications Industry Association. Uh, and I spent the next year writing standards for um, the paging industry. But in any event, uh, but long story about that is, so now we had this little startup company which had paging software. And the next thing you know, um, because uh, you know the, all of the major paging companies started buying software from us to sell with their text pagers. And then along came the whole uh, you know, rework of the, of the system where you had these new smartphones and these new personal intelligent things out there. And they all had SMS, text messaging on there. But the way you got into the systems was using the same protocol that we had done back for paging. And here we were as the primary seller of software to send messages to devices. And so that's how we became the primary um, software developer for text messaging back in the day when you still had to do it on computers before the internet, right? Uh, and on your computer. And so now here we are as a text messaging company. And then Apple comes, this is the whole and shaggy dog story, but it leads up to answer your question, Bob. Um, because, uh, you know, so then Apple comes along the breakthrough thing they are going to create under John Scully. Um, this is while Steve Jobs is in the wilderness. Um, the, the first personal intelligent communicator, the Newton. And so they announced this thing with break. And, and so we heard it rumored it was becoming for years and years, you know, months ahead of time. So probably in January or whenever the rumors first came out, I, I call Apple and I say, hey, I would love to be a software developer. Can we, you know, because I want to do the paging software, you know, for the Newton. Um, and they say, yeah, yeah, don't call us, we'll call you, blah, 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 blah. And so the, the, the launch of this thing is scheduled for, you know, I think July of, uh, what, 80, God knows, it must be early 90s at that point. Um, and uh, three months before the launch, um, Apple, you know, they still haven't got back to me. They said, you know, don't call us. So they, they call me up and they say, hmm, you still interested in doing software for the Newton? I said, yeah, sure, I'll do paging software. They said, so how would you like to do the communication software for the Newton? I said, the communicate. Well, wait, wait, isn't this a personal intelligent communicator? And they said, yes. And I said, and you have no communication software. And they said, well, blah, 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 blah. so I said, okay, fine. Let me do both. I'll do the paging software and the communication software, provided you give me a contract, because Apple at that point had a software division called Claris. So I said, provided you give me a contract to buy these things. And so I did a deal with Apple's subsidiary at Claris, which is their software subsidiary. And so we created Pocket Call, which was the, the, the communication software, the terminal software for 
for the Newton, which let you um, dial into databases and do things online, uh, as well as the uh, paging software. Um, and so Apple, you know, bought 100,000 bucks for uh, from us uh, up front. Uh, and so then even though the product ultimately tanked, um, the bottom line was I'm the only person ever to make money selling software for the Newton. Amazing. Um, so fast forwarding, is, you know, Newton was such a cool device. And, and it, for those who don't, a lot of people, there's probably plenty of people who don't know what that is. Look up the Apple Newton. I think it was like the, the grandpa to the iPhone, maybe. I mean, it's, hey, it, was way ahead of, it was way ahead of its time and had um, handwriting. You could, you could write on it. And it was basically a like digital notebook. It was really, it was a really cool tool that they unfortunately discontinued. And if you want to, the, the other cool tool at the same time was called um, Magic Cap. Match. So, so uh, Magic Cap was the Apple-inspired first true portable digital assistant done by the original Apple team, which left Apple to go do this Magic Cap, uh, create a whole software operating system device funded by 100 million bucks from Sony and Apple. Uh, it ended up also tacky being a disaster. But recently, just this year, there's been a whole film that came out on something like the whatever 30 anniversary of, of, of that with the original team discussing the whole history. It's a wonderful film. It's a wonderful story. They're all still around uh, and it's worth uh, get, you know, following if you haven't seen it. Um, and somebody posted in the chat, they said, I'm going to it says, FYI, the wrist Mac are the Seiko RC series 1000 through 4500. That is correct. That so is correct. Stuff, okay. Um, and, and David, watching, you know, going from a space shuttle mission to where we're at now with private companies now recently as of June, you know, take fairing, uh, private astronauts and the in, sort of the, maybe we're in the pre-industrialization of lower earth orbit with lots of um, uh, satellite startups. What's your assessment and what, what do you see as most exciting to you personally, just uh, um, from your vantage point um, in terms of well, the, the, the risk map was back in the day before the idea of space commercialization, right? Um, you know, Frank had been talking about uh, Gerard O'Neill and, and the L5 Society. Now, I was a member of the L5 Society back when I was in friggin' high school or whatever, right? I mean, and so for, for all of your listeners who are interested in space and have never heard the term name Gerard K. O'Neill, which has now again, <laughs> like everything else from catalogs to pages, passed into, passed into history, um, it's absolutely worth looking up the High Frontier and O'Neill and the L5 Five Society and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I had been, you know, longingly looking at, you know, the future of space from a very, very early age. Um, but even with the risk Mac and, you know, flying on, on the shuttle, which was a fun thing, it was, that's what it was, it was a fun thing. NASA was still, you know, big government. It was a, a government project and uh, they were flying an experiment, but that was great, but it was government. It wasn't the idea you could do your own, um, uh, you know, space program. Although when I was in college, I actually had the idea of, of subleasing, of, of buying, you know, one cubic foot of uh, space on the shuttle under their experimental thing and turning around and reselling that fractionally to people who wanted to do things like, you know, souvenirs and businesses and stuff. And I couldn't get NASA to let me do it, but I was still, you know, thinking about businesses for space even back in the 1970s, way back then. But in any event, what, you know, the, the, the major change, of course, was the realization by NASA and the smart one, the one about which your whole book is based, um, that, you know, times have, ch have changed and if you want to do something in the 21st century, it's not a question of a major government initiative. This is not like, you know, World War III or something or, or you know, where the entire society mobilizes on one thing. You now have a distributed society. And the best way to get stuff done is to do it with, you know, commercial entrepreneurial interests in an entrepreneurial universe. And so the opening up of, you know, Space 2.0 um, to uh, the private sector was the seminal kind of thing. Uh, you know, behind me over here is Hangar 1 out at, uh, in NASA Ames, um, which was where Singularity University was started. And as you know, I'm the uh, I'm associate founder of Singularity U and it was their, their founding track chair for finance, entrepreneurship, and economics. Uh, and coming out of SU, you know, where you have all of these far-thinking, futuristic, entrepreneurial, um, you know, types, we had all kinds of amazing space-related businesses coming out. And so, uh, you know, the idea that you now have literally, you know, this high frontier, this new frontier, where, you know, I mean, it's not just the Elon Musks and the, you know, the Blue Origins and so on. Um, what you have here is an entire, everything else that's not Earth. 
we have this one little marble over here where existing businesses are and everything else, you know, from, from, you know, quark dealing with, with, you know, Ferengis, you know, to, um, you know, building things in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in low earth orbit to whatever it is, that's just open. So space truly is open for business. And I can't think of anything more exciting and why your book is, can't be more timely. Well, thank you, David. And I want to remind our listeners today or in the archives that um, David is also a part, was generously participating in the book bonuses. He's an author of two great books. I have an autograph copy. Um, um, the, the books are um, uh, The Gus Guide. Uh, excuse me. Let me excuse me. The Gus. The Angel Gus, Investing. Angel Investing. <laughs> Colin, the Gus Guide to Making Money and Having Fun Investing in Startups and the Startup Checklist, 25 Steps to a Scalable High Growth Business. And they're really like handbooks. So get them or get them through the bonuses. And David also is uh, also visionary in creating Gust, which if you don't know what Gust is, look up gust.com, gust.com. And David um, is... Uh, Gust is participating in some of the book bonuses that way, and that's enabling so many. Um, uh, it's, it's it's enabling for investors to invest better, more smartly, optimizes their their uh, kind of investing strategy and operations. It's helping entrepreneurs set up and create functional, scalable businesses, or be and be ready to be invested. So, David, thank you so much for for all of your um, your service and your commitment to um, entrepreneurs, um, to the space sector, um, to the early days with Space Angels Network and sharing some great anecdote, great history. And I like learning about some history of, of telecommunications as it connects with space today and, and a little bit of Apple lore, which I think uh, I'm sure there's, you know, there's always a few Apple, Apple fans out there. My pleasure. And you have some great guests coming up, so I will sign off. But it's been a pleasure. Good luck with the launch. Great book. Everybody go out. Space is indeed open for business and go do some. Thank you, David. My pleasure. That, that was David S. Rose. Again, David is uh, this serial entrepreneur, an investor, founder of Gus.com, multiple author, keynote speaker. He has been a funder of probably over hundred different pioneering companies and super high energy and just really appreciate that we have people like David who really appreciate um, what's going on in the space sector. So we switched David in our next guest. So um, uh, we're kind of running on time, but we switched guests. So I want to um, bring in our next guest, Alan Clary, who I think knows um, David and Alan, um, uh, Alan, I've yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Dave. David, I, I was so excited to get on early enough to see David because uh, I use his book in my classroom at U University of South Florida, um, and then he was kind enough to actually do a, a, a guest lecture at our in our classroom a couple years ago, and he came down to Tampa Bay and did a keynote uh, talk as well um, at the at the University of South Florida's entrepreneurship program. So I was like super geeked that you had him on the on the roster today. USF Bulls. My mom was an alum from USF, probably USF Bulls for those. That's who right. Know, the, in our great, entrepreneurship great program. Work. Yeah. The entrepreneurship program at USF, people don't realize top 10 in the country every year, uh, according to the Princeton Review, um, by way of public universities, top 15, when you count all the private and public top 20, for sure, top 10 in public universities for entrepreneurship. Every year, Princeton Review, University and, of South Florida. And it's been, become a very prolific um, generator of IP, a uh, very prolific oh, research institution. A lot top, of people don't, yeah, uh, don't top, might not know. Top 50 in the country, number one in the, in the state. Yes, for intellectual property. Patents issued, for patents issued. Passion, yes, thank you. So let me let me introduce you, Alan. Uh, so again, our, our next guest um, is Alan Clary. And, and Alan is a friend from Tampa, Florida, because I'm from Tampa, Florida as well. Excuse me, <clears throat> just had some. We uh, can almost we can almost see the rockets go off from where we where we live. Almost. On clear days, if you go yeah. over to my, where my dad works, you can. If it's a clear day, Alan, get on yeah. top of the building in on South Tampa, and you can you can see a launch on clear days or at nights. Absolutely. Clouds, it's no bueno, but with, if it's a clear day, definitely. So Alan is. Um, Alan's uh, got a number of roles he's wearing. He, uh, he's uh, the co-founder of Tampa Bay Wave Startup Accelerator, which is a, a local Tampa Bay accelerator doing really good work um, there. He is um, 
helps raise capital for groups around uh, spending time with groups like Techstars when they were uh, doing their thing in Tampa. As he alluded to in the first part of his comment, he's a pro entrepreneurship professor at University of South Florida, top 10 entrepreneurship program. And he's using David's book, which is really, so, I, and that was, I, you know, I remembered that, but I wasn't thinking about that when that was completely not planned. Right, uh, isn't that amazing? And, and most recently into his accomplishments is he has released a book and he's creating a community. The book is called Quit to Start, How to Discover Your Best Idea, Gain the Confidence and Plan Your Escape. And what I love so much about, about the book, and I have my copies in my, my library, I, I, I just didn't have time to grab all the books from all these fellow authors who are, who are up here, but it's that so many times you kind of have to either fail, quit something, kind of maybe go through the mud to have to really have your aha to find maybe what's the thing you should actually be doing in your life or to really to be um, chasing that dream that you've always had but you've always been kind of stuck in that day job you've always kind of to hate alan what can you share you you know you've spent a lot of time with other builders makers entrepreneurs you know, sh maybe share some, uh, you know, yeah. share some stories or, you know, or, or common yeah. threads in this um, quitting and quit to start. Well, yeah, it's it. Thank you. Thanks, Robert, for having me on. This is uh, quite an honor to be a part of this. Yeah. For, so every major, every, every entrepreneur had to do it, including our, our coveted Elon Musk, right? So every Steve Jobs uh, on down the stretch, I mean, Steve Jobs quit Atari, right? A lot of people don't know that Steve Jobs quit Atari to start Apple, right? And uh, Wozniak quit HP, Hewlett Packard at that time as well. So, so there's this theme that doesn't get talked enough about around how to leave a job, when and how and if you should leave a job to be an entrepreneur. And by the way, everybody shouldn't be an entrepreneur. It's 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 not everybody's not cut out for it. It's gonna it, it's the hardest thing you could ever do in your life. Uh, it will test every bit of your of your fabric and your character. Um, and uh, it's not actually something that we recommend. But for those that uh, that that doesn't scare them and that it calls their name and they have to chase independence, they have to chase big doing big things in the world. They're tormented, usually working for other people for so long. Um, they 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 know that they're meant for uh, for for that independence, right? And for them, they like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and others. They they have to plan their escape. They have to make it and. and and it's where, and in my book, I talk about where uh, the quit zone is where capability meets opportunity, powered by uh, frustration or a big idea, right? So really, it does start with capability, but it has to be met with opportunity. Uh, you, you know, you, you have to have these four things going um, to really make it make it work, uh, because obviously most of us need a paycheck in life, and most of us weren't born wealthy. Especially any success, any massively successful entrepreneur that we know of, almost never. Uh, started with money. In fact, the more massively successful they are, the more likely they started with, with nothing. Um, that almost always correlates, right? And so I just wanted to write a book about this to inspire those people, either, either to dissuade a people. Uh, the book does a good, healthy job of, of, of really dissuading and scaring off the right people that need to be dissuaded and scared off by talking about how, how much of a, how, how, how non-romantic it is. But then at the same time, emboldening and, and energizing those people out there that know that that's, that's what they have to do and it is in the cards for them. You kind of know who you are, if that's who, who it is. You can't, you, can't, uh, you can't manufacture entrepreneurship mindset. You, you kind of, uh, uh, you, a lot of times it's, it's you're born with it or it's highly nurtured and it's kind of into your wiring. Um, there's a lot of debate about nurture versus nature on this. And I think it's kind of 50-50, but for sure there's a, there's a certain amount of wiring in there that uh, that's there, and so the book I wanted to uh, for people to have that for it to actually energize them, and give them uh, give them kind of a, a plan and a bit of a blueprint forward on how to how to you know plan their escape. And it's not a how to book. It's it's a what it's a it's a why book, which I talked about why should I do this and who right who should do it, and then finally what like the the big thing too is like what is scalability? What are minimum viable products? What are all these things that us in the startup game know? But very few people that are still in their jobs actually don't that do know they don't know right. So that was the other mission was to try to equip and arm people that are in their jobs with the with the stuff that everybody on the outside knows. But but that's almost too late if you don't if you learn it on the outside by skinning your knees. It'd be great if you could learn a few things while you're still in your job so that when you make that move, it's uh it's as smooth and successful as possible. 
Alan, have you have you looked at any of the um, have you spoken to other people maybe in the space sector? Did you, did you who who maybe quit something? You know, you've got the Space Coast on the other coast of Florida. Um, or looked at it because space has plenty of spectacular failures or people who've or sometimes tried things and they didn't get very far because it was either the wrong time or not the right team. Yeah, well, we know Richard Branson is a famous uh, quit to starter in the space world. Of course, he started in music, um, but I believe his very first venture uh, definitely was not in the music business. He had a couple quick failures on that and failures after before, before he was able to get um, into the, the space world, right? Um, and of course, Elon Musk, I mentioned earlier um, as well, you know, had to make his leap. You know, there's plenty of examples in the Florida area um, that um, are also kind of out there that people may or may would not know, but, um, but it's, a, it's a tougher game, right? Space, we, I don't have to tell you the, the, um, the, the amount of capital, right, which we should get into this topic, right, the amount of capital needed to make a move or make a play in space um, is, is just going to be on an order of magnitude much higher than most any other tech startup that you could, you could imagine, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge and in, in, in space is up for business, I think, um, is the access to the amount of capital that you would need to to make something happen there so i don't know if you if you've gotten into that topic yet or how, how deeply uh, by the way thank you for the advanced copy of the book uh, oh you're welcome um, and uh I've read i've read more at least half or more so i've got a ways to go it's it's uh, robert it was it was much more intensive than i expected i mean i, I most of i mean i wrote a 200 page book and I see people out there writing them, you know, 150 page books and, and then I pull yours out and then I don't know, is it three, 400 pages and it's not even big print. It's uh, it's, it's, it's fairly small print. So I'm like, wow, th this guy wrote a legitimate book. <laughs> like This thing is intense. I flip it open and there's these diagrams and, and citations. I'm like, Whoa. Alan, you don't Whoa. even want to see what the very first, I mean, like any author knows the first incarnations of the manuscripts are like pretty awful. And, and, and I had like hundreds of thousands of words and all these things way too much. My editor's like, you can't have all this. <laughs> like, you gotta, like, you gotta, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to scale this back. Um, oh, I see a you buddy of mine, Amir. Um, yeah. uh, so great. Thank you, Amir. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that's the challenge is like, you know, how does one become an entrepreneur um, in the space age? And for sure, you know, if you're an engineer working at a major, uh, you know, defense contractor, or major space contractor, and you can come up with an idea um, and somehow find a way, I feel like these entrepreneurs would have to come out of the industry. I'm just going to speculate here. Like, it'd be really hard for someone or, or in, to, to uh, play the startup game in space. Not, there's so much complexity and science involved, and then there's a bunch of money needed. So it's like, there's a, there's a pretty high bar that I'm not, that we don't normally see even in the tech startup world. We're all building SaaS software products that fairly, frankly, the barrier to entry has gone really low in that space. Right? And, and just for a bit of background, you were in the, you were in the Northwest in Seattle. I want to tell a little bit of yeah. listeners about, you know, where you were at. Or, or, yeah. Oh, just, oh, you were, yeah. When you, when you were in your the engineering business side. Oh you know? yeah. 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 Well, my side, yeah. But I'm, um, well, no, I mean, I kind of, I, uh, my engineering was actually in the, was here in, at the University of Florida, and it was actually civil engineering of all things. Okay. Um, it was, uh, it was a bit of a family, um, a bit of a family uh, uh, business track that I was on. And I, but in the, but in the late nineties, that first, um, when the internet was born and I broke away and said, I need to chase technology. And I did, I did some time in San Francisco chasing startups and launched um, one of my startups there at TechCrunch uh, 2008. And that, by the way, just, hilarious to me about how long ago that was. Um, but uh, most of my time on the West Coast was dipping in and out related to startups that I was involved in or pursuing. Um, I, and then my sister, my sister works at Microsoft. So I go to Seattle quite a bit to, to see her. Um, don't get to go enough. And, um, but you know, it's, it's different over here. I think it's pretty interesting that we have quote the space coast with, you know, NASA and, and everything that's going on, and there's not enough talk or understanding about that ecosystem. And Florida, I don't think Florida as a whole, including our politicians and, and our leaders, appreciate and understand. You know, we you know people talk about Silicon Valley all the time, like Silicon Valley. Who's got a space coast? Like, like there's only one Silicon Valley, right? And for sure, 
capital is easy to get to and all the smart people are there and that's where you'd want to create a tech startup, all that good stuff. I get it. It's really hard to create a tech startup in other cities, even though it happens, it's, it's tougher. People argue that really the best stuff can only come out of Silicon Valley, but who's got a space coast, a space ecosystem. So I would, I would argue like the way, the way people talk about Silicon Valley is the way that Florida should be, should be, you know, marketing and messaging the space coast. Okay. Here. Ch Chamber, I'm going to interrupt Chamber of Commerce policy mayors listen to what alan's saying hi mm -hmm. alan bring go to the wave and <laughs> and florida can do an even better job because if we're talking about why is he why is look bezos and, and and musk are both setting up shop or doing operations in florida and other states mm -hmm. and they know that within space it's infinite re potentially infinite resources solar system there's only a certain amount of stuff and we should definitely preserve part of it as wilderness but there is so much potential for wealth creation from space applications and the resources. Why not invest more in space locally and it'll create more jobs because the money is spent, you know, locally. There's no banks or AT or I say there's no banks or ATMs in space. And um, and I do think that one of the challenges that you were alluding to a few minutes ago is that space does kind of have like some three things that make investors weary. It's got technical risk. Uh, some space businesses, technical risk, market risk, and potential, you could say financial risk too. So I think sometimes when you have more than one of these types of risk, it just makes some investors just a little more weary, especially if they don't understand the domain. But that's where if you, um, you know, you put together a great team and you really, I, I'm a big believer in doing like doing customer discovery and really knowing, okay, yeah. we have this interesting IP, we're good say engineers, who, who is the customer? Who's the user? So many times it's just like, well, give us a billion dollars and we're going to build it going. That's not unfortunately yeah. how it works. I feel like just getting, I feel like if I were a young person or, or younger person, so to speak, just getting a job over there and planning myself in that ecosystem over there on the, um, on the East, on the East coast of Florida um, and just getting to know the engineers and the players because just the way, the same way that the, that the, that these companies spawn out of Silicon Valley and, you know, companies that are born, um, the spin out of Google and Facebook, as we know, these engineers pop out, like they're going to, they're, you want to be there to absorb. And, and, and by the way, you'll have the beginnings of your founding team. If you're over there, first thing I would recommend a young person is to go get a job in the space coast. So you can start building relationships with the, the engineers and the other players involved and not, and also, you get a you get a front row seat at um, and Cape Canaveral is definitely the place to be. I agree right there from uh, uh, Mary, Mary Liz, Liz. right? Um, yeah. And so so the because the great the best startups in the world are, are are you know not only do they can they assemble a great team that knows what they're doing that has vision, but also they're really close to the problem and and the in the market, right? So you know the the uh, the best ideas in space. Um, are, are going to come from in the halls and the, 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 the ecosystem of all of that. People know what the problems and the opportunities are, the opportunities especially. And you want to be really close to that so that you can, you can see them before the, before the outside sees them. That's how so many great things get spawned out of Silicon Valley. They, 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 the folks there can see opportunity sooner than anywhere else in the country. And, and then same thing can be true if you're in the space ecosystem you're going to see that, and then you're going to get access to capital as well. You're going to get access to capital because you're you're in that you're in that uh, in that that neural network, right? So, I just I just see that parallel, and and it, it's so easy to see when you when you step back. That's awesome. Um, so let's just see here. I'm just going to take a quick pause here. I got to kind of just look at since I'm kind of manning sure. all these channels. If any of my team could just let me know, make sure I guess. Uh, the the Twitter thing is that still going well? I, I think so. The Twitter thing. <laughs> some great. These are some great. These are some great comments. Somebody, I'm enjoying somebody these comments. Somebody sent me a message that it was I had TW. I was like, what's TW? They're like Twitter. Don't you know? Like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this is great. I love somebody said something about uh, they're gonna eat fish tacos and have beers. You're, you know, so fish that's tacos. that's. No, we're talking about Florida, right? So that's one yeah. of the cool things about Cape Canaveral and Florida and the coast of Florida is they're right. Like you, not only stone crabs, like a great ecosystem, but you can have like flip-flops and, you know, and, and stone crabs and what, I mean, you know, tacos and we have a great culture and great weather and beaches and nobody could. Um... <laughs> and the Gulf of Mexico swimming in the Gulf is lovely. Oh, yeah. 
I well, mean, yeah, I mean, from people don't realize coast to coast, uh, that's uh, like, um, you know, three hours coast to coast. That's three hours. You, that's a, you leave in the morning, you're there before lunch. You, you know, I could leave Tampa Bay this in the morning and, and have lunch in St. Augustine or totally it's amazing. It's an amazing state. Uh, and, 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 yeah. And on one side, you've got the crashing waves on the Atlantic side. And over here on the Gulf side, you've got lap, lap, a big lap, a big warm lap pool called the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> Yeah, it's really it's really amazing. Um, my wife just chimed in, and this is a favorite activity of hers when the weather's nice. Is like like canoeing on the Hillsborough River, and you can have a very exciting experience where there's a ton of gators. If you want to get up oh, close, to gators. Uh, but it's really beautiful. Recommend it for maybe the fall or spring, and eh, maybe not too much in the summer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I just can't say enough about this Space Coast and the Cape Canaveral ecosystem. I, I just can't say enough about that. If I had a if I had a you know kid that was interested in engineering, and of course we have Florida Polytechnic University, which is we like to say is the MIT of, of the South. That's uh, halfway um, between um, Tampa Bay and Orlando. It's 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 only two hours from from Cape Canaveral. But man, just getting plugged in with that um, would just be um, the smartest thing that anybody could do. If you want to ultimately be an entrepreneur in in, in the space economy in the future is to, if you're a young person, let's say in your 20s, to go get a job in a company that's already in that ecosystem and you will, you will, opportunity will come your way, no question. Totally. So, um, Alan, I wanted to mention your book again for those, um, and, the, and Alan's book's gonna be part of the book bonuses um, for Spaces Open for Business. His book is Quit to Start, How to Discover Your Best Idea, Gain the Confidence and Plan Your Escape. And um, Alan, where can people kind of like find you online and and, and see what you're yeah. up to? It's it sounds like you're floor, floor, narrowed in from Florida. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, um, or on the social well, or on, on social. Yeah, well, you know, quittostart.com for one thing is easy to remember, so that's easy. Um, and then um, you know, I do a lot on LinkedIn, of course. It's where I post a lot of my stuff. But um, I'll put it in. I'll, you know, I'll put it out here like this. Looks yep. like you gotta I always forget you gotta do the uh um yeah yeah then your start.com there it is you gotta put the https in front of it um that's where my book is also the programs that we 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 teach and the courses that we work through and the membership so we we try to help aspiring entrepreneurs our mission is people that are in jobs that have uh have it in them and have that future how do we put a plan together and help how do we get them the information and the knowledge they need to be good entrepreneurs to be successful entrepreneurs um i the reason I, i'm dedicated to this because i i spend most of my time working with uh founders that are already out in the world that's all i've done for the last five years right and so it, it's so many of them like they we all wish that we knew you know then what we know now and what we so many things we would have done different and so much, so many mistakes and, and, and so many things that are so obvious to us now, three, four, five years into our startups, right? That, um, but when we took that leap, we just did it out of emotion or, a, or you know, and just, um, and that felt good, but, but um, you know, it didn't set us up for success, you know, the way it needed to. So that's what Plan Your Start's all about. That's what Quit to Start's all about. And, uh, and that, that's the best way to reach. And, on, and I'm on LinkedIn, which is uh, kind of the, um, the place that I spend most of my time, and I'll just drop that in the in the feed as well. Yeah, Alan also has a podcast, and he posts a lot of um, you know the links to the recordings there and that community there on LinkedIn. He's quite active um, with uh, pretty big I appreciate variety it. of guests. My podcast is uh, on the Plan Your Start page that is there, but I also, if you go to my LinkedIn, you'll see you'll see me. I try to put up, but we do, I do, and I only introduce and I only interview hard scrabble entrepreneurs like people that have been through a lot to get to where they are and they've already reached a level of, of success either all the way i've had people you know i've had 200 million plus exits already that have been on my podcast and i've got people that are still in the struggle but they've already passed the survival mode and they're they're in the later stages of their of their entrepreneurship they're they're getting close to an exit if you will as we call it and we just get on there and we talk about like what their origin story, who they were when they were younger, how they got there, what's their best advice, their philosophies, biggest mistakes, what would they tell other people? Um, you know, my goal is to try to get real world experiences and move them uh, into uh, the conscious of, of people that are dreaming of doing it themselves one day. Great. Everyone, 
Let's thank Alan Clary, um, our friend here today, to join us on the virtual book launch for Spaces Open for Business. He's a He's uh, participating in the, uh, the bonus offers that's at spacesopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses. And you can check out Alan's, we've got his links, planyourstart.com and his LinkedIn. And it's Alan, essentially it's his name, Alan Clary, if you want to look him up, if you're just listening to this and not watching. So thank you, Alan, for joining us today. Fantastic, man. Yeah, I, uh, you, I, mean, I can't believe I got to, uh, I get to come out on the tail of David Rose and that yeah. made my day. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, have a great after, rest of your afternoon. So our next guest will be Sean Whitehead. And Sean is, uh, runs Creationeer and Scout Tech and is the creator of Thumbsat. And he, uh, he will be here with us. It was recorded. So we're gonna, we're gonna let's just see if we can, we're gonna try something new here. So uh, hold one second, stand by. Hopefully I'm doing this relatively smoothly. Let's see, start the share. I got my desktop. You guys can see a little what I'm up to. Let's see. Yeah. I'm going to turn this down. This was over. Then we're going to just hold one moment. We're going to find Sean. Hi, this is Robert again. And I have a special recorded call uh, from my friend who's on the line with me, Sean Whitehead. And I met Sean through Dr. Armin Ellis of the Exploration Institute. And Sean is a lot of different things. He can tell you a bit about his really colorful and, and, and fantastic background, but he is the founder of Creationeer and Scout Pet Limited, which is an exploration innovation company. He's also the founder of Thumbsat, which is a, a space-related effort, which he'll share a bit with you about. He's participating with some of our bonus offerings, and, and, and I'm so pleased to have Sean here today. He wasn't able to make it with us live, but, but we're getting the second best thing is having a recorded call, Sean. Sean, welcome, uh, welcome to uh, the virtual launch party. Thank you for uh, inviting me, Robert, and uh, it's always a great pleasure to catch up with you. So excited to uh, see what's happening with the book. Our career has been pretty varied, as you said, uh, uh, but it all really began with uh, space. I was always interested in discovering uh, new things. So uh, I was uh, doing conventional space engineering for about 13 years at the Space Research Center of the University of Leicester. Uh, so I, I got to all of that fun of what I call turning scientist dreams into engineering reality. And then uh, after I'd uh, been through quite a few projects with a whole range of uh, uh, space organizations, uh, both academic and industrial. Uh, I, I decided that I would branch out on my own to try different things. So uh, that's when I started uh, doing what I call creationeering because it's very difficult to describe exactly what it is. Uh, but it's uh, all based on sort of good, solid systems engineering, but it takes me out into uh, art, uh, archaeological exploration, uh, robotics, uh, and then on the robotic side, I, uh, I, I, I do exploration, um, and it might be called treasure hunting, really, I suppose, uh, because it's all uh, looking for treasures, whether it's uh, on Mars or, or whether it's in the, the desert of Egypt. And so I, I wanted a vehicle to apply technology to that side of treasure hunting or archaeology, if you like. So I started Scaratech, which is all about that. Um, and one of the key things that we did was to uh, put a, uh, send a robot into the mysterious shafts in the Great Pyramid in Egypt, which is uh, such a privilege uh, to be allowed to do that. But just like space engineering, that was not, uh, that didn't all happen overnight. That was a six year process to, to get to the stage where we actually. Uh, discovered uh, hieroglyphs that hadn't been seen for four and a half thousand years in the pyramids, so that was an exciting time. Uh, and then from there I've gone on to do other um, bits and pieces of space engineering. Uh, but one thing that I did find was, even though I'd been involved in space engineering for a long time, uh, uh, when I wanted to put a small experiment of my 
owed into all of it. So I think it's really difficult to find a way to do that. And so, being the way I am, I thought, uh, you know what, I'll try and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll design something for myself, something that I would like to do. So I wanted a tiny satellite that you could fit all sorts of different payloads onto. So, uh, so, so Sean, let me interrupt one moment. When you're thinking about small, for those maybe who are a little less familiar, they, when they think of a satellite, uh, maybe they don't listen to this They just think of something the size of a bus or a car. Um, what were you kind of thinking of? Yeah. So it's a really technical about it. A, I'm looking at center satellites, so that's typically something that's uh, uh, less than 100 grams. So with the satellite that we came up with, uh, I call it thumb set because it's, there's no dimension that is longer than the average uh, human thumb. So it's about 49 uh, millimeters by 49 by... That's uh, a very genuine experiment, but uh, the main core of it is probably about 30 millimetres deep, so it's not much bigger than a, a matchbox, but we pack in all of the features that you would find in a much larger satellite. The only thing we don't have at the moment is uh, propulsion. And the idea is that this is a standard tiny satellite that you can then plug in uh, payloads or experiments uh, so it's sort of ready to go. So it's almost like the iPhone of space, if you like. So you would modify the software uh, and plug in the hardware and make use of the hardware that we've got. So it's got camera, GPS, uh, inertial measurement units, all those sort of things. Uh, so that's the scale that we're looking at. And I, I think I got obsessed with tiny things on certain space projects where we had a minimal amount of mass and volume to play with. And... I realise that the technology is right at the moment to really make very, very tiny satellites, and I, it makes it affordable for everybody. And, and uh, you know, as you say, uh, space is open uh, to business for everybody, and uh, we want to encourage people who wouldn't normally get involved in space to, to do so. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And where is... Um in what some of the kind of the applications that one could use from having the small matchbook size thumb set? What could people, um, what would be some of the early uses that you might imagine um, you, activity wise? Yeah, so uh, you can do lots of experiments that you, you, you might do on a, on a large scale scientific uh, satellite. We tend to steer clear of uh, the stuff that the big boys are doing, so we don't really get into. Earth imaging or telecommunications. We're more about space science and uh, space exploration and engineering. So everything from uh, looking at, for example, how uh, tardy grates or water bears or uh, if you want to call them, uh, uh, survive and uh, behave in microgravity and in different environments. Um, human cell growth, uh, protein growth, so you can look at how to how, how you can grow uh, proteins uh, very purely and very quickly and examine them with a mouse. Uh, we have uh, people who want to do radio science experiments. We have a variety of uh, people who want to test out small space mechanisms. So normally what, what you would happen is what, what, what would you do if you were testing a, um, an electronic or mechanical space component is if you wanted to do it on Earth, it would cost you, it would take maybe eight weeks to test. I did a lot of that in my uh, main space engineering career, uh, and it would cost a fortune, typically £2,000 or about say $2,500 a day even for a cheap test house. Uh, so what we want to do with Thumbsat is be able to actually mount components onto Thumbsat and put them into real space, not simulated space, uh, and test them more quickly and more cheaply than you would if you were doing it on the ground. So a wide variety of things. And uh, I think there are, some, there are lots of things that just really haven't even been thought of yet. That's the exciting thing because the moment that we make it all accessible to people who wouldn't normally use it or wouldn't normally be able to afford to do it, uh, we'll find all sorts of amazing things. Who, whoever knew that uh, iPhones might be used for monitoring blood sugar or general health applications 
or the amazing things that iPhones or smartphones can do now. Wow, that's uh, that's super cool. Um, and, and this is kind of like, you know, dovetailing into uh, spaces open for business is that literally, um, you know, part of my premise is that space is not just opening for business for big industry, but for all sorts of people. It's becoming easier for, you know, regular people to start experimenting with the space domain using these new small um, assets that are being created, like Thumbstep, um, to do some um, really neat research and development. Yeah, so, so, so absolutely working working down from the top and uh, giving ordinary folk access to space from that side, but also with uh, the, the bigger organisations going out. You know, I think uh, most of us who have been in the space business for any length of time have been interested in space for any length of time. Certainly for me since the uh, 70s, I've always heard, uh, you know, the next big thing will be in 20 years, it will be in 20 years, and it keeps rolling on. Now we're talking about exciting things happening in space. Well, they're happening now. Uh, they're happening next year, and they're happening in the next four years. And it finally seems real that these things are happening. And not only are these happening, because a lot of it is driven by... Uh, big business as opposed to necessarily government, although of course governments are a huge part of that. Uh, it does mean that the the bigger businesses, uh, from our view, are looking at opportunities of, if you like, bringing the smaller people on board. So we know we are benefiting, even though we're a Chinese satellite, we will benefit from the massive opportunities as, uh, as we're pushing out into, you know, more uh, a launch vehicles into Earth orbit, uh, various projects that we're involved in are going to take advantage of the a, a piggyback rides on, on the larger launch vehicles to the moon, and that just was not available uh, mm-hmm. until relatively recently, so it's fantastic and it's a hugely exciting time to be in space. And, and then, you know, it's really uh, fun to, to, you know, when you, you describe yourself as being involved in a variety of treasure hunts and, and treasure has a lot of different definitions. What is, what is a good lesson or lessons that you've learned from your experiences, you know, exploring and searching for um, hidden, hidden things, whatever they're, they're defined as, that you have found, you know, really helpful and applicable just in life? <laughs> Loads, it's, 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 it's top, it loads really. I think uh, one of the key things that I uh, always try to tell uh, the students when I lecture to them uh, is that uh, being involved in engineering, for example, is a, is a, is a gateway to uh, exciting adventures. So uh, it, engineering can sometimes have a sort of a slightly boring um, image and sometimes if I'm absolutely honest, I sit in a room full of engineers and think, you know, I don't really fit in here necessarily. Uh, but I've always, I've always uh, used engineering as a, as a, as a way to uh, take me on the adventures that I want to go on. And uh, whether that has been, uh, you know, remotely via space or in person as we've sat in the Great Pyramid, uh, you have to do... I, I get asked a lot of the time, uh, by people who read about what we've been up to, saying, can we join you? Uh, and what they see is just the top bit, just the fun bit at the, at the very end, uh, the sort of glamorous bit of it. And I always them, you know, 99.9% of what we do is just the hard nuts and bolts work to get us to that stage that has taken years. So if anybody wants to join me on adventures, as you say, so, uh, I'll give them a small job to do, which appears to be boring. Uh, and that gets rid of other people. Most people are here and they do those basic jobs and then they work. But eventually they get to go to the pyramid uh, and, and uh, look in mysterious shots that nobody's seen in four and a half thousand years. Uh, so that's one of the key things for me. Um, the second thing, uh, as with anything, and it's, again it's not glamorous but it works, it's just good old perseverance is, 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 is key. Uh, and. I can tell you that the moment uh, that you, uh, you know, your shovel goes into the ground and it hits something metallic and you think, you know, I've done it, that's how it's bolt of electricity that goes through you. 
on the moment that you see a, an image on a video screen from another planet uh, that is looking at a tool that you've placed on the other planet, or, or the moment that you your robot comes back down from a, a shaft or uh, some mm -hmm. mysterious space, and you know it's got dust on it that has been gathered over all of those years, then that's all worth it in the end. And uh, so they're the key lessons, I would say. That's awesome. Um, and j just to rephrase, uh, go back to the point, right before you're talking about uh, the, the, uh, having the opportunity to perhaps go to the pyramids, you're breaking up a little yeah. bit, but I think what I heard you say is essentially you start with, you, somebody starts with you working on some small tasks, and as they build yeah. that trust and time, there are some really, um, really cool opportunities that they could potentially participate with you um, on. Yeah. So, so, uh, I often get contacted by people who see the end result of what we're doing, so the exciting stage. Uh, so they'll, they'll, they'll see that the robot has been deployed in a pyramid or, you know, results of a space mission. And people say they want to be involved, and I say, well, you know, you realize that there's a, there's a lot of hard work to get to that point. You don't just, uh, don't just uh, turn up and participate on the day. Uh, you have to get involved in the nitty gritty. Uh, and so what I often do is just give people a very simple task to do. And that gets rid of 95% of people. Uh, and then some people stick in uh, and they do the simple tasks and they get a liking for that and they see that it's making progress. And eventually they get to join us on these exciting adventures. So uh, I think that's a a great lesson to learn is that you've just got to stick in and do the hard work and 99.9% .9 of that is not glamorous. Um, it's fun, uh, it's hard, but it's not glamorous. Uh, and that's what gives you the opportunity to uh, take part in the really exciting stuff at the end and, and get the results uh, and see all of these magnificent discoveries that uh, hard work takes you to. Thank you, Sean. Could you share just a little bit about um the, the the bonus we're, we're going to offer, uh, this will assume um, that some pandemic, the pandemic will subside or there was a potentially way to do this remotely uh, of, of, you know, visiting a robotics lab that you have, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say loosely an affiliation with. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, so, so uh, what we're offering uh, for... Uh, and it's a special offer uh, that's only related to your uh, book, Robert, is the, I'm very much associated with the University of Leeds uh, Robotics Lab, and uh, we call the work that we do the real uh, robotics, which is robots that have a practical application in the real world, and it's things that, if you like, will take us on adventures, so uh, robots that help us to explore places that human beings wouldn't normally be able to reach. So the robotics lab is in Leeds in the UK, and we have opportunity for a certain number of people, VIPs, probably about half a dozen, um, but it depends on what happens with the uh, COVID situation. And we will invite them to the lab where they will have a full tour of all of uh, the amazing robots uh, that we have on offer. And that's everything from uh, you know, walking robots, tiny robots that w were built to crawl underneath uh, down, uh, ancient sailing vessels, uh, the original robots that were used to climb the shafts in the pyramid, and uh, drones, uh, all of these sort of things, um, all sorts of tools and equipment that is used for uh, remotely seeing traces, if you like. And it would be a, probably a full day uh, looking around the lab. And uh, we who have operated the robots will uh, give the background into the places that we've taken them uh, and the uh, potential adventures that we are going to go on next. That would be so cool. That sounds amazing. And what I love is that, you know, it's so interdisciplinary. We're, we're you know, you've mentioned, you know, Hieroglyphics, which is like you know archaeology and history, robotics, which it, it has its own subdomains. Whether it's using uh, things that fly, or things that crawl, or things that ro ro uh, roll, and, and then when you start then extending out into space, and one of the other key words you mentioned was perseverance. And I'm thinking right now there is a spacecraft 
headed to Mars, and, and what is and the name's Perseverance. So very timely, very timely, Sean. And it's not the only robot. It's gonna get it's gonna get actually kind of crowd, crowded over there in Mars with the robots. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and I think perseverance is absolutely right. I, I, I believe that uh, you know I, I thought of perseverance on my own test before that spacecraft was named, but uh, I'll, I'll take that and uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's what it's about. It's, it's, it's what it's about. It's, uh, it's, it's being prepared to put in that work, and I, 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 I love it because, as you know, Robert, you, you too are associated with a lot of people, and you yourself are a hard worker and. Uh, I don't think it's just doing work for the sake of it, but if you if you focus and you have a goal and a dream, uh, you can try and make it happen. And it all comes down to uh, I, I I think if, if people come along to me and they've got any uh, particular skills, I'm not so interested in that. I'm interested in their ability to try and to learn, uh, and when they fail, to pick themselves up and start over again. And uh, that's what it's all about. That is awesome. Well, everyone out there uh, and on Earth, let's see, maybe there's a few out on the, in space. Maybe maybe we're getting the stream on the ISS. That would be pretty cool. I want to thank you for listening, and I want to thank my special guest, Sean Whitehead, Creationeer, um, Scout Tech Limited, um, for, for, for spending a little time with us today. And, and, Sean, where can people find you to – learn a little bit. We'll probably have a link available, but where can they find, I uh, want to give the, the, the URL for uh, for Creationeer? Yeah, so if you just go to creationeer.co.uk uh, and then uh, that should give you a little bit of a background about me and some, some interesting stuff that I'm involved in. So I try, to, uh, I try to link to most of the key stuff that I'm involved in. Yeah, and, Sean, and I've taken some really fun virtual walks that Sean has that up um, on the page you can find on the website there's some um, kind of fun, some you know fun activities that one can can just do just by visiting his website and get to visit some really lovely lovely places yeah thank you well you're most welcome Robert and uh, again congrats on the book and I hope that everybody has a, a, a wonderful day on the, on, on the launch day thank you a lot of fishes um, okay wait just one second a little uh, audio okay Whoa, there they are. Hey, Ryan and Mary Liz. Whoa, that was like, whoo, that was like teleportation. It was like a couple of people reminding me, they're like, we can see you eating and stuff on there. I'm like, I don't care. It just shows it's real life, you know? <laughs> like, I got to eat. I got to use the bathroom. Got to drink. Yeah. yeah. Got to my acid mug. You know? Oh, I love it. I have the same one. Oh, oh yep. Snuggles. Snuggles. Snuggle. <laughs> Beer snuggles here. Yeah. <laughs> it's all true. <laughs> so I want to just thank uh, Sean Whitehead. He's a super awesome guy. It's cre hopefully his link gets posted. So I think it's creationeer.co.uk. From his um, accent, you could probably see here he's he's from from England. And I met him through uh, my buddy Dr. Armin Ellis a few years ago. And Sean is just such a neat guy, treasure hunter, aerospace engineer, the developer of this these matchbox size satellites, the Thumbsat. And I really loved at the end where he talks about really it is about like attitude and perseverance it's like whether you fail how do you get back up and keep going and attitude and and just holding that dream and and, and i you know i know on the journey for this book um you know my mom got sick and ended up passing away and i spent time away just trying to support her on her um her journey there and the challenges that she dealt with and and I wasn't, and I was trying to do bits of the book during that time, but it was really okay. difficult, huh? I got married, as my wife said. <laughs> <laughs> nice reminder there. <laughs> yeah, and, and got married like six weeks after she passed. And actually, we got mm -hmm. married in Bali, which we had a guest. I think there was somebody, I think um, Janet had referenced that she had a friend who was chatting, who was writing from Bali, which I thought was really, really neat. Um, so fun. We're all connected anyways. And just these things like zoom and stuff remind us that, you know, we're all human and we can, we can do these interactions without, with or without a pandemic. And it's, mm -hmm. and it was really fun to hear, have a little Florida, have a little Florida uh, representation, yes. um, from Alan talking, uh, earlier. So, so I'll int introduce you guys. So I have, um, Ryan, Chin 
I always mess up. Is it Chinlinski? What's the? Uh, oh, Shulinski. Huh. Shulinski. Yep, you got it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And Mary Liz Bender, um, with the cosmic perspective, and they're definitely holding down the fort in the Space Coast. <sighs> Welcome, Brian and Mary Liz. Hey. Well, thank you very much. It's thank great you. To hang out. Thank yeah. you so much, Robert. I can't believe it. The day it's finally here. You have finally done it. You worked so yeah. hard. I, it's so awesome to see um, your tireless efforts and the perseverance that you've displayed just in this process has been really inspiring. And I just want to say that um, I am so additionally inspired by the way that you are highlighting all of the humans in this pursuit. Like you could just be talking about your book or you could have just written a book. But I love the way that you literally within the pages now, I just wrote your review, by the way, and I said all of this in your review, but I okay. love that opening the cover of this book is like opening the portal to a community of people. And you you literally are highlighting the people who make this whole thing happen. Like I've got Rick Tumlinson right here. And then you, you know, you're highlighting us all today on your uh, book release party. And I just, it's such a cool testament to the amazing, generous human that you are that this is really okay. about uplifting all of the people in the industry. So thank you for having us. And really, I hope that um, we can all now uplift you and your amazing efforts <laughs> in return. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I really, I, I mean, we all, we all know some of the um, high profile individuals uh, and, and from history and, and contemporary space. And it just seemed like there's just so many people thousands if not hundreds like look took several it took almost a half million people or something for apollo to happen and the space industry employs hundreds of thousands of people and there's thousands of, of advocates and communicators and people that are sharing and teachers and i wanted to kind of find a way to honor some of the people who highlight who are just not as well represented but i think their work is equally intriguing compelling and urgent because I do think, or critical, maybe more critical rather than urgent, because I really do think that like without, without your work and communicating the messages, without like Janet, you know, sharing with, with classrooms, without Rick helping with the funding and mm -hmm. advocating, it's, you get, there would be nothing, you know, we do kind of all, it all, you know, we need to, we need to all rise in the tide together and help each other. I love it. I'm so in and I'm so grateful. And honestly, that's a huge part of our mission too. We always talk about how we're connecting people to space and we're elevating the humans of space exploration. So even though we use a lot of fun technology and you know, it seems like it's all about rockets and, um, but really in reality, it's connecting people to people. It's connecting the people that aren't here at these amazing events to the people that are making this whole pursuit possible. And that is just a really exciting journey to be on, so. Yeah, so so for those who maybe are a little less familiar with your work, essentially you're capturing different stories, people and some of the hardware. You do some amazing high definition video footage of both launches and booster returns. I mean, it's both you guys, but Ryan, yeah, I know you're like the tech <laughs> dude. I get it, I get it. Right, it's all right. right. Um, you've got, um, and and you're and you're making amazing, uh, beautiful photographs, big prints, and these really amazing augmented reality. They're like postcard sized cards that are augmentedly reality reality enabled, or is it enabled by? I don't quite know the terminology, but what do you a use? We say AR enabled, and and honestly, what's so cool is that when we made those things AR enabled, there are a lot of the same images that we have in those grander sizes in the poster right. size. And it's so cool we found out that, oh, all of our posters are like this one behind my head. That's AR enabled because we enabled the little postcard and the little greeting card. And so uh, everything that we put out now, um, what's cool about that is that you use augmented reality, like an app on your phone, and you just, you, you know, put your phone over the image and suddenly you're transported to the moment of liftoff, which is just, it's really, really exciting. Um, so in, in addition to the other things you described, we're working on a document, a couple of documentaries right now about space exploration. We're finishing up our book, which is all augmented reality enabled. So the pages of this book are living and literally transport you to our astronaut interviews. That's where I, I come in a little more. I love to talk to humans. 
Um, I love to get to know the story and pull out that human journey so that we can really connect with those hero types. Um, uh, the astronauts, I love talking about their profound transformative experiences in space and then um, telling that through our media. So that is, you know, our films. We have a lot of short films up on YouTube, but we also are, uh, we've got a podcast. Um, so we share in many different ways uh, the just the profound journey that we're on. It's really exciting how, to be here. So how did you, how did you both stumble upon this 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 crazy this crazy area yeah crazy, but some people think it's like crazy yeah, like, you, can you want me to take yeah, it away sure you can go go first well so i actually got involved in the space industry just a few years ago and i was a touring musician at the time and you know you get really tired when you're driving on tour for so many hours <laughs> crossing state lines you get tired of listening to music forever and ever and so that's when I started to seek out podcasts for the first time. And um, I discovered some space podcasts and I discovered um, the overview effect through that and read the book, watched the documentaries, um, was so majorly influenced by Frank White's research and his work. And I thought to myself when I was on stage one night looking out at the crowd, I I felt like this utter responsibility being up there. And I knew that, um, you know, my bandmates and the other bands I was working with were doing this amazing work, but I knew I had more to give and that I wanted to also gift people this cosmic perspective and kind of bring that overview effect down to earth, if you will. And so um, I decided I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was going to try to find my way in the space industry by creating immersive experiences um, that really connect people to this pursuit. And then that, that actually just led me to Florida. I, I sold my house and everything I owned, and I decided to head to Florida and um, see a rocket launch. I'd never seen one. And when I was there watching the launch, coincidentally, shoulder to shoulder between Bill Nye and Buzz Aldrin crying my face off, it was the first Falcon Heavy demo launch. Um, something happened to me and it was like an overview effect moment where I was extremely present and I was overtaken by awe. And I thought about, you know, not, I wasn't distant in space, but it's, it felt like time had stopped and I got this overview perspective of time and human evolution and human potential. And I'm getting goosebumps mm -hmm. as I time travel back to that moment. And I, I thought about my own life and having been homeless and um, just lots of crazy trauma that I overcame at a young age. And now here I am in this magical moment. And I just knew that that was so powerful and I wanted to find a way to meet people where they are um, and bring them to these awe-inspiring experiences. And so a lot of the work that Ryan and I do is, you know, connecting communities together and live streaming the launches so people can feel like they're in there with us. That's right. been really exciting lately. We've just started doing that. Yeah, um, the, the awe and the beauty is what, what brought, brought me here. Um, so I, I got my start in um, uh, time-lapse photography uh, many years ago, I was uh, teaching a community how to, how to do their own time lapse and kind of started an online um, resource for that. And um, NASA has a program where they invite uh, social media users and different, different folks with communities all over the world to come here and partake in what it is to uh, cover a launch or be part of a, a, a science mission or a space mission. Um, so I applied and was so fortunate to be accepted to uh, the CRS-5 NASA social program. So I took my time-lapse community here, my community of photographers. Uh, I had a chance to set up a remote camera and go to the press events and just kind of play the role of a media professional for a, a day or a few days, in this case, scrubs and things like that. Um, so I was totally hooked after that event, witnessing the launch personally having the opportunity to set up a camera to capture that, to share that, that moment uh, with as many people as I could just totally changed my life. And then we, we met up not, mm -hmm. um, well, actually I, CRS5 was 
uh, pretty early on. So I kind of went back to my day job and I ended up transforming my life over the next couple of years to be able to do this full time. And it's kind of a long story there. Um, but a few years later, we did meet up here at uh, the CRS 15 launch to kind of give you a, a sense of the, the, the gap between the two. Yeah, it was just after the test launch and right. the CRS 15 launch was the first one that we worked together. It was yeah. magical. And then, um, yeah, being able to capture these moments in innovative ways, the live stream, VR, uh, and then bring a community of so excited people here and then to share in this excitement, in the science, in the people, in the beauty of what's happening here in the Space Coast and, and around the country, we've, we've been to pretty much all the launch pads here, mm -hmm. um, is unlike anything else. So we're just, uh, we're real grateful to be able to do this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about that? Um, I think it's a jacket that you- Ah, oh, that's so jacket? funny you ask. Yeah. Or do you see it or? <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm just, just curious. You know, I mean, it might be worth sharing cause, <laughs> um, because- we have, we have so many props that we've just kind of like laid over here, uh, just in case. But yeah, so this is- um, yeah, Move it over a little bit. Move it over on Yeah, the I'm gonna left. give it to you. Okay. Because my mic stand makes it a little difficult. Sure. So this is really cool. Um, we have a 4D rocket launch VR experience that we usually take on tour. So right now we're not doing that much, but um, we would go to all the space conferences and at the booth, we would have a line of people that come and they stick on the VR headset, the Oculus Quest, and this haptic suit. And basically it's got vibrate vibration sensors all around it. And so you not only see the beauty of the, the rocket launch right up close, but you feel it. And that's what's so important is like, you know, it's never a replacement for seeing and feeling this thing in person, but we keep trying to get closer, <laughs> you know? So as long as you can kind of feel that rumble rip through your body, uh, you'll get a little bit closer. Yeah, um, we could we could share a little video. I don't know if, if, if we want to try sure. screen um, share real yeah, quick. Yeah, show screen okay. share. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll throw that we'll, on we'll, there. Yeah. We'll kind of we'll talk over it, okay. so um, we won't take up too much time. Maybe, here we go. Although, yeah, he's... We'll just go to our YouTube page real quick, and I'll just hop over mm -hmm. to this, and we keep it muted. Oh, yeah. But, this will give you some insight. Yeah, so I'll just kind of skip through this video, but here's just a little bit of kind of the behind the scenes of what happens uh, at a launch pad before liftoff. So this is typically maybe 12, 18, sometimes a little bit more, 24 hours in advance. Um, so we, we get an opportunity to go out up close and place automated camera systems. So these are sound triggers. These are uh, timed systems, kind of custom, custom built triggers for cinema cameras and uh, still cameras. That then, he built. I, I want to I want to say that this guy is a tinkerer. He studied uh, engineering. And so he builds these triggers for these high speed cameras that otherwise um, it's not very easy to place these things out 20 hours ahead of a launch, you know, right. with insane battery power and solar panels. I think we're still sh sharing the screen, right? Okay, there we go. Um, so this is a, a, uh, a VR setup. So it's a left mm -hmm. and right lens. There we go. So it simulates what your eyes would witness if they were able to be uh, there at the moment of liftoff. So then we, we do some post-processing and then we can uh, create a custom experience for folks inside an Oculus headset. So combined with kind of 3D audio that we capture in a haptic suit, which translates some of the vibration that we feel, and it's the most um, impactful component of witnessing a launch in person is of course what, you know, you actually, you see it, you feel it, you're here with the people. Um, and then, yeah, your whole body is, is uh, uh, shaken at, at that <laughs> moment. So. Uh, we bring giant telescopes out with us and we attach cinema cameras to that and we uh, capture the moment of liftoff and in flight. So that's been an, uh, an amazing addition. We kind of add this into our live stream. So really kind of anything that we can do to make it more um, exciting and immersive and reach as many people as we can who, who just can't, can't be here in, in person. Yeah, and I should say that telescope project um, has been so exciting, and that was a partnership with our friend Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. He kicked that off with us, um, and he now is, in addition to our live streams, we're also sending him a feed, so it goes out to his whole audience during his live streams, and it's just so fun to continually grow 
this and and reach more people and get more people excited about what's going on here um so it's so cool to see you all talking about the space coast i keep trying to convince people to move to the space coast get involved in this amazing process i mean it's like it feels almost like it's in an its infancy but it's about to exponentially grow um so it's just a really exciting time to live right here literally we walk outside go to the beach look left and there's the new Glen, blue origin launch pad just you know being constructed at incredible rates so it feels like you're just watching the future take place here it's very hopeful mm -hmm. very cool well, i'm gonna thank thank you both um Mary Liz and Ryan from Cosmic Perspective spending a little time with us today. Um, they're also participating in the kind of some of the bonuses we have, so people can check that out. And um, it's just the titled book, spacesopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses. And they can check some of that out and go online and see what the, and again, see what some of these AR enabled cards and um, the real artwork. It's a real merger of artwork and art and technology. Uh, and and I, I, I know. You guys, a lot of sleepless nights you guys put in, so. <laughs> it's true. It's part it's of all, the business. All for the love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Robert. Congratulations. Enjoy it. I hope you get time to rest and enjoy it yourself. <laughs> thank you. So um, my wife's saying yes. She agrees too. <laughs> so go, yeah, look up cosmicperspective.com. Hopefully we'll have some, we'll have some links sharing where you can find they've got some really beautiful um, images and video that they post um, on the different social media channels. So, yeah, those booster return videos. If you want to see what the Space Coast is like, right. those are That's good ones. I, I haven't been for a booster return. I've only yeah. kind of seen launches. So Epic. Gotta, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I want to next bring on my next guest, um, Kartik Kumar. I want to just um, ask our other guests coming off, maybe just turn off their videos for now until um, we just have you all a little bit later, and let's see, Kartik, are you there? There is Kartik. Yep, I'm here, Robert. Hey, Kartik. Uh, oh, so first of all, I got a note from my wife. Uh, this is for Mary Liz. I'm going to hold this up to the camera. If you can still see this, Mar Mary Liz. She loves your voice. I know she said that before. She's, she's heard Mary Liz talk before. She's like, she's got such a soothing voice. Oh, and Mary Liz is sending blowing kisses back to you. She's she's behind the wall of the virtual screen, um, but she is here. But I'm, you know, whoops. Ah, let me just make sure. All right, Kartik, welcome. Uh, are you are you doing well? We have Kar I, my, my good friend Kartik Kumar. He is with us, I'm assuming from the Netherlands this yep. evening. Kartik, welcome. Yeah, thanks for the invite, Robert. And uh, first off the bat, congratulations with um, getting the book uh, out there. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled uh, that you're now able to officially share it um, with everybody in the world. And of course, I've uh, had a lot of chats with you about the book along the journey. So I know how much hard work has gone into it. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled uh, that people are going to uh, be able to now get their hands on it and thrilled for you to be able to manifest um, the reality of getting the book in front of people Thank and telling the story of space. Thank you. So Kartik, we met first met at International Space University and we had um, in some of our, I think there was a night at dinner early on where we were talking about blockchain and we had, uh, we had uh, the opportunity to work together on writing a white paper on, you know, we were trying to think about how could we mirror or, or, or pair blockchain technology in space. And we did try to, I guess, in some ways, you know, see if that was commercially viable. And it was kind of, it was an interesting um, study where we ultimately kind of recognized that the challenge we were solving was not so much technological, but there were other legal and, and serious social implications and, and, and uh, variables that were involved. But along the way, it was really great uh, collaborating and working together um, you with that, and you, um, and as you continue to build your business, uh, Sat Search, I would love to you share with people, like you know, kind of why Sat Search matters in the world. And you know, we've had a lot of conversations regarding this, the the myriad of challenges, and sometimes the lack of uh, transparency. How should I say in this in this area? Yeah. So um, 
uh, when we were working on that uh, blockchain paper, you know, uh, SAS search was also kind of uh, rumbling along. And in fact, that summer turned out to be a really important summer for various reasons, of course. We got to meet and there were a lot of great friendships that were built up. But it was also the place where really the idea for SAT search, uh, you know, got a lot of um, thrust uh, behind it through uh, the International Space University. Um, and, and so essentially uh, to, to back into what the story is of what we're doing with that search, um, my background is in space engineering and I've worked for the over the 10 years now on space projects at a variety of organizations and both academic and in industry. And I just kept hitting the same brick wall of realizing that the amount of time that I was spending trying to find out information about uh, parts, systems, components, subsystems for uh, satellites missions that I was developing, uh, that that was just taking up an inordinate amount of my time. So really the whole exercise with SatSearch was uh, one where um, it was about, it was a thought experiment trying to figure out, can we make that easier? Can we make it as easy as shopping for a pair of shoes on Amazon? And so, yeah, that's basically what we're doing. We're building now an online marketplace. Um, and one of the main thrusts of this was also this idea of opening up the industry to more people. And one of the um, experiences that has stuck with me is the experience of going to space conferences. Um, space conferences are very interesting places. You meet a lot of interesting people, but after you've been to a few, you recognize that you're seeing the same people over and over again. And in fact, it can give you this very insular view that the space industry is really small. It's just the same 500 people that I see at every conference. So, you know, you just get this idea that space is about a few countries and a few companies doing a few things, and that's pretty much it. And something in the back of my mind just triggered that that can't be it. You know, space has much more to offer, but there's also just a lot more going on in the world. So how is it possible that the entire story of space is told by the people who visit these conferences? And um, so the idea behind SAT search as well is opening up access to the industry. And really what we've learned along the way is space is everywhere. Um, I actually just uh, shared a news article on, on my Facebook feed uh, about a, a satellite under development uh, that's gonna launch soon in Burkina Faso. Now, that's not the first country you're gonna think of when you think of uh, a space and it's, you can get a very myopic view of the industry if it's told by uh, the traditional means, meaning you know, conferences, maybe publications, things like that. When, what really excites me about the state of the space industry now is how a whole bunch of different things are coming together to enable new people, new countries, new organizations to um, work together on manifesting all kinds of ideas, whether it is the use of uh, space to improve life on earth, whether it is for deep space science and exploration. Um, and yeah, I think this, uh, we got talking of course at a, uh, at a deeper and deeper level about your book, because I think what sits at the heart of your, your book um, is, is that same idea, right? That, that space is, is big, vast, and that we're in some sense only scratching the surface of what it can uh, evolve into. Uh, but it requires us also to, to learn from our failures and to identify the bottlenecks and remove the bottlenecks in the process. And it just so happens with my company, we're focusing on one dimension of that, but there's many dimensions to it, including educating people about the state of the industry, which I think your book will go a long way towards um, opening people's eyes up to the industry. I think you might be on mute, uh, Robert. I was, I had muted myself. Um, you know, we were, we were talking a little bit earlier about, we had a guest on earlier about quitting to start and things that people had not worked out. Were there times in your journey, I mean, you've had a long journey where you ever felt like, hey, should we just like, just shut this down? <laughs> and and I, mean, I think that's the story uh, of every, small company slash startup. I think anybody that tells you that it was plain sailing is either somebody who uh, also wins the jackpot when they buy the lottery ticket or is just plain lying. Because I think by, by and large, the, the journey is full of doubt, self-doubt. Um, but also, you know, it's a lot of push and pull, trying to understand whether what you're doing is valuable to the world around you and whether the world responds positively to that. So it's been a 
a, a case of you know uh, two steps back uh, forward, one step back um, for a long time. But but the essence of it, I think, is that if you have a clear vision of what you're trying to achieve and you can find the resources to sustain that, then it then it really comes down to that drive and perseverance. And in, and in this case, you know. I can always hark back to my experience of sitting at the desk as an engineer struggling to search for stuff. And so whenever I'm in that self-doubt, I wonder, well, if we stop doing this, will my old self, my past self that was struggling there be happy? And the answer is resoundingly no. And so I think you have to find these kind of mental tricks to, or, or, or tools to help you navigate what is typically a very tough journey. And I think space, so entrepreneurship itself is pretty difficult. Space is difficult, and the combination of the two, I think you're just adding up things that explode in, in difficulty. So I, I tip my hat to everyone who's, who's doing it um, in all corners of the globe, uh, because I, yeah, I think uh, the best things in life come through perseverance in my mind, and so this is no different. Thank you, Kartik. What about, you know, many times, you know, fin finances are, you gotta pay the rent, gotta pay the bills, and you've been on, you've been out there, you know, connecting with accelerators, um, uh, different types of investment firms, and sometimes, you know, we've had these discussions. The the, I'll say the investors. I'll just say in quotes. It could be very generic. They'll move the goal, goalposts, and or they'll change things. And and I think something that I've learned is that. Sometimes entrepreneur will go to the investor thinking they know everything and that they're like, they have this mythical like status. And many times they're just as potentially have as many blind spots as an entrepreneur. It's kind of like, and it's, it's, you know, it's sometimes it's like dating. It's like, you just got to see if the relationship works, but how do you, how do you feel about like where investors sometimes, you know, you try to meet your milestones and you come back and they keep, you know, moving the miles, moving the goalposts. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. And I think for space in particular, because what we're also talking about is a nascent industry in which, you know, commercial space is really only manifested maybe for about a decade, maybe a couple of decades in the true sense of what we're, what people consider commercial space now. That means that um, it's a little bit of a, the case in my experience of the blind leading the blind. Uh, it's exciting, it's exhilarating, but in many cases you have to take that leap of faith that what you're, you're envisioning in the future is something worth battling for. And you have to then understand that that same level of uncertainty exists on the investor side. Uh, you know, investors uh, have very clear uh, ways in which they approach their, their, their investment thesis and, and, and how they write checks. And if you don't understand that, it can all seem a little bit weird and off-putting, but the deeper you get into that understanding anymore, you, you realize that there is, um, there's rationale behind it, there's numbers behind it. The problem with space is what numbers are you gonna fill in? What models are you gonna use? That hasn't really uh, been figured out yet. And so in some sense, most companies that are doing new things are trailblazing, not just from the perspective of the technology or the service provision or the data they're generating, but also just teaching all of us how to think about space. How, how, do, you, how do you value a space company? How do you value IP in the space industry? How do you value um, a go-to-market strategy? And so my experience has been that it's, you need to do that collaboratively. And, and that's difficult because investors will also want to de-risk. So they'll expect that from your side to have figured out stuff. Um, but yeah, I think that's just like the dating process. You just got to keep trying it, keep trying to figure out who's out there that aligns along the direction that you're going. And, and, and can openly admit to the fact that there are unknown unknowns that are not answerable by anybody. And of course, what they're then looking for is whether you have smart ways that you're going to help de-risk that, you know, whether it's pre-investment, post-investment. So I think that's, that's the main thing that I've learned. The other thing that I've also learned is um, it's one thing to raise funds. It's another to build a successful business. And you know, the two can be correlated. They tend to be, in fact, in the space industry, weakly correlated, I would say. Uh, so funding events don't, in other words, funding events are not your success as a business owner. And so they are a means to an end. And I think in this industry, 
uh, for, probably for lack of uh, exits and M&As and things like that that prove the later stages of success in a commercial company, we're still waiting for that. We're still waiting to understand if I put in money at the seed level or the pre-seed level or series A or whatever, what does that mean? What, who is, very bluntly, who's making money off of this? Who's succeeding? Who's not succeeding? And what are the metrics to measure? That makes this whole uh, period in the industry, I think, extremely chaotic. But I would call it happy chaos because I think what's coming out of this is a recipe. It's just for the people who want the recipe already, unfortunately, you're going to have to time travel to 20 years from now, uh, I think, because it's, it's going to take us that long, I think, to completely figure out how to do space businesses. Thank you, Kartik. Well, we're just about out of time here for to bring on our next guest, trying to keep this train moving smoothly. Um, so, our, so friends out there, our audience, we have uh, Kartik Kumar, who is the co-founder of SatSearch. And uh, hopefully soon I can say Dr. Kumar. <laughs> I hope so. I, oh, I have faith in you, buddy. <laughs> Um, so again, we're going to post some, we think we have some links of where you can find Kartik online. We've got his satsearch.co, his Instagram and Twitter there. And he uh, generously, his company provided a very nice uh, graphic that's um, uh, in the book. So thank you, uh, thank you, Kartik and your partners in SatSearch. Thanks, Robert. And congratulations again. And uh, yeah, have a great day ahead. And I also hope you get plenty of time to catch up with sleep. To thank you. <laughs> Say hi to Thank Michelle too. We'll, we'll do. Thanks, Kartik. Michelle says hi. <laughs> okay, so for our next guest, we have Keegan Kirkpatrick. And Keegan Keegan is a uh, um, oh, there he is. Hey, with uh, some weirdness going on with my video that I really cannot account for. That's yeah. okay. You got like glittery hair. <laughs> and I don't know what to it's, tell you. It, it's a Zoom effect that we, uh, you know, we'll just kind of just leave it at that. Maybe we'll troubleshoot later. So Keegan is a consummate engineer who wants to fix the problems of others like Zoom. No, I'm joking. He is an engineer and a partner with Space Advisors. And he is most notably CEO and founder of Redworks. Um, three, it's Redworks Construction Technologies, an additive manufacturing company. He'll share more about that in a moment. And he's my co-host with uh, Brave New Space, which is a podcast um, we both um, co-host on kind of like the, the business and numbers and commerce of all things uh, related to space. Keegan, welcome to the book launch. Happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks. I hope you're feeling well today. We've had, uh, I know we've been dealing with some smoke and heat and... Uh, I was uh, working rather frantically to fix an issue with our swamp cooler down he here, which is about the best air filter that we have on the house. So it's not quite like breathing a tailpipe anymore, thankfully. Okay, that's great. Uh, Keegan, can you tell people a little about? Um, I mean, you, you're, I mean, you were at a you were at a space company. You were at Maston Space Systems, and then you wanted to go take a you know you you you're now working in the additive manufacturing sector maybe talk a little bit about that that journey well uh my interest in additive manufacturing was always kind of tied to the aerospace sector uh i was lucky enough to where even when i was in high school uh i went kind of to kind of an artsy artsy high school but uh by some miracle they managed to get a hold of one of those old uh, next engine uh, 3d printers you know the early ones that were about the size of a refrigerator and I really cut my teeth uh, working on that. And once I got to college, I was actually, I probably ha had two more years of experience on 3D printing than anybody else I was uh, going to school with. And uh, Embry-Riddle, my alma mater, had an entire lab dedicated to additive manufacturing. And so I was always interested in how that technology could be used uh, initially for kind of a lot of the same use cases that we see in the aerospace industry, which was for rapid prototyping and then hype that at the time it was considered, you know, completely impossible, but, you know, even I was looking into what it could be done for being able to create engine components as well. But uh, once I actually started getting my teeth into the industry, uh, I became aware of projects NASA was putting on to try to really push the envelope with uh, what they call in-situ resource utilization or being able to build with local materials. And I built a team called that at the time was just Redworks. Uh, and we ended up making our way to the finals of a habitat challenge that NASA put on. This was way back in 2015, I believe. 
And almost everyone there was kind of pitching some variation of the concept of bring most of your gear with you and then just 3D print the shell of uh, your building. Uh, we figured out a way, a way to be able to 3D print the entire structure. Uh, now, rather than sit on our hands for 10, 15 years, whenever the first mission start heading out, we started looking for immediate applications here on terra firma and we found a, a home in the construction sector. So we're currently in the middle of building out one of our next generation prototypes, which is currently uh, resting underneath the, that gray mass over my shoulder, which I think is one of my shirts or whatever, which is one of my coats that I have draped over it just for security's sake, which is even, uh, which thanks to this little kerfuffle with the zoom is even more blurred out. So small miracles, I guess, but we've already, uh, conducted a number of bench scale prototype tests. I think we're on uh, version 4.0 now of our prototyping. And we've proven out that you can indeed uh, make, basically turn rock from dirt. So if you can see this, okay. Mm -hmm. This little puck that I'm holding right here, which looks like a hunk of granite, was made from some just standard uh, aggregate sand you can get from Home Depot. Uh, this was, we made this initially by accident, uh, tail end of 2017, if memory serves. Uh, we ended up spending the next three, four months just trying to figure out what the heck we actually did and ended up refining our prototyping. And now we're at, we're at a point where we can make these little uh, sample materials all live long day. Uh, and we've tested it with every form of dirt you can throw at it from uh, the crappy soil that anyone in LA County is quite familiar with uh, to decompose granite that we pulled out of our own backyard, to uh, ordinary play sand, uh, up to and including uh, Martian soil simulants, which you cannot see at all because of the, <laughs> the stupid air that we're getting here on the Zoom feed. Uh, so we've tested everything we can throw at it. The only stuff that does not make any kind of solid material at all is uh, organic soils, so uh, potting soil, topsoil, that kind of stuff which if you go more than a few feet deep, you're gonna hit uh, what's roughly the same stuff anywhere on the planet and you can be able to build with that. So right now we're building out a prototype that would be able to start building the first bricks that would allow us to, to be able to make uh, facing stones and eventually support structures and make it possible to be able to build an entire home completely on site. So the general idea is you'd take one of these things out into the field and you'd be able to make all the building material need, you'd need essentially for free in Southern California, uh, when we're at, you know, peak solar power usage, you know, energy is cheaper than free down here. Anywhere else in the country, significantly less than what is currently available. I think we clocked it in to where, uh, since it's only taking energy, uh, it's roughly the equivalent of about a penny per like garden size working brick, as opposed to about, you know, 50 cents at Home Depot or any place like that. So this is a significant shift in the way we build. And it all came from uh, something that was inspired by trying to solve the problem of how you build on Mars. So this is a fantastic example of how the space sector doesn't ju just work to develop technologies to benefit itself, but also immediately benefits people here on Earth. Very cool. And, and I'd like to add um, that Redworks is going to offer as part of the bonuses and the group and the, and the bulk purchases and the bonuses um, and offer. And look, it's highly experimental and it's not yet um, we're not yet able to provide these right. bricks to you today. But but if the technology works, which, you know, you think there's a possibility, let's just say. I'm, fingers crossed. We're going to be uh, doing some more building uh, this week, and I'm hoping that the current build we have right now will be the one to produce what we're calling Brick Zero, which will be the first 3D printed brick in history made uh, from entirely indigenous materials. I mean, that um, so bonus recipients will have the opportunity to potentially get um, early um, early bricks and maybe yep. using um, some of their um, you know sending Redworks some of them their material from uh, where they live as long as it meets certain conditions. So again, really, so long as it's not topsoil, we should be uh, fine. Uh, yeah. But really amazing stuff. So when you think about you know when they talk about housing shortages. Or um, or waste. There's a lot of waste generated from um, you know typical when they're using. Well, they're cutting down timber and using concrete and a lot of other materials um, for a house. And and you look at a typically a dumpster in front of a 
any construction site and you sometimes wonder going, wow, how much, how much material is wasted? And as Rick Tumlinson alluded to earlier, when you're going to space, you, you got to reuse everything. You're in a closed, mm -hmm. deep, you know, essentially if you're in a spacecraft or going to be on a, um, whether on a Martian colony, you're probably thinking a, a closed loop ecosystem. So right, you're, you're trying to achieve what's called resource independence, which uh, the best comparison I can make to help visualize this is imagine that when uh, the settlers at Jamestown, you know, actually landed, they had to bring every building that they needed with them from England. <laughs> I mean, it never would have been, like, if that was how we were settling the new world, we would still have just a handful of tiny, barely survivable outposts along the eastern seaboard, and that's it. Would have been better for the Native Americans, but uh, in the, this is just a, to give an example of uh, how difficult it is to settle a new world when you're completely dependent on resupply from somewhere very, very far away. So we're looking at solving probably the most uh, mass heavy problem right now, which is being able to build using local sources of material. And we're partners with Made in Space and are hoping to eventually, you know, get to a point where we could do some kind of joint project and maybe stick one of these things on one of their machines and who knows, maybe build in space. But right now we're just focusing on being able to disrupt the uh, economy of Earth. <laughs> well, that's uh, not a small feat because um, what's the size of the housing the housing con residential construction market say just in the u.s have you it was about it was uh, i know worldwide it was 300 million units uh in 2018. uh i haven't seen the most up-to-date figures for the last year uh you tend to only and by because we tend to be uh, kind of a year behind whatever the most accurate data is in the construction sector it's an old industry after all but we are seeing a sizable housing shortfall. And the one of the bigger problems is starting in about 20, late 2018 or 2019, we were actually in the middle of a worldwide masonry shortage. And that has more to, than, a, and I wish I could say that was technology that was the problem. It was the supply chains themselves that was causing that issue. Uh, masonry hasn't really changed all that much in the last century or so. I think rebar was the last significant innovation that we had to, you know, to the industry's name. And as a result, these are truly ancient supply chains that are now trying to supply truly global demand. Uh, I think uh, as of 2007, China was the world's number one consumer of concrete. I think around 08, they actually were consuming more than everyone else in the world put together. Uh, they probably don't hold that claim anymore, but that's not a good thing because that me means that Indonesia, India, East Africa are all consuming I mean, huge amounts, all from roughly, you know, from a pool that has not been able to grow all that much. And having to, to rely on an international supply chain that just can't keep up with demand. So a consequence of this is, is that a lot of more rural areas, uh, not, not in like underdeveloped regions of the world, but I'm inside the United States, it's not cost effective to be able to build new homes. So the global housing shortfall is bad on you know, the coast, but it's even worse once you get into the interior. So a piece of technology like this allows you to break free from that supply chain, build completely locally and serve markets that at the moment are kind of being left out in the cold. Keegan, we got a question. Um, the question's from Pamela Hoffman and she says, what about additions in construction or renovations? Could your equipment go where other things can't? Can your equipment speed things up for this industry? I actually was talking to one architect when we first got started on all this, and we were talking about just what, uh, how big the, the unit was going to be. And uh, he was suggesting, you know, a lot of my projects are kind of in pretty remote locations, like over, you know, because they're all scenic. They're overlooking, you know, they got to be overlooking water. And so they're on top of roads that are really hard to get to. What if I helicoptered it, it in there? Would that, uh, would that work? And I said, I was just thinking you could stick it on the back of a pickup truck and, you know, drive it up there because it's only going to have a footprint of around, you know, six feet by six feet. So it absolutely can speed things up because you are able to immediately put something in the field. You're able to actually reduce your overall waste. Uh, a big challenge in California in particular is uh, dirt removal, which can set back projects uh, significantly. I wish we had Franz Lee, a mutual friend of ours, an architect on here, because he had some horror stories for just how long a project can be delayed. 
uh, months, if not years, and two million bucks for a couple of sites that he was willing to mention, uh, just to get the dirt off-site and properly disposed of. With this, you can turn a waste product into part of your building material. If you're doing a remodel, you can use excavated material either found on site or sourced nearby uh, to be able to make facing stones and other decorative features, landscape features, that kind of thing. It really is uh, a, a scenario agnostic solution, I guess is the really fancy way to say it. In other words, good for all seasons. Awesome. Well, Keegan, thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to, we'll make sure to share um, about the, the URL for um, Redworks, which is redworks3d.com. And, uh, and then Keegan's also my co-host with Brave New Space, the podcast. And we'll bring our next guest on. So Keegan, thanks so much. And thank you for Redworks for, uh, for, for participating in the book launch. No problem. Thanks for having me on, Robert. Thanks, Keegan. Next up, we've got, let's see, we got Van. I think Van is in there. I'm going to bring up um, the co-founder of Starburst Accelerator, but they're also ventures and consulting. They've um, got their um, literally hands in places all over the planet, which is awesome. Because I remember when they were just first starting, essentially, I think, in Los Angeles. Now I'm constantly saying, like, oh, we're opening a new office here. They're like, man, where are you guys, where are you guys not? So it's going to be like... Uh, do you guys have an outpost in in Africa yet? No, no, but Not we do yet. monitor the marketplace from from our other locations. Yeah. Cool. Welcome, Van. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Robert. Happy to be here, um, and congratulations on on publishing your new book. So happy to be a part of this, and and help. thank you. Really appreciate somebody out there is kind of capturing uh, the incredible time that we're all living in. So thank you. Oh, you're well. You're welcome. We are definitely in an, an extraordinary time, and I had who would have ever thought 2020 would have gone like this. And it's just, it's, it's definitely memorable. But I mean, I couldn't have predicted it. <laughs> yeah, well times. So, uh, yeah, tell me how you'd like me to kind of um, well, share any opinions or. Well, happy to well there's have some. I, I think there's there's probably people who do not know what you're doing, what Starburst is kind of their, their mission and, and, and what their objective is. And, and in some ways, it's as far as I knew it initially was a little broader than just space because it was truly inc including both, I'll say aviation and space and classical aerospace, I don't know, traditional aerospace. Um, and, but there's a lot, there's a lot you guys are doing a lot of nuance and there's really a, so much care i love when you, when when one participates in one of your um larger events not necessarily public events but where you ask the um, investors in the audience and other stakeholders to provide live feedback um to some of the presenting entrepreneurs you work with and, and you, you get this really both granular data i get the I guess the entrepreneurs are getting both granular and they're getting like the really big picture of like oh god they they hate this part of the pitch or whatever <laughs> or love this part of the pitch i'll keep it more positive so i'd love to hear more about like starburst and, and just talk, you know share with us about uh, the starburst uh, journey thank you thank you robert uh so as you mentioned starburst accelerator uh or starburst aerospace is essentially uh, incubating and accelerating uh, and investing in supporting early stage entrepreneurs and startups at a pre-seed stage uh, all the way through to their A round of fundraising. Uh, what that translates to is any, um, any kind of engineers or, or talented business people that really wanna think about how they can uh, start a business and and scale their business in the in the space industry, uh, as well as broader aerospace industry, um, has struggled to kind of navigate the complexities of how to actually legitimize yourself in the marketplace. And we see uh, significant value in helping those early stage founders and companies navigate the, the nuances of what it means to to compete and to grow in, in the space industry. So. Uh, thanks to our tech tycoons, thanks to uh, the, the people that you highlight um, that are really lowering the barriers to entry for uh, a new landscape of market players. Um, we want to continue to, to um, 
uh, curate and support who these new uh, new businesses are and, and legitimize them as true market contenders. The traditional aerospace industry has has long been um, uh, call it an oligopoly uh, of major major corporations that have uh, that have secured significant government contracts uh, either through monopoly service provisions or through a, a, a sort of a, a various mix of, uh, of market opportunities. And I think in the last decade, we've really seen that come to fruition. Uh, even though companies like SpaceX are, are almost 18 years old, we consider the, the launch of Falcon 1 uh, and the landing of, of the boosters uh, five years ago as the, the real signal that there is a sort of a new marketplace. And so, who are all these new market, these new companies that are now coming behind them that are scaling just as fast? Uh, SpaceX is now with Starlink on on the horizon, uh, estimated to be worth almost forty plus billion dollars in the market, um, and now we have the speed of agility of new companies that are, are less than three years old that are estimated to be worth almost seven hundred million dollars. So, how do you keep up with where these new companies are coming from? Um, what else? What other new compelling capabilities? Are they offering and uh, we uh, even though we're there to support these early stage entrepreneurs we get paid for and sponsored uh, by most of the industry primes and government agencies as you mentioned um, we're now active in 10 countries uh, and we are uh, scouting on average two to three thousand early stage companies per year uh, and and by receiving the criteria and needs of our corporate clients, whether they're uh, the major OEMs, uh, operators in space, or government agencies uh, like the Air Force and Space Force, not just in the US, but in other countries. We recently announced our Allied Defense Accelerator with International Space Pitch Day, uh, this uh, happening this November. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, please get in touch. But again, a, a powerful sign of the times that uh, there is a new uh, landscape of players, and we are here to uh, minimize the friction and continue to um, uh, reinforce the message that that there is a new game in town, uh, and and anything we can do to offer the right tools to support these businesses and uh, help them scale is what we're here to do. So thank you. Do Do you find that with any of the um, corporate sponsors, incumbents, do are they recognizing that they need to change or at least acquire companies or that, you know, I, you know, I don't know if there's, I don't know if like Boeing survive, I'll just, I'm just going to say pick on Boeing for a moment. It's just an example, you know, their survival state, but do they, do they, do they really sense an existential threat by these upstarts or do they just sort of recognize saying, okay, we've rested on our laurels for so long because like the, con the way the government contracts traditionally have been done for many years were good. And if you were in that position, you would enjoy it. But now their um, times have changed. Indeed, indeed. And look, we've been through this cycle before. In the late 90s, very many of these major enterprises had venture capital arms, corporate venturing is nothing new. Uh, Boeing and many others have um, reinstituted a lot of those best practices and some of them as successful as they were like GE had to wind them down um, because of issues with the larger enterprise. And, and so uh, I think in the last couple of years in particular, we've seen a significant ramp up of corporate venturing in our sector, looking at um, uh, the, the, the sort of the new economy that continues to carve out. So I, I would say, yes, we've, we've seen a large, and not just having a dedicated venture arm, but also making venture like early stage investments in off the balance sheet. So just really looking at the mechanics of the financials behind these large enterprises. The reality is many of them want to shift their interest to an earlier stage and say, if we can learn to play together with such a, not to interfere with that company's um, uh, progress and their, their potential, but to say, we want to see you succeed. And when you get to a successful uh, growth position, do you become a true market partner, uh, a, a, a sort of a, an acquisition type, uh, an M&A type activity? Uh, and so 
the the pipeline of where we can partner and is is only increasing and i wouldn't call them threatened i think you're dealing with a completely different uh, economic dynamic and so i would argue yes uh, many of them are excited and many of them have repositioned how i think what's changed is how real thanks to the the new players like a spacex uh like like um rocket lab and many others they're now investing in these businesses and they want to partner with them. So for them, they see it as a growth opportunity rather than a, a retreating opportunity. Understood. Thank you for clarifying that. And what would you, what do you sort of share with entrepreneurs? I'm sure you, you get the questions. What is, what is the single thing or single couple things that entrepreneurs can sort of try to do um, when they you know, many times they're science and engineering focused yeah. but they want to do a startup, you know, and, right? And that's kind of like, they're like, we want to do a startup. We have this cool thing. It's like a science project right now. What's, exactly. what's the next steps? What are the next steps? That is essentially, you, you, you cover, you, that's a good way to sum it up. Uh, the reality is most of the R&D budgets of these major enterprises has been subsidized through government contracts and government grants. And so when you get a spin out from a lab, when you get a, a startup saying we can achieve this kind of technology ramp up, we are at this level of technology maturity. Um, our advice is what we're seeing is kind of a shift of this outsourcing of R&D or a shared, a shared interest of not just thinking, it as a, of a, thinking of it as a financial play, but in this new mode of what we call open innovation is becoming a best practice that's adopted by main, many, many across the industry is how can you collaborate with a startup to achieve a new proof of concept together? And so how can you, how can everyone be good at what they're good at, get to a new TRL or a, a sort of a proof of concept in, in, in agreeing if you're good at this and you have the technical acumen in your startup to achieve that, what if, I mean, sometimes we've seen a lot of the primes saying we have a, a, a sort of a defense classified program that can achieve that technology, but we can't take it into the commercial marketplace because we're burdened with these programs, what if we reverse license it to you and let you run with it commercially and then give us some kind of favorability to revisit this at a later point to spin it back in? So there's a, there's a lot of creativity and open innovation right now between the, the new and emerging companies as well as the sort of the established players who are getting more creative with how they want to see that technology coming into the commercial marketplace faster. And that's why I think even now the government and the defense um, parts uh, especially in the defense and space side, Space Force in particular, is getting much more creative in saying, we don't want to just depend on our OEMs doing that R&D, but even as they look at open innovation more, who are these new commercial players and how can we invite these non-traditional companies to help us achieve our mission capabilities in new ways? So this isn't just about a startup achieving investment readiness. This isn't just about um, a non-traditional company helping a government program achieve SBIR and technology adoption readiness in a different way. Uh, now it's about how do you actually allow U.S. Space Force to do work with an Australian startup, with a with an Estonian cyber startup, and and so the sort of readiness of international companies supporting U.S. defense space needs is also changing. And those barriers to entry are significantly lowered, and so we're talking hundreds of deals being made with thousands of companies popping up, and so. How do you find the congruency of security risk in auditing these businesses that want to participate in this new domain uh, in, in, as space continues to champion where these new capabilities are coming from? So it's a really exciting time for the sector. Thank you. What, what, are, what, are, the, what are some of the applications or it could be infrastructure applications you personally right now, like right now, snapshot September, 2020, that you're like, this is cool because these things kind of shift for people, you know? Yeah. I think people get really confused around, am I developing a launch system or a satellite constellation? I, you, look, the reality is there is a, an infrastructure being created thanks to the launch providers, thanks to the satellite providers. The new bottleneck for us is the ground segment. How do you get that data back to the ground? How do you leverage the efficiencies you're seeing in traditional uh, information technology around analytics, edge computing, artificial intelligence and machine learning, how are all these different efficiencies and features in traditional IT and cyber 
starting to um, transfer into the space environment. So I don't want any innovator to think they can't operate in the space domain. It's as you continue to leverage your image recognition system for search capability, how does that in practice work in geospatial imagery and how can we leverage your analytics into a, a coding environment, uh, a low code, no code type uh, um, activities. And so there's all these are happening in the, in, in the NASA environment, in the, uh, in, the, in the Space Force environment. And so I'm very excited about how can traditional or bleeding edge technology innovators actually treat space as a, a, an environment that they have proven a, worse, a use case that they can then take back and sell to other markets like healthcare, uh, automotive, uh, IoT, you name it. And so I wanna basically remind everyone that as long as you're creating some kind of capability, the space environment is ready to, to trial that and, and let you continue to scale into other markets. Thank you. Um, we're just about the last minute or so, so we'll we'll po post some um, some of the links. I think it's starburst.arrow. Is that that's starburst.arrow? And look, we have different programs to support entrepreneurs uh, at different stages. If you're if you're looking at manufacturing capabilities, if you're looking at cyber capabilities, um, my advice is don't just give up that much equity. You really have to educate yourself in terms of what are the programs that are out there. What's the best fit for the what stage of maturity my business is at, um, and really uh, browse all the thousands of different types of incubators and accelerators. We just released another program that takes no equity, but we're here to make sure you're able to succeed and scale. You know, as a reminder, we're paid for by most of the government agencies and industry players to go and uh, make sure that you're not giving up your secret sauce. You're not. Um, uh, participating in any just cookie cutter type program that you're actually finding the best fit program for to scale in the marketplace. And we're here to help you find that. So please get in touch with me or my team. I'm on LinkedIn as well, but starburst.arrow, uh, contact at starburst.arrow and um, yeah, here to help. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. So again, that was Van Espabodi, uh, the co-founder of Starburst Accelerator Ventures Consulting. Thank you so much, Van, for joining us today and participating in the book. Van's included in the book. He's a contributor. He, uh, We had some nice chats um, when uh, I was writing the book. So thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Robert. Cheers. Bye, Van. All the best. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so... Next, we got, uh, let's just see here. Um, we got Ben. Let's just see if I can find, whoop, hold one second. Ben Haldeman, co-founder of LifeShip. There's Ben. Hey, Ben. Let's hey, see. Robert. Okay, how can we, I gotta rearrange this a little bit. Okay. Welcome, Ben. So everyone, we have uh, Ben Haldeman of LifeShip and Ben and I have met, I think, connected initially through um, uh, the Arc Mission Foundation. Um, and Ben has got this, um, he's been wor working on taking, essentially, bringing life to space. And he'll share more about how he's doing that. Um, I'm excited that I've got my DNA, to, uh, you know, sent in. It's going to be going on a, on a future mission. And he's participating as a uh, one of the bonus launch partner, book launch book bonus launch partner uh, today. So Ben, welcome. Thanks, Robert. Excited to be here. And, yeah. Uh, thanks for the early copy of your book. I, I really, I really did love it. Like I really, <laughs> really feel it's a great overview of the nuances and insights of, of this new space market. And um, yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting time in space. It is. So, Ben, you were, um, you had been previously, it was interesting um, that the previous speaker, Van, was talking about the bottleneck in um, ground segments, which is a little bit maybe deep in the weeds, maybe for some who maybe don't know what that is, but maybe you, you were deeply involved with that with um, one of your previous positions. Maybe you could share a little further about like, you know, building ground stations and, uh, and, and your work around that and then, you know, sharing about what you're doing with LifeShip. So before, before I started LifeShip, I was at Planet Labs for, for five years. I was one of the early engineers there. Um, and we, yeah, we, we, I essentially joined and we still felt like we were building satellites in the garage. And 
we were building our own ground stations and I designed the whole camera system on the satellites. And uh, we launched over 300 satellites while I was there to image the whole Earth every day. And it really was this, uh, the whole path of agile aerospace. We were discovering what agile aerospace meant. And, and it meant like figuring out how to get just data down from little satellites, figuring out how to get high bandwidth data down over, over ground stations, figuring out how to get on lots of launches rapidly. And over the course of time I was there, we were on, I think, like 18 different launches, um, including 88 satellites on one launch. And, and so really we just build up the, uh, yeah, build up the capabilities over time to, to take huge amounts of imagery and get it all down and, uh, and have daily imagery of the whole planet. And so I did that. Before that, I built big telescopes on, on mountaintops around the world. So that, that was kind of like ground stations as well, in, in a way. And, and what was, what's, how, did, how did you come to thinking about bringing life to space? And you'll, you'll share more. What, what, was the, yeah, what was the catalyst for that with LifeShip? Yeah, I had, so I, I had worked on telescopes to look for other planets. Um, around other star systems. I worked in grad school, I worked on instruments to go to Mars to look for signs of life on Mars. Um, and so this, the looking for life and the existence of life out there was, has been on my mind. And then, and then Planet Labs really brought me around to how space can be used to help Earth. And, and I was down in the rainforest after planet and in Central America. Um, and was on a long hike in the rainforest and kind of came up with the, the insight that uh, that part of humanity's role here is is to help both steward life here and take care of biodiversity in life, but then also uh, save copies outward and, and help life life expand outward. Um, and so through that came came the concept to back up Earth's DNA and start sending this outward so that we, we have uh, backups around around the solar system and beyond. So as we, I mean, maybe this is thinking too far out, but are you thinking besides the backup, could we one day have essentially like a little, it's not a garden, maybe a, almost, it's like I'm thinking like a lunar garden. It's like this place where we have a little bits of earth on other celestial bodies and maybe one day we'll have the technology to, you know, you know, recreate things, whether it's, you know, plant life or animal life. What, what sort of things are you kind of envisioning in, in you know, in, in, at some point? Um, you, so cause you use, I guess it's use cases, you know, besides, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like, number one is the first offer of biobank backup. Like there's, there's the famous biobank in, in Norway in Svalbard, which is all plant seeds mm -hmm. and designed to last thousands of years to back up uh, Earth's food supply. But we can already uh, bring back life from DNA. And so it seems to make sense to save more than just plants and to, to save a copy of Earth somewhere else because all of it's here. So uh, first is a backup. Um, next is when humanity or when we send send spaceships to other stars or we send something outwards uh we'll probably want to send with it the code of earth and and the code of humanity and um so that there's diversity and and so that we we have all the species represented that we want to take with us and um so that's that's part of the longer view is okay eventually humanity will leave leave the solar system in some way and they'll take the genetic code of earth with them in in hopes of recreating it somewhere thank you on your first mission or in the first few missions have you ever thought about taking any dinosaur dna <laughs> we, uh, jurassic park is still science fiction uh we don't have any dinosaur dna yet okay uh, no all dinosaur. this dna we found is 1.7 million years it's probably gets asked, so I had to ask it. So, you know, it's out there in the public record. So but we it, do have the full woolly mammoth DNA, Neanderthal DNA, 
saber-toothed tiger DNA. So uh, humanity has, and science has, brought back the full genetic code of a number of extinct species. And and I noticed you've got pets included on like a part of your um, part of your offerings. It's not just uh, Homo sapiens you're taking you're taking along, so people can send along their pet DNA. Is uh, for those who want to um, part add that to it. Is it difficult to gather the um, the the DNA for um, the pet portion of life ship? <laughs> uh, it, it's a, it's a little swab for your dog. Ah. Depends how cooperative your pet is. Uh, got it okay but but yeah it's really there, there's a big mission behind this and there's there's something that we really want to do but it's also a way to connect people to space and a way to connect people to their families and each other and and you'll look up at the moon and remember whatever you put up there and get to wonder about what will happen with it so, so yeah so so ben is on a mission that uh, life ship will be participating on a mission in 2021 to go to the moon so um, if one wants to have a little bit of themselves and or their pet, they can participate by, you know, very easily providing a little DNA and you get to have your, some of yourself go to the moon in, in as soon as potentially 2021. Um, I think we have, uh, let's just see, somebody, I think we have, there's some, some, some chats. Um, oh, this is good. How long does, uh, this is from Pamela again. How long does DNA last on, on a swap? Maybe she meant swab, but I'll say on a, I think she maybe mentioned swab. Yeah. Um, there's, so scientists find old manuscripts, like old copies of the Bible or like thousand year old texts that, that they're able to pull, pull the full genetic code out of. So DNA can last a long time if it's, if it's dried and, and uh, stored, stored properly. So on a swab, it can last for a long time. It's, yeah. yeah. What, uh, how we actually preserve it is we, the thing that breaks down DNA the most is, 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 uh, is water. And so if you, uh, if you centrifuge it and compact it and break the DNA, uh, lice the cells so the DNA comes out, and then you uh, dry it essentially. So it's just the dried powder of DNA then then that can last for, for many thousands of years. And we embed that in a polymer called artificial amber. And then it goes inside the ARC mission payload to the moon. So yeah, if you want to learn more about that, you know, go to lifeship.com. And Lifeship's actually participating as one of the bonus partners for the book launch. So that's at spaceisopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses is the commercial port at part of the, the interview which I have to do though, to honor all of everyone's efforts and work and so appreciative of, of, of Ben and the other generous partners who've been participating and the other co-mission partner, which is ARC Mission Foundation, which is a really fantastic group, shamelessly I'm part of it, but, uh, but it's arcmission.org um, doing work to essentially work on backing up earth civilization. And so it's important that we have um, partners like uh, Ben and Lifeship who are taking the, the biological side and, 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 and helping preserve it in meaningful long-term ways. And, and we're thinking about things in terms of millions of years, not just where, you know, the, the, the vault that Ben, you've talked about in, in Norway, um, Norway, right? Norway, you know, thousand years and like, okay, that's nice. But like, you know, underground stuff, you could still have flooding. You could still potentially have a fire. You know, there's all, uh, there's, there's, uh, we, we need to have other protection mechanisms in place that are much more long-term off planet. It's just seems, it seems pretty obvious, but, um, but, you know, that's kind of our, uh, part of our mission is to make this, uh, make this idea and this initiative more commonplace and not just like, wow, that's just a, a crazy stunt. No, it's not just about stunt. We're really trying to, um, you know, back up, um, you know, civilization, life off earth for really long periods of time. Um, so just as, uh, let me just see here. I'm trying to I produce Okay, so so Pamela, it sounds like she wants to maybe she wants to uh, add this to one of her next books. Very, uh, 
she might sneak, I get, oh, I think, so Pamela, who we'll be speaking with a little later, um, she, she writes, a, a, has a great, very compact space book. Uh, she's known as the Everyday Spacer. And uh, she wants to add, I think, life ship as probably an activity that regular people can get involved with. And this is a great example, um, referring back to earlier to Rick Tumlinson's talk about um, cult space consumerism or direct to consumer, business to consumer, that LifeShip is really a, um, a great way that it's articulating, manifesting a product today available, relatively low cost and affordable to you know, participate in the space activity in a cool one where some of you gets to actually go to space. I mean, that's, that's incredible. And, um, and I, I, oh, and I see, oh, Ben, oh, awesome. So it's yeah. price right now it's priced around, it's priced at $99 to go to the moon. And then we have a, a $59 to go into orbit. Uh, so yeah, we're really trying to make this accessible to people and, and, and get people engaged in space in a way that, that few could before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, I mean, it's really kind of, I, I mean, at first I was thinking, is that, pro is that price too cheap? I mean, can't we do this? No, it's affordable under a hundred bucks. I mean, think of what people spend on whatever they spend a hundred bucks on these days. <laughs> so um, yeah, very affordable way to have a direct, a, a pretty direct space experience where some of you is getting to go to space. Um, Starbucks, yes. Yeah, it's like, um, yeah, it's it's an affordable adult indulgence. Um, well, Ben, thank you very much for for participating as a as a launch partner today, and uh, appreciate your friendship and your um, mutual support on our on our on our journey. And wish you wish you well. Agreed. Thanks for having me, Robert. Excited right. excited for your book. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Okay, so next we're gonna have a, a recording. I'm gonna share my screen again. Let's see if I can do this here. Okay, hold one moment, people. Let's just see, get this uh, nifty hold one moment. Next, we're going to have Dr. Armin Ellis of the Exploration Institute. Hi, everyone. This is Robert. Okay, just one second. I'm going to start over. Essentially, here we go. Jacobson, and I'm here now with my very good and very close friend and colleague, Dr. Armin Ellis from the Exploration Institute. Armin was not able to join us live today, so we pre-recorded this video, but he was super excited about the, the launch and we're just recording this so that we can, you know, bring it to you uh, today on the book launch. Or, so Armin, how are you doing today and welcome. Oh, hi, Robert. I'm doing great. Hello, everyone listening. Uh, Robert, I'm so excited that you're finally launching your book. You've been working so hard on this book for many years. It's so exciting to see this moment uh, of your launch right now. Thank you. I feel a little bit like uh, Moses coming, uh, from, uh, coming from the top <laughs> of the mountain, you know, with like the, uh, the Ten Commandments or something. Not that the, my, my book was a word from God or something, like, but I spent so much time and energy into creating this really, um, really fun and exciting work. And there were so many great contributors and people that I was able to interview. And we had some, uh, some many, uh, numerous, con too, too many conversations to, to list um, regarding, um, you know, the, the creation of this book. So, Armin, I want to first thank you for your love, your support, your friendship and camaraderie through the years, and in particular, your, um, your support. You've, you've, you've also been a, a sponsor for some different endeavors of mine. So I want to thank you and Exploration Institute today. Uh, absolutely. Uh, if it's a privilege and an honor uh, because I think you've put together a very high quality book. You've really interviewed everyone. Um, so many people that, uh, you know, you and I have known and people through our networks and they, our extended networks. It's just so exciting that you were able to really get to anyone that you wanted to sort of interview in, in all of this and really be able to compile a 
uh, past, present, and future all in one book. So again, I congratulate you. I think you've created a book that's so worth reading. Thank you, Armin. So let's go a little, so we can share with the audience a little bit about our origin story. We actually met at a space conference <laughs> uh, right. in tech, in the great state of Texas um, many years ago. We're not going to disclose any more specifics, but I'll say it was in Texas at a conference and, and uh, a few detectives could maybe figure that out, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. And we really hit it off and it turned out that, you know, you had just finished your, um, your uh, doctoral degree and earned a PhD at Dartmouth College and you were in the process of uh, interviewing out west and we uh, after the conference we connected there and it really seemed to help uh, you know establish our relationship even you no know, I don't think you knew you were you were going to be moving out west just yet but I think we both knew that we were going to become uh, lo longtime friends yeah definitely yes so that was uh, before I'd even finished the PhD so it was n near the end and um, yeah I I'd wanted to work at JPL since I was a kid so JPL was definitely one of those places that, uh, that was high on my list. So, so Armin, before you got to JPL, which for those who may not know, it's part of NASA. It's the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the uh, area just outside of Los Angeles in, Pas in the Pasadena, Altadena area of California. Um, tell me about that. You know, you were an entrepreneur, actually, before you went back to graduate school. And you had a kind of an interesting, uh, interesting entrepreneurial journey. Um, can you give us just a little brief recap about that? It might be, it, it, it's, it's kind of an un unexpected twist. Yeah, you know, it's actually funny because I didn't intend to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I just wanted to do space stuff. Um, and uh, I was uh, sort of uh, doing an internship, a space engineering internship at a company in the UK that was recently acquired by uh, what was then SpaceDev, now uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation. And um, this was in the very early days. And Jim Benson, uh, for those who remember, uh, was one of the early pioneers of, um, uh, sort of commercial thinking around space. And uh, he had purchased this company. And um, while I was a, an intern, an engineering intern, I managed to spend a little bit of time there and try to understand what Jim Benson was all about. And, it, and he was so inspiring. And to see him actually um, you know, in business and uh, thinking about the grander vision of asteroid mining and all of these things was really inspiring. So that got me thinking about space as a business uh, career for myself as well. And uh, but of course, you know, being in the UK is pretty difficult, uh, or at least it was at the time, because both entrepreneurship was um, not so much mainstream and also space was particularly difficult. So uh, I knew that uh, I had to come to the US. So along the way, I started a company and, and so on, but uh, managed to get to the US and do my PhD and originally on, you know, some uh, uh, sounding rockets and uh, laser physics and that kind of thing. And then um, uh, ended up working at JPL, which was absolutely mind blowing and cool, uh, initially on the Mars rovers and then some earth science activities. And yeah, just had a fantastic time. I was there for about a decade. You know, what's really interesting about all of this is that uh, the more we can do commercially, the more we can achieve also uh, from a science point of view and just have a deeper awareness of what's going on with uh, the universe around us, whether it's earth sciences or whether it's, um, you know, astronomy uh, missions or planetary missions. The whole thing is... Uh, kind of like a one hand washes the other sort of activity. I love also how you've been able to capture this in your book because you do talk about um, sort of the development of capabilities and the natural progression for a person who's looking at it primarily from applications in the sciences is, hey, you know, I can have a, uh, a bigger telescope or I can have a more frequent access to a region uh, of the atmosphere or um, the region that I can sample with um, constellations almost constantly and, uh, you know, planetary probes and so on. So I think that they all go together very nicely. And the way that my career has kind of panned out is that uh, I happen to sort of understand one side as well as the other side, which really does help. 
And so Armin, and then as you eventually, um, you, sp you know, spending a time, a, a decade at JPL, I, can you just share a little bit about some of the incredible benefits that you see, that you saw being generated from, you know, JP, you know, what the JPL's work and how it's sort of essentially benefiting humanity? Because some people just say, well, Mars rover is great, but how, do, you know, how does it benefit us here on Earth? That's a fair question. You know, so the first thing to note is that actually all of the NASA centers are extremely professional and uh, very uh, mission driven. Now, I don't want to go into the politics of uh, how a mission is selected and how certain things go forward and other things don't. But I can tell you that the professionalism in NASA is unbelievable. Um, People don't go to NASA typically by accident, right? I mean, there's going to be um, a lot of people who are, you know, very uh, interested in seeing a brighter future in space for all of us. Because of that, the technologies that come out of it are quite extraordinary as well, because we're really pushing ourselves and uh, really trying to sort of figure out how to do something that wasn't um, done before and no one was able to... Uh, sort of achieve with uh, the existing engineering skills. So from that side alone, just being able to push the boundaries of technology, NASA is a national asset, and I would even argue that it's an international asset. But to speak specifically to the uh, uh, spin-offs, there's really two uh, areas that I can think of. One is the technologies and the spin-out of the technologies. It's tremendous. When, whether you're looking at um, commercial goods or software or services, NASA is really uh, pioneering a lot of these developments and one of their missions is actually to commercialize it. And I think they're doing a fantastic job in that area. The other area is uh, the amount of data that's being gathered and the quality of the data that's um, being generated and then released to the broader public. Um, again, another part of the uh, mission that NASA has is to be able to release publicly funded data gathering so that we can all become beneficiaries of it. You know, whether it's uh, something to do with um, the planets or whether it's to do with some of these amazing uh, images or to do with uh, the earth, you know, NASA's mission of releasing this data, I think is also another uh, important one that a lot of the times uh, people forget. Thank you. So Armin, after you, you finished your tenure at JPL and you went off and you, and you created Exploration Institute, which has a, a sort of a, a number of threads I would describe, what is your, what is, how, how can you express to the public and to the listeners today about this emerging movement, this, econ it's, this it's, it's, it's an economic movement, it's a social movement, um, it's, it's, maybe it's a space revolution. There's a lot of different words to describe it, but how that, how people who are maybe either running businesses, they're analysts, how maybe they could either kind of participate or they should just start thinking about like, what is my space strategy? Is, is it, is it a worthwhile question to start thinking about, you know, and let's go back to the nineties when people sort of knew about the internet, uh, or, or, you know, the, the mainstream public and said, Oh, you've got a website. That's kind of neat. What do you do with it? Will people will be will soon become maybe not soon, but will there be a time in our lives when having a, you know a space strategy is a very practical and necessary and maybe a, a useful useful um, tool? I think the answer to that is uh, that um, we've got to start to look at space slightly differently than how we have been, right? So. Space, yes, it is a domain. That's quite true. Um, it's the thing above the atmosphere, right? Yep, okay, fair enough. Um, but it's so much more than that too. Um, space is also in an, an enabler of uh, specific um, uh, measurements, capabilities, uh, uh, manufacturing environments, et cetera. You know? So you it could be looked at as a domain. It could also be looked at as um, you know, a broad landscape of uh, uh, technological abilities. And then there's other ways to look at it as well. 
it's very exciting, right? So it's somewhere that uh, has had, you know, it's a, it's a domain that's had a lot of allure to it. So it could be used for, you know, advertising and so on. You've captured that part of it also in your book. Um, and it's somewhere that you can um, kind of inspire people differently. Um, so it's not one thing. That's kind of what I'm trying to get to. Uh, and it could ha have a different meaning to a different person. Um, that's why it's worth thinking about it and kind of personalizing space to the specific needs of a business or an individual or a government, uh, et cetera. That was great. Thank you very much. Well, I want to be uh, uh, honor Armin's time today. And we have many guests here on the uh, Spaces Open for Business book launch. And I want to thank my dear friend and guest today, Dr. Armin Ellis, uh, Chief Executive Officer and Head and Founder of the Exploration Institute, for sharing a little bit of uh, insight today. Um, thank you, Armin, for, for being with us in safe, safe travels. Thank you so much, Robert, and uh, all your listeners. I'm so excited for uh, your book and the launch. I think it's going to really make a big impact on how we understand uh, this incredible industry. Thanks again, Robert. Thank you. Okay, let's just see. Gotta... All right. Okay, friends, I am back. Let's just see what I had missed. Okay, so we're on time. Um, so our next guest is Pamela Hoffman of Everyday Spacer, one of our uh, book launch partners. Hi, Pamela. Hi, Robert. Thanks so much for inviting me to your launch. I'm so excited for you. I can't wait to see what happens. Oh, yeah. And thank you so much. You've been so kind in some of your, you know, ideas and, and, um, and recent are helping be mutually supportive. I really thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I see, I love your background here. We've got your book there too, which um, we kind of um, alluded to a little earlier that you, you know, you would love to add life ship. Um, it's a great, it's a great little book. It's kind of like this really compact book yep. that has all these both obvious and non-obvious ways to participate in space exploration. Oh, thank you for saying so. Yeah, this is a whole series and I put it up there because it's not showing up very well. You know what? You can yeah, and you can see pretty well. Um, actually, your 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 background looks great. Yeah, that's what I figured. I and, have a copy, so it exists. I can definitely say it exists. I am very excited about your book because I've been waiting for this for a very long time. It's it's kind of proof of concept. We've been involved with space for you know, fifty plus years, but it's so divorced from most people. And uh, Everyday Spacer is trying to bridge that gap. We really want to show regular folks how they can personally and directly participate in space exploration, science, and astronomy, and understand the benefits of it. I mean, this wouldn't even exist without space. Think about that. <laughs> yeah, um, and I have to say thank you very much for recently, as we are trying, as uh, my wife and I are trying to, you helped us trying to find some cool spots to see the uh, recent comet. Unfortunately, due to cloud cover and other weather conditions, we, we didn't get to see it, but we discovered a great park so uh, and a great trail. So it was worth, um, you know, sometimes it's worth getting out of your comfort zone, exploring. You, you're, you're going for one thing, but you actually discover something else. So it was it was a lot of fun. Thank you. All the uh, time, yeah. <laughs> so how, how, um, how did you, what made you think about like creating like, you know, this guide for, you know, these kind of this simple ways and personalizing, you know, the space experience. Yeah, I've been basically doing most of what I wrote about in my book since 1991. And then uh, in 2012, I started a blog and I've written over 120 articles about doing stuff yourself. And, you know, it just sort of made me think maybe I need kind of a little book that gets out there and helps people very quickly understand and, and you know gives them an idea something they can do uh, and these are things from sitting at your computer to getting out and getting yourself launched to <laughs> and, and actually like chapter 15 about pong set you can launch a pong set for free 
um, I, we call it a workshop. We really love to talk to, you know, kids and adults and, and help them understand the connection between them and what's possible out there. So, yeah, it's, what what did you think of our pre uh, the t you know two guests ago um, Ben from Life Ship? Oh, uh, I I can't wait to work with Ben because I'm writing another book. In the first book, you may have noticed the additional and the advanced uh, ideas. What's happening in the second and third book? I'm expanding on those, and so I think there's going to be a real real nice place for Ben and Life Ship in yeah. one of those books. <laughs> yeah, it comes in a great little. Um, he had a bunch of the boxes kind of behind him, but it comes in this great, beautiful little box and you get a great postcard that's like very, uh, kind of a keepsake type of postcard. And it was, you know, I did the human one. So you just, uh, you know, you, you, you follow the directions, you're swabbing in your mouth, you put in a little tube, you put it back in the box and you, you send it back to life ship. Um, and then, you know, sometime next year we'll, uh, we'll be, uh, my DNA with many others will be and their pets, presumably pets too, will be um, going to the moon, which is very cool. Um, I see a quick note here from Ken Sunshine. Oh, thanks, Ken, for writing. Um, he wrote a little while ago. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, Ken is a, 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 profes a, a professional in the space industry, and I think he's currently working with um, a, a new space satellite startup, but he was previously at Virgin and a bunch of other, lots of other companies, but thank you so much, Ken. And just kind of catching up on, um, yeah, so Pamela, I, I see some of your chats. Oh yeah, so visiting JPL. You know, I kind of wonder, and I haven't looked into this, but I've seen um, our virtual visits to JPL. Have they done anything new since the pandemic or have they have anything archived? Are you aware of anything like that? Because I'm seeing more things you see, like, you know, uh, there's a virtual visit to, um, I just went on a little, there was a great one for um, one of the, part of the Russian space program somebody had posted. And there was, a, you could really great, you could even go into some of these buildings and they had photographed it in 360 degrees and kind of wander around in there. Very cool stuff. And I wonder if NASA's done this yet since they usually do an open house, what, like once a year for two days, one or two days at, at JPL? Right. No, I haven't seen anything quite like that before. Um... But uh, I do know some folks over there. Maybe we can uh, hint at that, <laughs> get our tours in anyway. Uh, they, yeah. they, have a, they have a wonderful program, even you know, not on their days uh, of the open house. You can go yourself and uh, they take you to a few of the locations in the, in the, in the campus. So Pam, Pam, what's your favorite activity that you uh, like in the book? Like what is your personal favorite um, type of act is there one that the <laughs> i think just going outside and looking up um one of the things i i put on facebook a lot is uh you can see the space station did you know that that you know do people know that you can go outside if you figure out when and where to look on which day and see the space station passing by overhead there's Jeez. lots of stuff up there you can see actually <laughs> Have you seen, are you referring to the app? There's an app created by, um, um, uh, and his name is just blanking on me all the moment. Um, he lives in the Pasadena, California area, and okay. he's created the app. I'm, I'm thinking. Is, well, I know of two. Okay, which one? Give me the book. What are, what are both names of the apps? So, uh, so the first thing is called Spot the Station. That's a NASA thing. Okay. And I noticed they missed some of the passes over my area, at least. They kind of talk to you about the brightest ones and they can either send you an email or they will send you a text like about 12 hours before the event. And I generally set my timer and then head out whenever it's uh, happening. I'm kind of more of a night owl than an early bird. Uh, but then the other one, and I really like this site, I think it's German, it's called Heavens Above and it's loaded with all kinds of stuff, but they'll give you a whole list of what's happening over your head for 10 days worth. And they show you even the, the non-visible ones. If you uh, have a radio telescope, you can actually see the station with the, see the station with that. Um, but I usually work with the visible ones because I talk to people about it a lot. And I say, you know, hey, you can go out and look for the space station and there's people on board. 
I mean, that's the, that's like the exciting part for, you know, for a lot of folks, they think, my God, there's people on board. And there's, I remember there's up to six people generally, you know, three to six, it kind of varies between that. Uh, and they pass a lot. I mean, it goes around the earth every 90 minutes. So uh, yeah, we can see that a lot. <laughs> it's very fun. We got it. We have an answer in our chat. So Remco Timmermans, who's been um, also on, on my team with social media, and he's been, and he's uh, well known in, in the space sector for, he, he can handle, he handles like conferences and working with companies and, and independents like myself. He, and, and juggling their social media management and content. He's, he's awesome. And he says, Sunday, October 4th, will be a virtual open day at ESA Aztec in, oh. um, in uh, I can never pronounce it, is it Nordwick? Uh, I never, uh, I can never pronounce it and I'm just kind of like escaping. I'm sure I butchered it, but he posted a link. So basically at ESA's site, there is a site if you look for open, it's an online open day. And October 4th is an interesting day because that's when Sputnik flew or it was launched. And it's um, when Spaceship One won the, the uh, Ansari X Prize in 2004, October 4th. And I think there's a few other space um, related milestones celebrated. And the individual that I was thinking of is yes, thank you, Remco. It's Lee, Liam Kennedy and it's called ISS Above. Awesome. And he has basically it's a device that lights up when the ISS passes over you. And wow. I mean, it's 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 neat. And uh, so, um, yeah, Liam, if you're out there, whatever, great, worth supporting. And World, yes, World Space Week is October 4th through 10th. And that's every year, October 4th through 10th at worldspaceweek.org. And there, so now it seems like with these COVID times, Pamela, that, you know, we have all these more opportunities to, you know, there's stuff going on European Space Agency or or whatnot where, you know, they might have just had a conference that was completely closed for, or it might just be for, you had to just travel there. Now we can essentially do these things from a reasonable remote uh, internet connection. Absolutely. I have a whole list of them on my website. I've been kind of watching for the ones that I kind of come across. And it's just really exciting because it used to be a hotel a flight maybe, the gas for the car otherwise. I mean, just an expensive proposition. And now you can get your coffee in your kitchen and come out and listen and, you know, right from home. It's very cool. <laughs> it's very spaceship. Yeah, it is very spaceship. Sometimes we feel like that, like we've, we've, we've set up a couple of hydroponic plants uh, um, called Aero Garden is the brand. And I guess it was very hot during the first part of the pandemic because it took a while to, for them to arrive. They're about this big, you know, not a big footprint. We had put them on a couple of shelves. They've got LED lights and one of them were growing herbs and one were growing lettuces. And it's just when the lights come on and the really bright LED, it, it feels very like, it feels like it turns, it transforms part of our kitchen into feeling like a spaceship or a little bit futuristic. Cause sometimes cool. when you hear the autom the automatic feeder come on, it's um, I think it's got, I think it might have an internet connection and it's got timers and it's connected to my wife's phone as she just shared. <laughs> that is so cool. I love that. We even have our, our, our cat's litter box has its own like Wi-Fi. It's very high tech and it's like, probably the greatest invention for us in 2020 called the litter robot. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> it is funny. It kind of looks very 2001. Um, I don't um, So at some point, maybe my, maybe our kitten will make an appearance this afternoon <laughs> to, uh, I can introduce her to, she just had her six month birthday yesterday. Aww. So she's now a junior cat. I learned, I guess at six months, they go from being a kitten to a junior. He looks the same to me, you know. I had no idea. <laughs> I'm filled with some a few some useless trivia, but I'm feeling my 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 wife's gonna go to grab her from the other room at some point because behind the virtual walls, her office. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited too because uh, you know hearing from people like this is just a wonderful way to learn. I mean, I had no idea about Liam Kennedy and his device. Um, does he build them and send them to people when you when they order them? Is that how that works? I don't know. Maybe maybe Remco knows a, a little more. Oh, okay, I got here. I'm just gonna while we throw in a little. Aww. Space Kitty. Her name's Luna. Such a cutie. Another Luna, but I, I won't I won't necessarily because Luna's the other Luna's a minor out there. But there is another. 
Um, she's, she's just waking up, and she's probably she was asleep, and she's a little like, "What is going on?" <laughs> space kitty, come on, you got to have like an event with the space kitty. Oh yeah, go on Pinterest and look up space cats. Uh -huh. it's amazing <laughs> and funny. <laughs> so I'm gonna. So Pamela, um, what are, yeah, she, um, there's actually a cat on my shoulder, but she has the uh, predator effect going on where she'll come in and out of uh, existence. Be, oh, it's there she is. See, there's like a tail here, but you can't see the rest of her body. This is the stuff you only get in a Zoom call, big kids and adults, you know. Uh, uh, so Pamela, thank you so much for your participating in the book bonuses. <laughs> And you have uh, an interesting, you're doing like a, also, one thing I liked about your, your model, you're doing a membership program. Yes. And I encourage people to, to check it out at Everyday Spacer. Um, and you're, you know, you're constantly adding new offerings uh, around that. And it's um, quite affordable. So I would say, you know, give one for yourself or your kids. Yeah, it's going to be really fun because since 1991, I've been getting what I really want. And I have a little bit of a process. I, I'm really excited to share that with people. You know, it's it's space stuff and space business and little projects and whatever you, you might be wanting to, to accomplish for yourself, we can probably help you over there. So yeah, come on by. <laughs> well, Pamela, thank you so much. So we had, so we had Pamela Hoffman of Everyday Spacer um, joining us and she's also one of our launch partners. Thank you so much, Pamela. Sure thing, Robert. Talk to you later. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, let's see. Do we have? Uh, I'm gonna look for our next guest here. Might be a little late. So maybe we gotta. Does anybody have? Uh, let's wait to reach um, Liz. I'm gonna. Let me see if. Uh, just stand by. I'm trying to. Trying to uh, get Liz available. Elizabeth Kennick, are you there? I don't see you in um, in in space in a Zoom land. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Well, while we wait for um, for Pamela to, I mean Pamela, excuse me, Elizabeth. Well, I call Liz um, Liz Kennick, head of Teachers in Space. I'm going to uh, share my screen briefly. Let's do desktop share. And I'm gonna go to QuickTime. Let me show the book trailer again. It's, it's brief. So here we go. Space investor and entrepreneur Robert C. Jacobson is releasing his first book, Space is Open for Business to provide readers with an insightful guide to the evolving space industry. Over 100 experts, including industry leaders and investors, share their insights into the economics and strategies for leading the trillion dollar race to commercialize space. Jacobson has spent over a decade working and investing in private space flight and provides a comprehensive overview of this transformative industry. This book allows everyone to understand the integral role space plays in our lives and how it will continue to transform our world. that one in again let's just see um where is elizabeth okay can't find elizabeth we might have to uh move to our 
next. Let's just see here. We have, um, supposed to have Liz, can't find Liz. And my next guest, my next two guests, I don't think can be here till a little later. So let me just think here. Let me just, uh, look, maybe we have another video to show. So I'm going to, uh, quickly jump in here to my little, my little box, my little folder here. Okay, I'm going to show uh, a video right now. We're going to uh, please stand by. Let's see here. Okay, we're next going to have Leandro Tob. Hi, this is Robert Jacobson. I'm here with my good friend, Leandro Tao. And Leandro, welcome to the virtual book launch party of Spaces Open for Business. Thank you so much, Robert. Congratulations about the, the launch of the book. Guys, I have the honor to already have read the book of Robert. It's an amazing book. Uh, Great experience. I, I, I've been learning a lot reading your book. It's full of great insights. Uh, I am discovering a, a lot of industries uh, related to the space industry. It's, it's, it's a very recommended book for everyone. So, Leandro, you have a pretty fascinating background between, uh, you know, uh, um, an author, actor, filmmaker, working in the financial industry. <laughs> Um, later, some of your spiritual work. Um, yeah, can you, can you share a little, share with our audience a little bit about your background and how you're going. And, and, and Landers participating in the uh, the space bonus, the book space rush book bonuses that are part of um, the bonuses we're offering. Thank you, Robert. Uh, first of all, it's a it's a big honor to to participate in the in the bonuses and help everyone to get your books and see you in the webinars, in the life strategies and, and with the book. To introduce myself for everyone, uh, I study economics. I used to work in the stock market, in private banking, in, in strategies for global portfolios, in Mary Lynch and in a hedge fund. Um, I like a lot arts, I like a lot films, I like a lot uh, studying very much and writing and uh, because of my work in the stock market I start writing for a newspaper in Dubai and I like to put in my editorial uh, writing of the world economy some ideas I was learning by studying in that moment I was studying with shamans and nana yogis and that part grew my attention it took my attention and I published one book it went pretty well a homemade wisdom with a nana yogi and I started a, a journey as a writer um, thanks of my writing, I had the the introduction of Alejandro Jodorowsky. Maybe some of you guys know him. He's a very known, uh, very interesting filmmaker and an artist. And he he invited me to act in his film Endless Poetry. So I act in his film. We present the film in Cannes Film Festival. It was a very interesting experience also. And I've been around. I write books. I give talks. I share what I learn. I am a Jewish guy who study a lot of Torah. I, I, I find in the Torah a lot of knowledge. Actually, I find the knowledge there. And 
the objective here in the bonuses uh, for Robert is to give you guys a lot of value, a lot of tools. In the conference is in the conference for strategies to build a healthy life on Earth and in the sky. I want to give you tools based of, on what I study until now to think in a different way, to organize the knowledge in a different way, to organize our breathing, to or organize our daily habits, and to build a healthy life here and also in the sky with the idea of what if in a near future we have the opportunity to spend a holiday for maybe some months or maybe some years how are we going to build a healthy life in a very specific environment as the sky that is one of the bonuses we are offering to you the other one is a life coach 101 where i want to listen one or two of the challenges you are having today and give you tools based of on what i study until now to help you to succeed with that challenge awesome and, and Leandro, since you've read most, if not maybe all the book, what are some of your, what were some, some things that maybe surprised you about um, this area of this domain of space? A, a lot of things I have to tell you. First thing, in the beginning of the book, I will look for it. I, I saw it the other day, probably I will have it here around the page 30. The, one of the first thing I was really surprised is to discover so many amazing technologies that we are using in our in our daily life that comes from discovering of the NASA technologies uh, and people who is working in the space industry. It's amazing. Like here, m maybe you can name them. You know them more than me. Oh yeah, the MRI technology and artificial limbs, and there's connections from LEDs and wireless headphones and um, in-ear thermometers, and that's just a, a few, few, but there's thousands. And when I read that, Robert, I was like, "What? I, I didn't know." And the other thing that surprised me a lot is to discover the amount of industries and opportunities that exist today in related to the space because before reading the book in my non-knowledge about the space i thought that the space was only satellites and rockets like i i, I thought that was everything and suddenly i discovered that there are so many industries related to uh, agro business related to uh, communications related to oof. maybe you can help me with this yeah a lot a lot a lot of industries and and also the other thing that surprised me is the entry barrier i found out that is much smaller than I thought. Before reading this book, I thought that the space, it was only for a few people. I thought it was only for uh, governments and billionaires. And I, I discovered reading this book that really, uh, as the, the title is a very wise title, the, the title you chose, Robert, really space is open for business. Really, today, there are a lot of opportunities that exist already. And by reading the book, I am discovering that there is a trend which is very clear that the costs are going down, the opportunities are going up, that the regulations hopefully will be 
more positive for more entrepreneurs, more startups, more industries. And as you mentioned in some in some moment, I think uh, that maybe the space is the internet 2.0. Maybe internet is is the new in, you know the new industry. I was talking very inspired by your book uh, with someone some hours ago, and we were talking about how in in the beginning the computer was you know big machines in, in size of rooms, huge. And who was able to have a, a computer? Maybe like few people. And 20, 30 years after, everyone had a computer in a small box, you know? And now we have a supercomputer in a, in, in a phone. So knowing how the technology, the technology advanced in a computer and on internet, I think that we should really consider seriously the space because if the same happens with the space, which I think is happening, uh, we don't know yet how many opportunities are out there. You, you, you mentioned in your book about the the opening of a trillion dollars business. Maybe it's more. May, may, like, really, it's, yeah. it, it, we are like, by opening the space industry, we are not talking about only about all the industries that already exist in planet Earth. We are not aware of all the new industries that will be needed based on our uh, space exploration and based on the opportunities we have by opening the door to the space. So, so I think is you, you are stepping into something great and, and I think that the more people read your book, the more people get involved into the space, the same happened with the internet. The more people got involved into the internet, the more people got involved into the computer uh, industry, uh, the bigger the revolution became. And I, I, I do believe that uh, there's something is happening here. Yeah. No, thank you, Leandro. So Leandro, before we wrap up today, um, where can people find more about you? I know you're got, you've got a pretty um, good presence online. Yes, uh, for everyone who wants to practice your Spanish, <laughs> you can find me, Leandro Tau, in every social media, in Facebook, in YouTube, in Instagram, in Twitter. Uh, thanks God we have a, a nice community where we share a lot of content uh, six days a week because on Shabbat I, I rest. And uh, I have to say that thanks a conversation I had with Robert last week, this is, this is uh, something important. I started a new YouTube channel in English. I know my accent is a little funny, but Based on this, I said, okay, let's start a new channel in English. So I started a new YouTube channel in English. The first video is with you, Robert. Awesome. And, Thank you. And I, will, I, I plan to add more videos, more content, to, to also to expand my what I share with everyone who doesn't speak English, who doesn't speak Spanish, sorry. Understood. Well, thank you very much. We, again, we have Leandro Taub, and that's T-A-U-B, Leandro Taub. Um, thank you so much for joining us today on the virtual launch party, and, um, and we'll, we'll be in touch soon. So everybody check out Leandro, and thank you very much for participating in the uh, Space Rush bonuses, too. Thank you, Sabine. Guys, everyone, get your copy, get the bonuses. Everyone who get the bonuses, see you in the webinar. That's good. Bye. All right, that was Leandro Taub. Taub. 
um, uh, who is participating in the book bonuses. And, and I've been collaborating with uh, Leandro for some months now. Um, he's a really skilled uh, guy in a lot of different areas. Uh, really wonderful to work with Leandro. Um, and also I'm learning that the book is apparently debuting number one in several categories on the um, the large websites that a um, that a well known space entrepreneur owns. That sounds like it's a place in somewhere in South America. Um, yes, it's doing well there. But when you purchase the book, wherever you get it, and you send us like a receipt, um, we'll give you access to the bonuses. But we have even more incredible bonuses available if you purchase direct. So at spaceisopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses. I feel a little bit like I'm on TV, but I'm not. It's the internet. Um, I might kind of say that because I'm here. I'll show you a copy of the book. Check it out. Ah. Get a little look inside. You can, uh, uh, it's not working too well. Looks like a looks like it's an augmented reality book. <laughs> it's not. I actually did some work though on having a blockchain with the book and I uh, block connecting blockchain in the book and I um, released a chapter of the book through a site called Bookchain, where they're using um, blockchain technology for publishers and authors. It's great stuff. And so there is a uh, you go to I think it's bookchain.ca. They're a Canadian company. There's a chapter there and it's blockchain technology they're using to um, uh, help publishers and authors. Um, so let's see here. I've got, uh, I'm going to go back to my screen share. Uh, I hope everybody is having a great Tuesday. I'm going to go back to um, the video. We're going to play um, video before we have our next guest on. Uh, let's just see here. Oh, well, it's actually audio with video, but here, two different things. Let's just do this, do this, do this, put it here. And, uh... I'm gonna bring back again, Sean Whitehead. Hi, this is Robert again. And I have a special recorded call uh, from my friend who's on the line with me, Sean Whitehead. And I met Sean through Dr. Armin Ellis of the Exploration Institute. And Sean is a lot of different things. He can tell you a bit about his really colorful and, and, and fantastic background, but he is the founder of Creationeer and Scout Pet Limited, which is an exploration innovation company. He's also the founder of Thumbset, which is a, a space-related effort, which he'll share a bit with you about. He's participating with some of our bonus offerings and, and, and I'm so pleased to have Sean here today. He wasn't able to make it with us live, but, but we're getting the second best thing is having a recorded call with Sean. Sean, welcome, uh, welcome to uh, the virtual launch party. Thank you for uh, inviting me, Robert, and uh, it's always a great pleasure to catch up with you. So excited to uh, see what's happening with the book. My career has been pretty varied, as you said, uh, uh, but it all really began with uh, space. I was always interested in discovering uh, new things. So uh, uh, I was uh, doing conventional space engineering for about 13 years at the Space Research Center of the University of Leicester. Uh, so I, I got to all of that fun of what I call turning scientist dreams into engineering reality. And then uh, after I'd uh, been through quite a few projects with a whole range of uh, uh, space organizations, uh, both academic and industrial. Uh, I, I decided that I would branch out on my own to try different things. So uh, that's when I started uh, doing what I call creationeering because it's very difficult to describe exactly what it is. Uh, but it's uh, all based on sort of good, solid systems engineering, but it takes me out into uh, art, uh, archaeological exploration, uh, robotics, uh, and then on the robotic side, I, uh, I, I do exploration, um, and it might be called treasure hunting, really, I suppose, uh, because it's all uh, looking for treasures, whether it's uh, on Mars or, or whether it's in the, the desert of Egypt. And 
So I, I, I wanted a vehicle to apply technology to that side of treasure hunting or archaeology, if you like. So I started Scaratech, which is all about that. Um, and one of the key things that we did was to uh, put a, uh, send a robot into the mysterious shafts in the Great Pyramid in Egypt, which is uh, such a privilege uh, to be allowed to do that. But just like space engineering, that was not, uh, that didn't all happen overnight. That was a six year process to, to get to the stage where we actually uh, discovered uh, hieroglyphs that hadn't been seen for four and a half thousand years in the pyramid. So that was an exciting time. Uh, and then from there, I've gone on to do other um, bits and pieces of space engineering. Uh, but one thing that I did find was, even though I'd been involved in space engineering for a long time, uh, uh, when I wanted to put a small experiment of my own into orbit, it was really difficult to find a way to do that. And so, being the way I am, I thought, uh, you know what, I'll try and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll design something for myself, something that I would like to do. So, I wanted a tiny satellite that you could fit all sorts of different payloads onto. So, uh, so, so Sean, let me interrupt one moment. When you're thinking about small, for those maybe who are a little less familiar, they, when they think of a satellite, uh, maybe they don't listen to this. They just think of something the size of a bus or a car. Um, what were you kind of thinking of? Yeah. So, so to be technical about it, so, so I'm looking at Santa satellites, so that's typically something that's uh, uh, less than 100 grams. But with the satellite that we came up with, uh, I called it dumb stuff because it's, there's no dimension that is longer than the average uh, human thumb. So it's about 49 uh, millimeters by 49 by, uh, to vary depending on the experiment, but uh, the main core of it is probably about 30 millimeters deep. So it's not much bigger than a, a matchbox, but we pack in all of the features that you would find in a much larger satellite. The only thing we don't have at the moment is uh, propulsion. And the idea is that this is a standard tiny satellite that you can then plug in uh, payloads or experiments. Uh, so it's sort of ready to go. So it's almost like the iPhone of space, if you like. So you would modify the software uh, and plug in the hardware and make use of the hardware that we've got. So it's got camera, GPS, uh, inertial measurement units, all those sort of things. Uh, so that's the scale that we're looking at, and I, I think I got obsessed with tiny things on certain space projects where we had a minimal amount of mass and volume to play with, and I realised that the technology is right at the moment to really make very, very tiny satellites, and I, it makes it affordable for everybody, and, and uh, you know, as you say, uh, space is open uh, to business for everybody, and uh, we want to encourage people who wouldn't normally get involved in space to, to do so. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And where is, um, in what some of the kind of the applications that one could use from having the small matchbook size thumb set? What could people, um, what would be some of the early uses that you might imagine um, activity-wise? Yeah, so uh, you can do lots of experiments that you, you, you might do on a, on a larger scale of scientific uh, satellite. We tend to steer clear of uh, the stuff that the big boys are doing, so we don't really get into Earth imaging or telecommunications. We're more about space science and uh, space exploration and engineering. So everything from uh, looking at, for example, how uh, tardy grades of water bears or uh, if you want to call them, uh, uh, survive and uh, behave in microgravity and in different environments. Um, human cell growth, uh, protein growth, so you can look at how, to, how, how you can grow uh, proteins uh, very purely and very quickly and examine them with a microscope. Uh, we have uh, people who want to do radio science experiments. We have uh, a variety of uh, people who want to test out small space mechanisms. So normally what, what you would happen is, what, what, what would you do if you were testing a, um, an electronic or mechanical space component is, if you wanted to do it on Earth, it would cost you, it would take maybe 
eight weeks to test. I did a lot of that in my uh, main space engineering career, uh, and it would cost a fortune, typically two thousand pounds or about say two and a half thousand dollars a day, even for a cheap test house. Uh, so what we want to do with Thumbsnap is be able to actually mount components onto Thumbsnap and put them into real space, not simulated space, uh, and test them more quickly and more cheaply than you would if you were doing it on the ground. So a wide variety of things. And uh, I think there are, some, there are lots of things that just really haven't even been thought of yet. That's the exciting thing because the moment that we make it all accessible to people who wouldn't normally use it or wouldn't normally be able to afford to do it, uh, we'll find all sorts of amazing things. Who, whoever knew that uh, iPhones might be used for monitoring blood sugar or general health applications or the, the amazing things that iPhones or smartphones can do now. Wow, that's, uh, that's super cool. Um, and, and this is kind of, I think, you know, dovetailing into uh, spaces open for business is that literally, um, you know, part of my premise is that Space is not just opening for business for big industry, but for all sorts of people. It's becoming easier for you know regular people to start experimenting with the space domain using these new small um, assets that are being created, like Thumbstep, um, to do some um, really neat research and development. Yeah, so, so, so absolutely working working down from the top and. Uh, giving ordinary folk access to space from that side, but also with uh, the, the bigger organizations going out. You know, I think uh, most of us who have been in the space business for any length of time or have been interested in space for any length of time, certainly for me since the uh, 70s, I've always heard, uh, you know, the next big thing will be in 20 years, it will be in 20 years, and it keeps rolling on. Now we're talking about exciting things happening in space. Well, they're happening now. Uh, they're happening next year and they're happening in the next four years and it finally seems real that these things are happening and not only are these happening because a lot of it is driven by uh, big business as opposed to necessarily government, although of course governments are a huge part of that uh, it does mean that the the bigger businesses uh, from our view are looking at opportunities of, if you like, bringing the smaller people on board, so we know we are benefiting, even we're a Chinese satellite, we will benefit from the massive opportunities as, uh, as we're pushing out into, you know, more uh, large vehicles into Earth orbit. Uh, various projects that we're involved in are going to take advantage of the as a piggyback rides on, on the larger launch vehicles to the moon, and that just was not available uh, mm -hmm. up until relatively recently. So it's fantastic and a hugely exciting time to be in space. And and then you know it's really uh, fun to, to you know when you you describe yourself as being involved in a variety of treasure hunts and, and treasure has a lot of different definitions. What is what is a good lesson or lessons that you've learned from your experiences, you know, exploring and searching for um, hidden hidden things, whatever they're they're defined as, that you have found, you know, really helpful and applicable just in life. <laughs> loads, it's it's it, it's taught me loads, really. I think uh, one of the key things that I uh, always try to tell uh, the students and I lecture to them. Uh, is that uh, being involved in engineering, for example, is a is a, is a gateway to uh, exciting adventures. So, uh, it, engineering can sometimes have a sort of a slightly boring um, image, and sometimes, if I'm absolutely honest, I sit in a room full of engineers and think, you know, I don't really fit in here necessarily. Uh, but I've always I've always uh, used engineering as a, as a, as a way to uh, take me on the adventures that I want to go on and uh, whether that has been, uh, you know, remotely via space or in person as we've sat in the Great Pyramid, uh, you have to do... I, I get asked a lot of the time uh, by people who read about what we've been up to saying, can we join you? Uh, and what they see is just the top... It's just a fun bit at the, at the very end. Uh, 
the sort of glamorous bit of it. And I also, you know, 99.9% of what we do is just the hard nuts and bolts work to get it to that stage that has taken years. So if anybody wants to join me on adventures, uh, I'll give them a small job to do, which appears to be boring. Uh, and that gets rid of a lot of people. Most people here and they do those basic jobs and then they work. But eventually they get to go to the pyramid uh, and, and uh, look in mysterious shots that nobody's seen in four and a half thousand years. Uh, so that's one of the key things for me. Um, the second thing, uh, as with anything, and it's, again, it's not glamorous, but it works, it's just good old perseverance is, 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 is key. Uh, and I can tell you that the moment... Uh, that you, uh, you know, your shovel goes into the ground and it hits something metallic and you think, you know, I've done it. That's got a bolt of electricity that goes through you. On the moment that you see a, an image on a video screen from another planet uh, that is looking at a tool that you've placed on the other planet, or, or the moment that you, your robot comes back down from a, a shaft or uh, some mm -hmm. mysterious space and, you know, it's got dust on it that has been gathered over all of those years and that's all worth it in the end and uh, so they're the key lessons I would say. That's awesome um, and j just to rephrase uh, go back to the point right before you're talking about uh, the, the, uh, having the opportunity to perhaps go to the pyramids you're breaking up a little bit but I think what I heard you say is essentially you start with you somebody starts with you working on some small tasks and as they build that yeah. trust in time, there are some really, um, really cool opportunities that they could potentially participate with you um, on. Yeah. So, so uh, I often get contacted by people who see the end result of what we're doing, so the exciting stage. Uh, so they'll, they'll, they'll see that the robot is being deployed in a pyramid or, you know, results of a space mission. And people say they want to be involved, and I say, well, you know, you realise that there's a there's a lot of hard work to get to that point. You don't just uh, don't just uh, turn up and participate on the day. Uh, you have to get involved in the nitty gritty. Uh, and so what I often do is just give people a very simple task to do, and that gets rid of 95% of people. Uh, and then some people stick in uh, and they do the simple task and they get a liking for that and they see that it's making progress and eventually they get to join us on these exciting adventures. So uh, I think that's a, a great lesson to learn is that you've just got to stick in and do the hard work and 99.9% of that is not glamorous. Um, it's fun, uh, it's hard, but it's not glamorous. Uh, and that's what gives you the opportunity to uh, take part in the really exciting stuff at the end and, and get the results. Uh, and, see all of these magnificent discoveries that uh, hard work takes you to. Thank you, Sean. Could you share just a little bit about um, the, the, the bonus we're, we're going to offer? Uh, this will assume um, that some pandemic, the pandemic will subside or there was a potentially way to do this remotely uh, of, of, you know, visiting a robotics lab that you have, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say loosely an affiliation with. Um, yes. Yes, so, so uh, what we're offering uh, for, uh, and it's a special offer uh, that's only related to your uh, book, Robert, is the I'm very much associated with the University of Leeds uh, Robotics Lab, and uh, we call the work that we do the real uh, robotics, which is robots that have a practical application in the real world, and it's things that, if you like, will take us on adventures, so uh, robots that help us to explore places that human beings wouldn't normally be able to reach. So the robotics lab is in Leeds in the UK, and we have opportunity for a certain number of people, VIPs, probably about half a dozen, um, but it depends on what happens with the uh, COVID situation. And we will invite them to the lab where they will have a full tour of all of uh, the amazing robots uh, that we have on offer. And that's everything from, uh, you know, walking robots, tiny robots that w were built to crawl underneath uh, from, uh, ancient sailing vessels, uh, the original robots that we used to climb the shafts in the pyramid, and uh, 
drones, uh, all of these sort of things, um, all sorts of tools and equipment that is used for uh, remotely seeing traces, if you like. And it would be a, probably a full day uh, looking around the lab. And uh, we who have operated the robots will uh, give the background into the places that we've taken them uh, and the uh, potential adventures that we are going to go on next. That would be so cool. That sounds amazing. And what I love is that, you know, it's so interdisciplinary. We're, we're, you know, you've mentioned, you know, hieroglyphics, which is like, you know, archaeology and history, robotics, which it, it has its own subdomains, whether it's using uh, things that fly or things that crawl or things that ro- ro- uh, roll. And, and then when you start then extending out into space and one of the other key words you mentioned with perseverance and i'm thinking right now there is a spacecraft headed to mars and, and what is it? and the name's perseverance so very time very timely sean and it's not the only robot it's gonna get it's gonna get actually kind of crowd, crowded over there in mars with the robot <laughs> absolutely and, and i think perseverance is absolutely right i, I I, I, I believe that, uh, you know, I, I thought of perseverance from my own term before that spacecraft was named, but uh, I'll, I'll take that and uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's what it's about. It's, it's, it's what it's about. It's, uh, it, it's being prepared to put in that work, and I, 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 I love it because, as you know, Robert, you, you too are associated with a lot of people, and you yourself are a hard worker, and uh, I don't think it's just doing work for the sake of it, but if you... If you focus and you have a goal and a dream, uh, you can truly make it happen. And it all comes down to, uh, I, I, I think if, if people come along to me and they've got any uh, particular skills, I'm not so interested in that. I'm interested in their ability to try and to learn. Uh, and when they fail, to pick themselves up and start over again. And uh, that's what it's all about. That is awesome. Well, everyone out there, uh, and on Earth, let's see, maybe there's a few out on the, in space. Maybe maybe we're getting a stream on the ISS. That would be pretty cool. I want to thank you for listening, and I want to thank my special guest, Sean Whitehead, Creationeer, um, Scout Tech Limited, um, for, for, for spending a little time with us today. And, and, Sean, where can people find you to learn a little bit? We'll probably have a link available, but where can they find? I uh, want to give the, the, the URL for, for Creationeer. Yeah, so if you just go to creationeer.co.uk, uh, and then uh, that should give you a little bit of a background about me and some, some interesting stuff that I'm involved in. So I try, to, uh, I try to link to most of the key stuff that I'm involved in. Yeah, and, Sean, and I've taken some really fun virtual walks that Sean has set up um, on the page. You can find on the website. There's some um, kind of fun, some you know fun activities that one can can just do just by visiting his website and get to visit some really lovely lovely places. Yeah, thank you. Well, you're most welcome, Robert. And uh, again, congrats on the book, and I hope that everybody has a, a, a wonderful day on the on, on the launch day. Thank you. Um, have you? Okay. There we go. Hi, everyone. Okay. So I think we, um, we're looking for Elizabeth uh, Kennick. That was uh, Sean Whitehead from Creationeer and Scout Tech and Thumbset. We're looking for Pamela. So, Pamela, if you are there, um, we're our, our, our um, guest at 5 p.m. Eastern. We're going to have him after Elizabeth. Elizabeth, if you're there, you should have gotten an email from Zoom itself um, with the link. Can someone send that, share that private link to um, to Elizabeth? Let's just see. Um, let's just see. I don't see... Or that um, let's just. Or I'm gonna see if I can. Uh, oh, I don't have access to this. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, you there? And someone um, has someone been able to talk to Elizabeth? Because I don't see her. Um, 
where Elizabeth, I can't, how do I, how do I promote, um, try this. All attendees. Okay, so Elizabeth, um, please check. You will have a text a DM from uh, Remco. Please copy the entire text. Um, and, uh, and that should work. Some of it, you might have to grab the whole, copy it and not just click on it. I'll give Elizabeth a moment. So friends, yes, today is the book launch for Space is Open for Business. And it's exciting to share we came out number one on some big platform and number one in three different, in several categories, I think three different categories. Um, but when you purchase the book um, direct, we're making bonuses available. And we've got some really awesome ones. They are awesome for uh, bulk purchases. Those are um, five or more books. And, uh, and you can go to spacesopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses. Um, and I can probably show, um, let's just see. Um, let's just see. Uh, I'm going to try to, how can I, uh, I'm going to see if I can, I'm going to see if I can just switch out of my, uh, Zoom window, so those people in the back scene might see this. Me using my, um, let's just, might be seeing me going to my email. But that's just what has to be done for the moment. Hold one second, I'm gonna turn off my video. Stand by. Elizabeth, I'm going to try to email you the link. Zoom should have sent it to you. Maybe you didn't get it. Um, yeah, well, Zoom, no email from Zoom. So weird. Let's try this. Um, see, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to send it to you, your email. Those who are seeing, yeah, it's your teachers in space email. Uh, teachers in space is what we had, Liz. But I'm gonna try to add maybe your uh, your personal email as or as well. So, um, Liz, if you're there, check your personal email, and I'm also going to suggest you check your uh, your work email. I'm going to resend it uh, to both. I didn't know I have that ability. So thank you for being patient, everyone. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, let's go back. You're not revealing too much personal information. There's Liz! Yay! Liz, hey, thank you. Thank you for correcting your audio. Hey, Liz. Hey, Robert. Yay. All I'm right. Liz. Yeah. Oh, so, working? Hey, so good to see you. Good to see you. I've been listening in. You've had some really great conversations, and I'm amazed that you have been doing this all day long. I have been. It's been super fun, and I'm so glad we were able to get you in. Zoom still has a few weird things, as much as I use Zoom, that, you know, I, um, you know, the webinar versus, or excuse me, panelists versus attendees, sometimes that gets a little wonky. So thank you being being patient. But I just want to let's jump right in so that I don't make yes, everybody sir. else too late. So we okay. have um, the head executive director of Teachers in Space, Elizabeth Kenick. Welcome, Liz. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, yeah. So my friend, so I can say Liz. She likes to be called Liz. <laughs> is Elizabeth. We are actually personal personal friends. Um, With Liz, the same birthday. We do. We're, we are birthday we're on the same day. We are Geminis. Um, that's a fun, we're, 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 I think we're fun people. Yes. Yes, we are. We've had a lot of adventures. And actually, we got to, you're probably one of the last people who got to hang on like one of my trips, which was in, uh, a trip in December I took to New York. We got to hang out. Um, that was just not terribly in long. Brooklyn, but, music, jazz. Yeah, we heard yeah. some music and um, yeah, and we went to Chinatown too. Yep, yes, we did. we did. But most of all, we went on that Space Angels tour of Mojave 
And you told me then that you were working on a book, and here it is. And I'm just really happy that Facebook remembered that and said, hey, Liz, remember when you went on this trip? What an itinerary that was. That was quite itinerary. It was a lot of fun. It was There was a lot packed in in those two or three days. Really, yep. you're kind of all going around in a bus. <laughs> <laughs> well, bus and we even had time of... for a little hiking. We did. Yeah. So, so Liz, tell us about what what Teachers in Space is sure because you guys are our launch partner and you're going to actually and we're going to have one of the book bonuses is 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 being offered by teachers in space and um tell people about what you're doing a little bit maybe in perlin 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 um yeah <laughs> project. so you have some yeah you know we started teachers in space was a project of the space frontier foundation back in 2009 and I was on the board of the Space Frontier Foundation, but I was not yet involved with Teachers in Space. And I remember being at the New Space Conference that year and just being amazed at the presentation. They had already run a national competition and selected seven teachers to be the first to fly. They had handshake promises from five suborbital companies who said they were gonna fly in the next two years. And you know, we've all heard that before, right? Two years, two years. Um, and then they worked on a grant. They got a NASA cooperative agreement and they began to run summer workshops for teachers. The first workshops were in 2011. And in that fall, the board asked me if I would take the project over. I'm a professional project manager and I was able to deliver those workshops in such a way that we actually had great success and had some money left over and were able to keep going into the summer of 2013. After that, NASA lost their educational money during federal sequestration, and we spun off and became a 501c3. We're incorporated now, and we have been working on our own ever since. But what we started to do during that first summer that I was in charge in 2012, working with NASA Ames, we began to develop ta-da, 1U 3D printed CubeSat form factors, and this is a standard and what you do with this standard, and we have put the files for this up on our website, on the Teachers in Space website. So you can print this for free or you can buy it from us. It's available on our website, 30 bucks for the frame, 60 bucks for the Arduino package inside. And it comes with some instructions, but we've been flying these on balloons since 2012. And then in 2015, we got a sponsorship from the Perline Project that you mentioned. And in 2016 and 2017, we flew these built by teachers and students from a preschool workshop program in Oregon at the Museum of OMSI, Oregon Museum of Space, I believe. And then also all the way up to junior college. Then last year, we got two years ago, we got another NASA grant flight opportunities to fly a 2U version of this suborbitally with Blue Origin. So that was our first actual space flight. We did a 2U version and we flew it on Blue Origin's New Shepard, got it back the same day, pulled the data. This is Arduino's inside, a bunch of sensors. It collects pressure, it collects uh, temperature. And we also typically fly it with two Geiger counters, and I can talk about that. But it's a test of a radiation protection material. So you can compare what's seen by the protected versus the unprotected Geiger counter. So then, you know, we've got the suborbital data from blue to compare to what we got from balloons and from Perlin. And we even built a USB interface to Blue Origin so that we did not have to fly batteries. We used their power from the vehicle and we got their data as well as ours, which is super cool. There's nothing like going into a high school and saying, do you guys want to work with some data? This is from an actual flight of Blue Origin New Shepard. And, you know, believe me, they want their hands all over that. So right after that flight with Blue last year, we got awarded another flight. And now we're making a 3U version of this with solar panels and a radio. And it's going to go into orbit in November on the first flight of Firefly. Firefly Aerospace is in Texas. They're going to fly out of Vandenberg. This is their payload user's guide. You can find them on the web. And we are going to be on their first flight and we're going to launch to space. That is awesome. Very cool. And can you share a little bit about your um, the, the project that you did with the high altitude glider? I'd refer to that yeah, one. Yeah, that's the I mean, Perlin that project. Kind of like, 
Um, it's not super well known, I would say, outside of aviation circles, but very neat. Very neat. Yeah, it's super cool. Here's how I found out about it. We were working with Scott Wiley at NASA Armstrong on our CubeSats and balloons, and he's a glider pilot. And I was out there in Mojave for some conferences, and I was working with him on a grant proposal. And he said, hey, let's go to the Mojave Air and Space Port for that plane crazy event that they do once a month, and we'll meet Dennis Tito. And I thought, yeah, I want to meet Dennis Tito. He's uh, been to space, and he's, uh, he had a Mars program he was working on. But it turned out that what he was presenting that day was that he was working with the Perlan Project. Perlan started as their goal was to set world records in gliding and also to reach the stratosphere. So they started out initially with just a regular commercially available glider, which was actually very similar to one that Scott owned, and that's why he was so interested in it. And they got as high as they could get. And then they raised some money and got some sponsorship from Dennis and also from Airbus. And they built a glider, the first glider with a pressurized cabin so that they could get higher. What, what had held the limit and the reason nobody had broken the world record set by Perlan One in, I think, 20, 2006 was that you had to wear a spacesuit, right? And the spacesuit gets bigger as it pressurizes. And then there's a limit where you can't get any more pressure inside that tiny little cabin. And that's as high as anybody could go. So they actually developed a pressurized glider cabin. And then they reworked some diving rebreathers. So they could, it, it's amazing all the stuff that they did. And the team is pilots and engineers. And in order to fulfill their partnership with Airbus, they wanted to do a science mission. And I guess because I met Dennis and because I was working with Ted Southern, a Final Frontier design, and one of the pilots and engineers from Perlin had funded Ted, that was Miguel, you know, it's teeny tiny world. And Perlin said, can you guys get some schools together to build CubeSats like this and we'll fly them? And I said, yes, we can. So they actually funded in 2015 the week-long workshop that we did in Mojave. We brought a bunch of teachers together, just like we did when we had the NASA funding, and taught them about the Perlang glider, how it flies, and types of experiments that can be built to be carried inside it. And what's great about this is it let us actually prove what we've been saying. We've been saying this is a standard. This flies on a balloon. This fits inside the CubeSat Bay for Perlan. And so right then in 2015, 2016, when they first flew, they built a payload locker that could hold four of these cubes. Since then, they've set so many world records that in order to go higher, they reduced the size and now they carry three of these, but it's still the same standard. So that's really awesome. And this is the standard that was set by Cal Poly. This is the CubeSat standard. So um, we ran a national program we signed up 42 schools. It was free because Perlan paid for it. And we said, we're going to teach you. And instead of being a typical competition where only one school, and you know what happens, it's always the school with the money, right? It's always some, it, they're either from Florida and they've got space connections or they've got money. But we said any school, any science museum, any college, all you have to do is attend the sessions. We did it online all the way back in 2015, 2016 attend the sessions, complete the deliverables. We're gonna take you through the engineering process. And if you get all the way to build, we will fly your cube. And 10 schools made it to build. And I say schools, but one of them was that Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. Um, and they delivered their cubes to us. And it turned out the six of them were actually ready to fly. And we flew those six that first year in Argentina on the first flights of Perlin. And then we worked with the schools whose cubes weren't quite working or didn't survive shipping, whatever the problem was. And so we had our, our first opportunity to actually partner some schools. If a school whose cube wasn't working was similar to one that was, we would put those schools together, even if they were in different states, because they already were beginning to use online technology like this. And uh, we even partnered a school in New York who wanted to fly a MOS experiment, but found out they couldn't ship 
Moss from the U.S. to Argentina and back, paired them with a school in Argentina who collected local moss. And we actually did Zoom conference. No, it wasn't Zoom. It was WebEx. We did WebEx from the hangar in Argentina back to the classroom in New York. And this kid spoke to each other. It was awesome. That's that's amazing. So, yeah. It, it, so is this... Um... Will, will this project continue or are you going to be focusing more on the satellites or doing, or I should say, the in-space stuff as well as the, uh, you know, in-atmosphere of uh, like glider type of flight projects? Are you going to kind of continue both? So our goal is to get teachers in space. That's really our mission. That's what we want to do. And we're super excited now that Virgin have gone public to feel that they are likely to actually make it to being able to carry passengers we know Blue have been flying, and we're hoping they're going to be carrying passengers soon. When we went to launch our 2U payload with Blue last year, they took us up on the catwalk, and they said, when do you guys get to fly? This is, how, you know, like, that's the closest I've ever come. I got to walk out to where I would mm -hmm. enter the rocket if I were actually going to fly. Um, so right now we're talking to a couple of groups who may be able to make that come true for us. We're working with some spaceports. We're working with some foundations. Uh, there is additional NASA funding in the CubeSat launch initiative if we want to keep launching CubeSats. And now we're working with some universities. So the funding options are becoming real. And what we've been doing up until this point is just taking whatever is the next best, highest flight. So we did balloons, then we found out we could do the glider, then we could do blue, now we can go into orbit. If somebody says to us, we will launch a flock of cubes for you, we'll take that. But what I really, really, really want most of all is to get teachers into space. Very cool, very cool. And I wanna share um, that we'll put the links in for Teachers in Space um, to check out their website. And they're participating as a launch partner, so they're going to be sharing, um, there'll be a kind of a, a webinar type of opportunity for those who um, qualify to receive a bonus. Or So okay. um, so yeah, go over to um, Teachers in Space and, and, and check out what they do. You know, donate if you know they're a nonprofit. So they're, um, they're looking for other, you know, funders and donation and partner and, and you know business opportunities for them. Um, so Liz, thank you so much for joining me and the virtual launch party today. We've got um, uh, my wonderful Marco. He posted um, in our chat. We've got it's teachers in space.com and on Twitter, tweet teachers in space.com, Facebook, teachers in space. Yes. So um, we've got that there. And those just kind of reading that out for those who are. Um, are watching maybe on, on the YouTube stream. Liz, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I appreciate you being able to share and Teachers in Space is also included in, in the book. Um, there was a section, um, it's kind of after the, the main copy about how to enable a, a sustainable grow to, a, to a, grow the industry to a trillion dollars plus. And there's a big part of it is STEM education. And we and, and, and Liz put me in touch with some great uh, educators and partners she's working with to learn more about what's really happening in, in the field of, of STEM. So there's some uh, um, fun uh, and useful insights there that whether uh, teachers or policymakers could take a look at and hopefully find useful. Thank you so much, Robert. And I want to say I was very interested reading some more of your book last night to see the section on the guy who's doing the space chain, the blockchain in space, because mm -hmm. that's one of the things we're doing with Villanova University. And I didn't know somebody else had already started doing that. So I'm excited now to see if I can connect that. Yeah, blockchain, blockchain and space there. Um, that's uh, space chain is, is put um, using uh, blockchain technology on, on satellites and um, very, it's also very international uh, effort. I think they're based in Singapore, but they have, uh, uh, I think some of their executives are I think, in the US. Some are I think are in Asia. Um, so, um, other types of collabor other form of collaboration going on and, and, and interdisciplinary blockchain in space. And it's a great way to make sure if you're working with a flock of satellites and they're sharing information, it's a great way to know 
sort of a chain of custody, right? That, that all the digital assets are where they're supposed to be and you can find out if there's a break and repair it. So that it's super exciting. Um, and it kind of ties into what your book is all about, which is space is just one more place we can do stuff, right? This blockchain is not necessarily specifically a space thing, but we sure can do a lot with it in space. Yeah. Well, Liz, so great to see you today. Um, hope hope you're having a great summer and looking forward to seeing you on the East Coast when things uh, um, and just break and repair it. So that it's super exciting. Oh, got a little delay there and some audio. That's all right. Yeah, um, Robert, two 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 blocks to the beach in the sunset. Oh, so, yeah, two yeah. blocks to the beach. I'm looking I forward got, to. I got I got a spare apartment for you at the front of the house. Sounds great. We like the beach. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. So we're going to next. Thanks so much. Sorry for the technical issue. I'm going to blame Zoom on that, but um, but we made it. Thank you for your persistence. So I want to next bring up, we're just running a little bit late, um, my friend Ryan Holmes. Ryan, are you there? I I, I emailed you or I re-emailed you the link from, uh, from, from um, Zoom. Me panelist link. I know I'm trying to just a second. Um, see email from Zoom. Um, I don't have it. Does somebody, Liz, can you give, Liz, what is, can you, can you um, email, do you have the, um, the link that the link you, you sent me? Yes. Yeah. Forward to you Ryan at spaceVR.co. R-Y-A-N at spaceVR.co. V R dot C O. Yeah. So I will um V R dot C O Ryan at space. Yep, sending. Okay. Uh, just a second. Ryan, hold on. We're trying to we're trying to work this out. Wish I had a let's just see here. Did you get it, Ryan? Let's see. I don't see him in that. It sounds like he's um, in the uh, the, uh, the the attendee link. I'm gonna have to go into my Zoom account again. I think that's what happened to me too. Yeah, I don't know why they did that. They have, uh, I wish someone could help detangle this at Zoom because their customer service is really slow. I'm gonna say this loud, honestly. See, it does have your name in there. It probably never got to. I see Ryan's name in there, but I'm gonna resend Ryan coming okay. from. Um, I just changed my name. There he is. Oh, Hi, I Ryan. Your name. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna drop off and let Ryan talk. Okay. Thank you hey, so Ryan. much, Rob. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for your persistence. And uh, we're okay. Only 20 minutes late now. We are we are running early, and then we ran a little late. Um, so. I want to introduce uh, the founder of uh, Space VR and CEO Ryan Holmes. Thank you for joining us, Ryan. Um, Great to be here. We had um, alluded to your work earlier, but we didn't want to like give it away for people who didn't know about it. So when I was talking to Frank, we were we were definitely kind of hinting to some of your work, but we didn't reveal it. Would it be appropriate? I have um, the video you had shared with me. I have it locally on my computer. Of course, would it be, of course. Would it be good to start with that video and then talk a bit? Yeah, yeah, okay, let's, do, let's it. do that. Okay, I'm gonna let me screen share screen desktop. Okay, stand by people. We're gonna okay.
Very cool. So that was a little teaser video that uh, Ryan and Space VR had shared with me. I was glad I was able to uh, uh, share that to everyone today. So Ryan, tell us a little about this jur the journey to get to what we just saw. Maybe give us a little bit of the origin story, and and then we can talk um, a little more about what what you're what you're currently offering the public and what's in development. Yeah, absolutely. So about six years ago, I was doing some soul searching and looking into what I can do to contribute to the world in a large way, in a positive way. And I came across the documentary Overview, which many of you have seen. And then I read the book, The Overview Effect. And I thought, well, this is a pr this is this is the thing that I'm going to do. And so I set out to make it happen. And it's been quite a long journey, um, building the company, raising the capital, um, putting all the pieces in place. And uh, to get to the point now where we have 21 signed locations across five countries and uh, our own VR headset. That's the only one in the world that works inside of a zero gravity float tank. And so we're really excited to, um, to get all of those locations open and, uh, and get our satellite launched so people can start seeing through the satellite in the tanks. So for those who've not floated before, can we talk a little bit about that that ex, what that is because there's some people who still might know not know what that is they're like okay yeah i guess the majority of people truthy? probably don't what's know. going on <laughs> yeah so there's um it's pretty low-key but pretty widespread there's about a thousand float spa locations and so in each location there's about four tanks uh, and you go in 1500 pounds of epsom salt and you float on top of the water and um and you close the door, and usually it's pitch black. And so we combine this experience with uh, with a VR headset. Um, we've spoken with um, astronauts. I've told us that the float tank is the closest to space that exists on the Earth. And so when you combine that with a VR headset that's streaming um, VR content from space, you you basically have the ability to access something that used to cost ninety million dollars for only a hundred dollars. Yeah, amazing. Will, um, if somebody eventually becomes like a repeat uh, repeat participant, will you eventually have new content for them over time? Yes, yeah. Yeah, the goal is to uh, have the satellite up and the satellite can uh, constantly refresh on new things. And there's also a lot of other opportunities with float tanks. Uh, the military uses float tanks for super learning and so they use it for like hyper accelerated learning. And so there is um, potential use cases for that as well. Yeah, we uh, earlier this morning, um, it was talked about um, using space for, for accelerated learning. I don't know if it was Frank or someone else, but we were kind of, we were, we, I mentioned that you had shared that with me that the military is researching that around language. You said in some of the initial work right now is around languages, is that right? Memory or language yep. retention? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that is just a really cool thing. You know, imagine going, you know, you, you do a hard study session, whatever, whatever that topic is, and then go taking this really amazing float experiencing the earth having you know you know having whatever you were studying better seep into your subconscious you really learn it having this relaxing ama amazing experience seeing space it seems like there's so many wins right there with that yes there is um so i floated a number of times over the years but i've not done the experience yet i'm really looking forward to going because i've been talking about it a lot now i feel like okay i'm totally <laughs> primed i've i've done it and i've talked about it a lot so I, I, my plan is to uh when you when you have one ready soon for for me and my geographic location i'm i'm gonna be uh, i'm gonna definitely definitely um carefully get in not i won't say dive in uh, but <laughs> <laughs> Water's too shallow, but I'll tell you, it's it's for those who've not done it. The water is very warm, and after several minutes, the edges of your skin almost and the water almost disappear. You just really merge into the into the mm -hmm. water, and that's 
where unless like you sometimes you can move around a little bit but if you're you know you're just still lying back you know you don't feel any edges of anything really it's just uh it's a very unique feeling um maybe we were, you know we were talking i think it was also someone earlier we were talking about scuba diving and talking about feeling you know weightless and feeling free but this is something you know you don't need to do any training you know it doesn't require scuba gear training you don't mm -hmm. have to get under water it is um extremely safe <laughs> there's really so no safe. risk um <laughs> it's getting a little wet you know um and Ryan, so the, in the satellite, um, what's this? What's the um, when? When do you expect to? I mean, when can you estimate that you might have um, some of the the satellite? I think a confident launch date would be December twenty twenty one. We currently have the launch paid for, and the satellite's eighty percent built. Um, very close to finishing up, um, getting it completely finished, and uh, getting it launched. And then once it's launched, it's probably just a few, maybe a few weeks of testing until you're you're ready to go. Or do you think? Uh, um, and, and I how think long? it just everything just works perfectly. I hear every I time know. everything in space. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Everything works perfectly. I know, person. But I, I, my fingers are crossed that it's all gonna go, you know, uh, astonishingly well. Um, but you know, you gotta put the first one in to up to to know whether it's gonna work or not. I'm yeah. curious about the the um, the optics and the sensors on it. Yeah. Um, will well, first of all, is is there only a camera facing down? Um, is it is it only an Earth facing camera? Do you also have a camera that also looks out the other direction? So right now, uh, the camera architecture is not finalized, but the where it stands right now, it is facing only towards the Earth, which is different than what we had before. Um, and, and it's, it has to do with a bunch of reasons. One is the float tank itself. You're predominantly just looking up. So the float tank itself is just a looking in one direction experience. And so um, it only makes sense to have that also be replicated on the satellite. Okay, it makes sense. Um, but I could see one day when other opportunities are available where people can maybe you know, be looking Look around. around. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, at some point. Um, yeah, I think that would be nice. Yeah. So the um, the the how much of a technical challenge has it been to develop the, putting waterproofing on on VR headsets? Was it was it easier than you expected, or you're like, man, this was a lot more difficult? No, it took, it took uh, quite a little bit. It took about a year and a half, and we did a lot of testing, a lot of trying out different methods, um, just getting lucky a lot, really, to figure it out. Um, once we figured it out, though, um, it's, we were able to do it with some really good equipment. So the resolution is higher than Oculus. So we have a headset that's higher resolution than a billionaire. So it's it's pretty good. <laughs> did you get to did you get to break a lot of headsets along the way? <laughs> yes, a lot of Oculuses died in the process. <laughs> they died for your viewing pleasure. <laughs> So, so Ryan, have you um, have you ever seen a, a rocket launch? Of course, of course. I'm Ryan, from Florida. See, there we go. We've got this total Florida posse going on today. I, it was sort of like I knew that. I knew I knew where I was going with it. So, um, you had shown me as, uh, uh, my, it was the first time I ever saw in VR. It was um, I think you had the SpaceX launch, and you you might have had some Martian type of thing going too. But I know you had. Um, this this Falcon 9 flight um, on VR, and I had never seen a, um, a rocket launch in VR. Nice. Yeah, we did capture the SpaceX launch, but it was the one that exploded in the air. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have that to remember forever. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe you can you know, share that with Elon, like, hey, do you want to see one of your rockets blowing so up? We in did VR? share it with Elon, actually. We sent it I mean, it's not the best. We sent it through an advisor to a birthday party. It's probably not the number one thing you want to see on your birthday, but. <laughs> it's like, exp you know, he's like, that was an expensive day, you know? <laughs> yeah. He was having such a good birthday, and then it reminded. <laughs> 
Hey, we're just trying to keep with, with, with when it comes to the whole space is open for business thing. There's a whole chapter on failure. And I yes. think actually, look, we all fail. We all screw up. We make mistakes, yeah. accidental mm -hmm. and intentional. And, or when I say intentional or unintentional, but you know, we're like, God, why did I do that? Um, and it's just, I think just part of the, you know, it's about being human, you know, we're all learning and part of the entrepreneurial experiences, like any creative endeavor is you build and break some things and some things just don't work. And it's really how you pick yourself up and keep moving forward, I think is, is, mm -hmm. is, is almost more important. So many times it's about the journey and not the destination. Yes. Um, sometimes it's nice to get to your destination, though. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you're on a rocket, <laughs> you're doing with rockets. Yeah, you want, you want to get to your destination. Like, Don't worry, you guys. Yeah, you're on the starship. This isn't about the destination. <laughs> and I think actually really funny, the very first flights or something, Elon's like, I'm not really taking to Mars. I'm actually obsessed with Venus or, or whatever else. And everybody's like, what? Did you see that all fine print that said the the operator has the right to take you anywhere in the solar system? Mars is anywhere. It's a little sentence at the end. It says, this agreement may be amended at any time. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, yeah, I wonder, um, you know, with this news about Venus, I mean, I've always thought Venus is, is kind of a, a neat a neat planet and like, you know, having potential ideas that you could maybe one day have cloud cities in a place like Venus in a, in a because the yeah. temperature in, in the upper atmosphere could be, uh, you, 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 you might not be able to breathe there, but you could potentially be more comfortable there in at, at the higher atmosphere. Yes. You know, I, I'm thinking of like, you know, my mind, I'm going to like Empire Strike Back Cloud City. I know that's a little bit of exaggeration. It's more of a fantasy flick, but, um, but I think it's really, but I think Venus is kind of, uh, I hope we get some attention back on Venus because it's just, it's a cool planet too. So uh, nice that it's getting some attention. Uh, Ryan, what is, um, so we're part, we're, we're, we're offering some of the bonuses as part of the package, uh, part of the bonus packages. And if people want to float, um, how can they like start getting, getting, an, um, is it best to go through space VR and, and go to one of your, um, your your partner uh, float places. How can they? I want people. Yeah, to the best to... thing the best thing to do is go to Space VR. Just Google Space VR and uh, go to the site, and you'll see all the locations. And the best thing is to buy the one at the location that is closest to you. And so, um, if it's most of them are about half of them are open, half of them are very close to opening. So that puts you in a queue, so you'll be one of the first people to be able to do it at that location. Great. And for those who are going to purchase bonuses um, or purchase the the, the, the bonuses that, that include Space VR, there's details at spacesopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses. And I want to thank again Ryan Holmes from Space VR. Ryan, thanks so much for, for joining us today and, and, and being very supportive of the the community and the book launch. I, I, I really do appreciate it. And it was fun too. Recently, we just ha were able to have a, um, a lunch, a real person lunch, not a Zoom real lunch. Real person. A real person, in-person lunch, not a Zoom lunch or, you know, or like a Zoom lunch is like this where my wife has like little bowls of food next to me. <laughs> Yes, it was a great in-person lunch. All right, Ryan. Well, thank you very much. Have a yes. great evening. Talk to you later. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thanks for sticking around, friends and allies and new friends. Okay. We've got next, we have, um, we, have uh, we have Dana Day. So Dana, who I'll bring on, is the narrator for the forthcoming audio version of the book. And um, let's just see. So Dana, I think you're, let's just try joining via your computer and see how that goes. So you can um, hopefully un, there you are. Got a nice space background. I see your background. Working. I see your background, Dana, but I do not see you. Um, you might be, um, you might be 
too far away from your virtual background and might need to step in a little bit. Sometimes the camera only cap there that. you go. That is <laughs> there you go. That was easier than I sh it should have been. I have a camera cover on my thing and it was just shut. <laughs> oh, camera cover. <laughs> Welcome, Dana. So thank, thank you very much for um, joining the virtual book launch party. So Dana it, it is, uh, is narrating um, the audiobook version. Um, we're, it's close to being done. I've seen a few messages, people asking when. Um, so it's soon. So just be patient. We'll, we'll get it out <laughs> to you, you know. Um, but um, I think, well, there's a little section that I read in the front end, kind of some introductory stuff that I read. And then Dana is reading the, uh, the, 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 the bulk of the, the manuscript. So Dana, tell us about, you know, a little bit about vocal, uh, you know, narrating audio books and, and some of your work. And uh, I know you've said you've done some science fiction books. And uh, yeah, yeah, a bit, yeah. Tell, 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 you know, talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, essentially, I I narrate a lot of different kinds of books. This is probably one of the more interesting books that I've narrated. I'm really learning a lot. I'm enjoying the material. It's um, it's very forward thinking and positive, and I'm enjoying that as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, I essentially have a studio that I built and I just go in and I spend a lot of time in my studio record, recording books. <laughs> it's, uh, what do was you, that? Do you, do you find when you're reading, when you're, when you're recording a book, is it a different experience? Do you still like, do you still listen to audiobooks for fun or do you, oh, yeah. find that you still do? Okay. Oh yeah. I still read for fun too. I've, I've always read a lot, so it's kind of a good fit for me. Um, do you work on, do you tend to work on projects um, in parallel, like different projects in parallel, or do you have to just focus on like, like let's say this week I can, I'm just doing, um, what did you say? You're, you're science, like a science fiction book. You're, you know, yeah. you're just focusing on, on that. And then you would like switch back to something else. How, how, mm -hmm. do you, how does your workflow tend to tend it to? It kind of depends on my level of ADD at the time. <laughs> um, sometimes it's nice to work on a couple different ones. Um, usually if I'm going to do that, it's nice because they're two totally different books. So like with your book, it's very business oriented. It's very informational. It's very structured. And, um, there's a lot of mouth movement and very enunciated words of business. <laughs> so I find that I can only do that one for a shorter period of time. I kind of like start to get tired more easily. And then I have these other books about these you know, I have some books that are part of a series, these sci-fi series that are also about outer space, but completely fictional. And so I've been working actually on two different projects, but they're both about outer space right now in totally different ways. <laughs> totally different ways. Um, maybe one day I'll have to do a re remix of mixing up a, a mashup or a remix of uh, <laughs> audiobooks. I don't know if anybody ever does that. Like. <laughs> You know, uh, start off as nonfiction and segue into the uh, to the fiction. Um, so, I mean, you're 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 the narrator of my book, so I guess you're a little bit biased. But do you have a certain part of the book that you've enjoyed the most so far? Is there certain sections that you've uh, um, kind of resonated or stood out a bit? Um, you know, I, I like that there's a lot of factors in this business aspect of stuff that you're talking about. It's all very tech. You know, it's a lot of up and coming. It's a whole new sector that a lot of people don't know about because it's only private. But I love how even though it's tech, there's also a lot of implications for this tech to be really ecologically helpful for some of the you know problems. It's a very good problem solving perspective. And it's very hope giving. And so I've really enjoyed reading about some of these things that I didn't know were possible solutions on our horizon, which is really uplifting and super fun to read about and makes me kind of feel excited about things. Yeah. And I mean, I think especially in these in these times of call it COVID where people want to there, you know, there's a lot of it's easy to be cynical or pessimistic about the future. And, and actually, there's lots of great things going on going on today, present tense that are helping real people. And as I shared earlier, um, this whole thing, you know, they don't, when they have whatever the space project is, they don't spend the money in space. It gets spent here. It hires 
real people who live in real cities. There's not just one space city. It's not like NASA or SpaceX just has one city and they say, oh, everybody is just employed here. You know, this is a very international. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of people that work directly in the space industry. And then you have all sorts of ancillary things. And just think about even this book project, how we've all come together. We actually initially met through um, our mutual friend, Jason, who I, I knew uh, through the uh, Space Frontier Foundation. And, uh, and Jason now lives overseas, but um, it's just, um, and Jason was very passionate about artificial intelligence. And that was some of where our, uh, some of our earliest conversations were around. And now, um, you know, introducing you and we're now, you know, working together and collaborating on the audio version of the book. What would you share with maybe other authors out there regarding like how to prepare for being ready for an audio book or maybe why not to do it themselves? Because I know a few people who maybe want to slog through and, and then instead of taking like 20 hours, it takes them like 60 because they've never done it before or, or oh, long. Yeah. Um, what could you share to other authors about um, maybe why why hiring an, why is it a good idea to hire a professional narrator? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is it's a lot more work than people realize going into it for sure. Um, like I said, I've read a lot my entire life, so it's work that actually flows really easily for me. But it's pretty surprising how you know even when it's flowing very easily. Uh, you know, your book for, you know, being recorded, it's probably going to be between nine and 10 hours when it's done. There's a calculation that I can do based on the word count and we can figure out how long it will be. And sometimes, you know, it takes me almost four hours to record and have a completed portion of the book for a one hour of finished recording. Um, and that's with somebody who knows the workflow. I have a really awesome engineer that I work with and, you know, a professional studio there's also techniques for recording that make it pleasant to listen to. Um, so, you know, if you are thinking about recording your own, spend some time practicing and also listening to audiobooks. And there's a huge difference when you listen to an audiobook that, number one, has been professionally recorded with professional equipment, professional mastering, professional editing, and somebody who knows how to speak into the microphone without making lots of like weird noises and things like that. Um, cause that's one of the things that can kind of be a problem, but also just being able to speak in an engaging way and in a way that's comprehensible, especially for a book like yours, it's a business book. So there's a lot of high concept things that need to be spoken. And part of that's my job. Part of it's yours. You did a really good job laying everything out in a way that's like high concept, but also still attainable and understandable. And I thought that was really quite the feat, to be honest, <laughs> as I've gone through this book, I'm like, wow, really, you did a, you did a really good job of this book, the more I get through it. So, cool. but yeah, if you're thinking about recording your own book, I don't discourage that by any means as somebody who's in the industry. I mean, sometimes it's great to have a book done by the author, but also listen to some books by the author that just, they're not, not as good. And it's certainly not going to be as good of an experience. I think that the listeners, the people who are going to be purchasing your book are going to want to be able to listen and be engaged more than they don't really care if it's from the author necessarily. Got it. Um, Dana, where do you have a, I'd seen it and I was having trouble finding it again, is your, your website. I remember you, you have like, yeah, a, it's DanaDay.com. So that's, um, D A E. So yeah. Dana, D A N A, last name D A E, Dana Day. D A E dot com. Okay. Yeah. It might actually be being worked on right now. Okay. Um, I'm not totally sure if it's up or not. It is I think currently I being think updated, I probably being updated because I have some new books to add, including Spaces Open for Business. Fantastic. So, Dana, would you go, would you, um, does the book so far inspire you to like, would you? go to space if you had the opportunity or, or do another <laughs> space book or um it's definitely inspired me to want to get into more like technical business um informational nonfiction reading like i i really enjoy that kind of reading and a lot of times i i've gotten kind of on this kick of doing a lot of these like storytelling sci-fi dystopian you know fictional stories which are super fun i'm getting into all kinds of characters and things like that but the educational aspect of reading this book has been pretty amazing i've been enjoying getting this information and there's you know 
I'm, I'm enjoying reading the book for in and of itself, but the information I'm learning from it as well is just, it's pretty amazing. It's, I feel like it's giving me insight into the future that we will have. And, and all of this stuff is super relevant and not necessarily accessible if you don't know where to look. So it's a great compilation of information. Oh, thank you, Dana. Appreciate that. That's a, uh, uh, um, Remember, she's my narrator, so you know there's a probably a little <laughs> bias in there. But thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very, very kind of you. Um, so I see. Uh, I think our, we have um, one of our next guests. He's kind of getting ready, which is pretty cool. Like I feel like we're seeing backstage. He's going to have a, a kind of an artistic contribution next too. So um, I feel like the flow has gone pretty awesome this afternoon. And we started this morning at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific and going pretty smoothly all day. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and I'm just so pleased to have to have been able to collaborate with people like yourself and so many other people. And I want to again give a shout out. Maybe she's listening to my fantastic editor who's been on this long journey, Vanessa DeHorsey, if she's out there. Um, Vanessa, you're just uh, such a rock star. Um, uh, and for those who actually want to see, again, the copy of the book, it kind of blends in because it's got to kind of stand up. There it is. There's the actual book. There's my mug. So it's a, it's a real thing. It's not just a digital thing. It's a, it's a, it's a printed book. And there's some really great 2D um, illustrations in there from uh, Humoring the Fates. They did some really great jobs on, uh, job on the, um, the illustrations. They're hand-drawn. Um, so really... Uh, uh, it was awesome to have them involved and uh, it was just a brought together this really kind of international group the book designer the uh, interior book designer was a canadian based in germany the um, cover designer is a norwegian who lives in colorado um, richard fan did a great job with the cover um, the um, some of my marketing people are in um, right argentina and mexico um uh you're currently up in the north pacific northwest uh yeah, yeah so um and if i might be missing uh and there were a few people in other parts of the continent of the u.s so but it was really uh wonderfully uh felt like collaborative to be able to to work with a lot of people from around the world on on this on this book and there are many great people who contributed in terms of the interviews and i spent a lot of time Besides, there was kind of the writing research part of it, but doing a bunch of interviews with, with other experts and leaders in their specific domain in and around space, and it was probably ended up being over a hundred. Um, well, and so some of those interviews where I just took, you know, took sometimes just a sentence, sometimes it's a few paragraphs from an interview. I have these really long form um, interviews that we've been trying to edit. And we're going to hopefully start releasing those. So people want to hear some of the more the long form unreleased interviews. We're going to make that um, available too. So let's see. I'm going to give a few minutes till um, our next guest. I think he he's still he's still early, and we're on time. We're like doing re really well. And and I want to give a shout out again to some of the people, man, in Europe who've been doing social media stuff. It's getting late there. So Remco Timmermans. Um, He's uh, in the UK. He has just been helping out since uh, for, for many months doing uh, kind of social media related stuff, handling that. He's he's a kind of a professional. He's a professional, a space professional focused around social media management and creation. And uh, he is uh, kind of all over the place in the world in cyberspace, helping out with uh, um, growing and sharing about the internet, uh, about you know, the space sector. And we met initially at the International Space University where he was a professor and lecturer. And um, who else? We've got uh, Marco Van Dev, who um, is uh, also doing some social media work. He helped spearhead a Reddit session I did last week. It was a lot of fun. For those who've never done a Reddit AMA, I'd say try it out. You get some really weird questions, but it was fun. <laughs> Uh, so I'm glad I did it, um, but it, you know, it, it, I, hopefully some people found some value in the answers that were there. And Marco is uh, is out in uh, Macedonia, so um, that's. And I think I've seen my friend. I think I saw some friends in the chat from Israel, 
I think I saw my friend Jay Harwood out there and Jay is uh, Jay I know from ISU and, and Jay also is from Tampa Bay, Florida, crazy enough, but lives in Israel and we met in Israel. Um, I'm just trying to scan for any other open comments or questions. So again, those who've asked about the audible version, the audio version of the book, it's not done yet, but soon. So just be patient. But uh, yeah, soon. So and I and I and I mean that sincerely. Um, but sign up over at spacesopenforbusiness.com. We can get you updates on that release. Um, and also, you can go to um, I think it's dot com slash book and dot com bonuses has all the info. So let's see. So we've got um, maybe I maybe I will show. Let me find one more five one more video or something before I can show before. A Y. Um, yeah, yeah, he's all good. He's still setting up. So he's still setting up while he's uh, before our intro. But it's all good. You take your time. I'm not trying to stress him out. <laughs> yeah, all, you know he he's uh, he's setting up. So I feel like we're getting like backstage perspective. I don't want to. Um, Yes, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna just look here for a moment at my folder here for um, video. I wanna show a video one more time. It's brief, but I'm gonna show a video again from my friend Nahum, who's also a fantastic. Um, he's a, a lecturer at the International Space U University. I'm gonna go back to a screen share here. Just one moment. So wait, wanna, Thank you, Dana. You're welcome to hang out here. Do we're gonna, I'm gonna screen share, show a short video, and then come back with um, uh, our next guest, AY. So I'm gonna, let's see here, hopefully, nope, uh, videos. So Nahum is, uh, he's based in Berlin and he's an artist. He's actually originally from Mexico. And we are colleagues at International Space University, and he, he's teaching there too. And he's uh, an artist and performer. He specializes in, 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 in space. That's his, his, his domain and field. So I'm going to sh share a short video, and he'll share about the video or the experience that he's curating as part of the book bonuses packages. Book bonus packages. The cloud. Okay, we're recording. Hi, Robert here again, and I'm with my good friend and former colleague from ISU, Nahum. Nahum, thank you so much for joining today and welcome to the virtual launch party. We had to record this because um, it was just a lot easier logistically. Um, and Nahum, tell, tell, tell the audience a bit about your, yourself and your work. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Robert. And once again, congratulations for the book launch. Uh, it's phenomenal, and I've got my copy here. So there you go. Everyone should get a copy of this. So, uh, so what we are planning to do is uh, an artistic experience. I'm an artist, and for the last decade, I've been uh, involved in space activities, but from the artistic uh, uh, side, uh, I have uh, done. Uh, space missions with the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. We've been doing performances in zero gravity. Currently, we have an artwork in the International Space Station that interacts to people's heartbeats on Earth, and so on, so on, so on. But what we are planning to do for this book launch is to uh, take you into a journey, into a journey that happens in your mind, but it will feel real and it will become part of your memories and your experiences and it involves walking on a very remote celestial body that is awesome and um what what inspired you to create this experience it started with a critique that only a few men and only men uh, walked on the moon. So I wondered uh, what if we could change that? What if today more people on Earth uh, remember having that experience on their own? So we employ something called hypnosis uh, to have this experience. 
Um, so we started. I started doing it in theaters all around the world, and and the stories and the memories and the experiences that people were narrating after the hypnotic uh, trip uh, were fantastic. So I kept doing it uh, with really beautiful results. And, and and so you had said that you had been typically doing this in theater experiences. So since we're as we're speaking now during the times of COVID nineteen. Um, I think you've shared in previous conversations with me that you can't successfully do this with a smaller group um, with an online live experience. Exactly. This uh, will be the first online experience, but the beauty of hypnosis is that you don't need much. You only need two things, to listen and my voice, so I can take you into that uh, place. I, I like to think that uh, hypnosis is the ultimate virtual reality experience that we can have and the most profound one because it, it happens in our minds. Imagine that it's a theater of the mind. So everything that you need is here. Thank you so much. Uh, so Nahum, where can people find you um, online and learn more about your work? And, um, and we'll put some of these links hopefully in the, in the chat too as this is being played. Fantastic. Well, you can find me in every single social media with the handler at Nahum, my name, N-A-H-U-M, artist, all together, Nahum Artist. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you name it. Cool. Well, Nahum, we're so, we're so excited to be able to um, have you as part of the book launch in the virtual book launch today and hope that people, will, um, a lot of people get to experience um, this, you know, this journey to another celestial body. So thank you, Nahum, for joining us today. Thank you, Robert, and congratulations. Thank you. Okay, let's just see, before we bring our, our next guest in, I'll just show, for those who've not seen it, we'll just do a little, little walkthrough of the, of the space rush. This is the, the bonuses we're offering. They're greater than $55 million in bonus prizes. And that's for real. So um, have you ever thought about flying in zero gravity? Um, we have a zero gravity flight as, or zero gravity flights as part of it. Seeing a rocket launch in person, visiting a working spaceport, um, have a dessert prepared for you on the International Space Station and brought back to your door. Uh, preserving your name on the moon or your legacy, which will include several things, not just your name, on, for eternity. Um, what about actually visiting space? Yeah, you, visiting space. Um, that's actually part of the, the bonuses. So if you come over to the bonus site, which is just spacesopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses, you can see we've got some different packages, the Earthrise bonuses, Moonrise bonuses, Martian Alliance bonuses, and the solar system bonuses. Um, and again, I, I, I took this idea from a, my friend June recommended this from uh, Tim Ferriss. Um, and uh, we've got some really awesome, awesome things here. So I think we are close to, I'm gonna just give a little like little talk, a little, I'm gonna vamp here a little bit while um, our next guest gets ready. And um, he is, he's an entrepreneur and artist and his name is A.Y. Young. He's a founder of something called Battery Tour. And he's first and foremost a musician, performer, entertainer, and a sustainability advocate. And he's known for using music as a vehicle to promote sustainability, mental health, and more. Um, he's got some awesome videos that I've, that I've, uh, um, that I've, that are available. We can share some links. Um, he, um, he's got some accolades. I don't know if I can share some of the big ones that are un unannounced, but um, if, if he wants to share later during the talk, well, um, we can go into that. Um, so he is, um, we, we had connected actually through uh, Marco Van Dev, who's on the webinar, my, my, my friend and colleague here helping me with um, the social media. And Marco, um, Marco connected me with, um, with AY and his co-founder Thor doing, uh, essentially they're bringing, uh, they're powering music concerts using sustainable energy and, and advocating for that and putting that into practice. 
and we, we had some nice conversations about where the intersection of uh, space and, um, and, and sustainability and improving life uh, for everyone on the planet. And, and we have um, we had a, a lot of a lot of mutual interests, and so I'm really pleased that AY can it was going to probably be one of our one of our last guests today to help close it out, and we're going to initially start with the musical offering and want to thank AY for, um, for yeah uh, for making that available. So can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. What's can, up? Yeah, we are doing great. We've been on this kick, and actually, we spoke or we did a sound check early this morning. So, uh, you know, hopefully, it pans out where it works now, <laughs> and not just in the sound check. You know, I think it's gonna be great. So, um, I guess I will ask if anybody who is a panelist to just put yourself on mute out of respect for AY's performance, and then we'll 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 talk with it. We'll talk afterwards. Well, what's up, guys? As you're getting yourself on mute, I'm happy to be here. Robert, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, let's try it. Let's try a little, little music. So this song is called Save the Planet. I made this as a sustainability anthem for the world. Hey. Hey, save the planet. We gon' save the planet, everybody looking at us like we from another planet. Save the planet, we gon' save the planet, everybody looking at me like I'm from another planet. Save the planet, we gon' save the planet, everybody looking at me like I'm from another planet. Save the planet, we gon' save the planet, everybody looking at me like I'm from another planet. Hey. They acting like we from another planet, Mars. They say climate change ain't a thing. What you talking about? What you know about that? What your carbon offset? Yeah, we just wanna act, we ain't sitting back. Solar power, wind and solar power. Everybody need the energy, let's store it up in power. The world, recycle, we need more recycle. But you're acting like some followers on Instagram and Twitter. Yeah. So tick tock, drop the clock starts now, plug in, baby. Hey. So tick tock, hey. Clock starts now, plug in, baby. Here we go. So tick tock, don't let the ball drop. The clock starts now, plug in, baby. Hey, it's time to come together. Get the world plugged in, guys. Hey, say the planet. We gon' say the planet. Everybody looking at me like I'm from another planet. Hey, say the planet. We gon' say the planet, everybody looking at me like I'm from another planet. Hey, say the planet. We gon' say the planet, everybody looking at me like I'm from another planet. We gon' say the planet, everybody looking at me like I'm from another planet. Hey, say the planet. We gon' say the planet, everybody looking at me like I'm from another planet. Yeah, say the planet. We gon' say the planet, everybody looking at me like I'm from another planet. We gon' save the planet, everybody looking at us like we from another planet, yeah. Save the planet, Robert save the planet, everybody looking at us like we from another planet, yeah. Oh, thank you guys. <laughs> how was that? It came out great. I hope it sounded good. I have no idea how it, I have no idea how it sounded. I hope it sounded cool. Yeah, it sounded oh. like, the, got it like the sound check. Great. Oh, great. Oh, man, that's awesome. It worked virtually. We did it. We did it, yeah. Um, well, you know, I'd love to, if any of the other people on the um, the panelists would love to even, you know, can turn on your video. Um, we can have a chat here with AY, too. Um, you're welcome to um, to, yeah, to join talk. us. Leandro and Dana or Marco. I know we just lost Remco. It was pretty late there for him, and he was getting tired, so he just had to sign off. But he said thank you, everyone. So that was that was super fun. I, 
Ay, what was the what was the inspiration starting this this journey and doing like sustainability power and with with music? Were you kind of work gigging and sort of said, "God, this is kind of a dirty industry," or like what? that was part of it too? <laughs> no, it, it, honestly, it evolved over time. You know, like I got off the X Factor TV show, and ultimately at, at that time, I just wanted to say hey to the world. I just wanted to get people to hear my music. And, I, you know, just like in any field or in an entrepreneurial space, there's gatekeepers, right? And I would try to open up for Wiz Khalifa or T-Pain or some of these guys I loved. And they'd be like, hey, well, do you have 10 million followers? You know, or how many Instagram likes do you have? So I was like, okay, well, I got to figure out how to power a concert anywhere. So I, I obsessed over energy stores and learned about how I could store renewable energy and batteries and power a concert. So that's when I started. Right. And, and over time, things progress. I'm performing. I look back. I'm like, I'm a Y. And oh, this is the battery tour because I saw batteries and then people would donate and they'd be like, oh, yo, we're your outlets. We powered the tour. And that's when I realized everyone in the world is an outlet for change and like plugged into each other. We can do anything. And that led me on that journey that we're on now, getting the world plugged in. Have you have you come across a specific um, battery or type of storage that it, you know that you love and you're like God? It's just a little too expensive, but you're like, gosh, if it only could come down in price a little bit. Um, uh, uh, are there like you know you know what I mean? Something that you're like that you've seen, it's available. It's just maybe not widely available that you. Um, I mean, yeah. gosh. Go ahead. Yeah, because I mean, you have like Elon Musk with Tesla, and they're building power banks, I don't know, or power walls, I don't know to get for people's homes. And people are putting solar panels in their booth and they're putting in chargers for the car. And essentially they're building up infrastructure to make, because we, we've not done a very good job as a society around storing energy. People don't realize it's like, it's like either on or off. There's exactly. No I mean, that's why, I mean, I, I think that's why I'm here, right? Is, is to find out a way to use music, to use entertainment. Uh, overall as a vehicle to raise awareness with the, uh, an issue like energy storage and to, uh, you know, engage Generation Z and millennials. Now, I'll say this, you know, Battery Tour has been a platform for a lot of, th a lot of things. We've also used Battery Tour to promote, to develop and deploy sustainable solutions in general, right? So it could be a foot pedal that you charge and can, uh, uh, you know, power a, a, a cell phone which we've used to deploy around the world to get villages and places access to energy. I also built technology. I call it the outlet. It's an energy storage device. Now the cell technology within the batteries that within the device that I invented with my partner is not the best cell technology. And so, yes, there's times that I look at Tesla and I say, well, I can't wait to work with Elon, right? I mean, why, why I'm powering concerts. It's like, if I'm working with Elon's batteries, you're talking about powering the, uh, Justin Bieber's next tour, right? What can we do when you're talking about working with like, say utility companies who we're working with now and, and improving their messaging, messaging with energy efficiency or beneficial electrification? What can we do with better technology? There's a lot of great stuff out there. I just think that the battery tour, the organization and myself, I meant to plug in, to connect, to collaborate with those manufacturers and corporations to build something great and use this thing as a voice, right? So I'll say that if, if that answers your question, yeah. as far as technology. Sure. <laughs> and I, I like that you had the lyrics at the end about the ocean. Sometimes people forget because they don't like right? they the beach and they don't, you know, there's this growing pla uh, plastic issue. It's not just plastic going in the oceans, but all sorts of stuff. And, and they're finding that, you know, okay, so maybe it just gets into smaller pieces. <laughs> it's still there. It's just smaller pieces. And we think that it's like, oh, well, we don't see it. It's not a problem. And going yeah, that out of sight, out of mind thing is going to just kill us, man. <laughs> it's really? going to kill us. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm curious. I mean, you were, I, I read in your bio actually today that you're an Eagle Scout. And when you were, uh -huh. um, when you were, uh, you know, my, my wife and I've been on this kick. Mostly, she really enjoys these shows like uh, Alone and um, what's it? What's the other show? Naked, Naked and Afraid. And they put these like survivalists out there, or out there. And yeah, uh, but there's a certain amount of like, you know, they have to just survive with what they have. And and if humans are going to go into space, they're going to have to survive with whatever they can can use. But I think we also have to get better at just doing things here, you know. Uh, yeah, that that that's more that's more on that tip of like the localism thing idea too, right? Community yeah. localism. 
Uh, yeah, I, I believe in that concept. And yeah, let's talk about space too, because uh, you know, this is your realm and it's interesting how these, these two worlds intersect when you talk about sustainability, when you talk about, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I love to get your perspective on, on, on space for sure. Huh? 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 Yeah, I, and so there's this, um, this idea in the space community about using solar power and beaming it to, to Earth. And it's still, wow. which is, it's still kind of, it, it's like it polarizes people in the space community. Either people are like, they tend to be, not always, they tend to be either like they hate it or they love it. Now That's I've heard, dope. I, but uh, in, uh. so the, the U.S. Air Force has an experiment on their, um, one of their, their space, their, I guess it's called the X-37B. It's this unmanned little, it looks like a little shuttle. And apparently there's an experiment um, related to, to space-based solar power and the Chinese government investing in it heavily. So there's still some technical unknowns, but the big issue was always um, getting to space was too expensive, but they said now that it's becoming less expensive, you could actually do that because you could put these large, you could put solar power stations and you could send either lasers or microwave um, and wow. I think it's maybe a third way of course to send to send energy and yeah. people say well you'd have to build um like a, a a big solar farm it might be pretty large but saying well we already have large terrestrial solar farms um so i think it's an area um it sounds like it's maybe a a 20 year type of thing from the experts uh -huh. that i've heard i know a lot of the advocates for it say like if we had it today you could talk about you know bringing like a billion plus people out of poverty and um and, and plus it's car carbon free and mm -hmm. you know could exactly. totally change uh, a lot of the paradigm into or geopolitics you know because you know oil is essentially a lot of uh, you know our lifeblood for so many things um so i find it interesting but you know it's a, it's just not ready yet but there's but they're researching and they're looking at it um that's, that is incredible. Uh, you're making me think about, so there's something you should check out one day. He's a good friend of mine named Damon. Uh, and he's an Australian director. Made a film called 2040. It like, is like the number one documentary of all time in Australia. But I say this to say he made a film called 2040 about what if the world used everything that we could do and use now. You know, not inventing something new or like you're talking about with some of those advancements what could we do now? And, and that brings me to a little bit more of what we we're talking about with the energy storage is like, at the end of the day, we could be storing energy in microgrids and powering neighborhoods now. Like we can get people access to energy that can then get people access to internet and education. You know, even now before, uh, I didn't even know the space stuff is possible. That's incredible. I can't wait to regurgitate that as I move forward of like what's, what's, what's possible. And that's why it's important for our worlds to collide and talk, whether it's the music world and entertainment and content space that I'm in, or the energy and all these other kind of SDG like spaces need to be talking to people like you, Robert, with that perspective uh, that you have. Yeah, I think it's really about uh, trying to see where the connection points and there's mutual interest and sh shared interest because we sometimes like go in our little bubble or, uh, you know, our little chamber and we just get focused like this, but we're still all on Spaceship Earth. And um, so it, it's, it's really about, you know, trying to find uh, uh, solutions today to some difficult challenges. And um, and I don't, and, and, and no one person has all the answers. It's, that's the, uh, but that's the great thing about being human. We've got team human that we're all on to, uh, to, uh, yes, uh, that we're all outlets for change, man. We're all outlets. <laughs> that's what I say. Huh? So, I mean, I'm curious. I saw you had, um, uh, some, it looked like some gear in the background that you were using, um, to, uh, patch in some, uh, you know, pre-recorded loops and, and stuff like that. Um, do you, um, do you, are you, taking some of the same uh this rig that you have equipment is this what you'll take essentially you can do it from a room or you also do it like outdoors is it sort of the same yeah 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 i mean as far as like as a musician i'm always curious about the gear uh, some of the gear you see that my that that's a piece of technology i built the briefcase the outlet okay right now, right now it's uh plugged up right now just kind of charging from, from the but that's uh you know what i'm plugging into uh-huh but uh yeah i mean uh I, it's hard for me to show you the battery tour in all its glory uh it's hard for me to show you the battery tour um 
uh, just only a couple of pieces here. I just did an event yesterday. But yeah, this is all some of this stuff that you'll see. You know, it's like a full we concert. Your, we just lost your video. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Did you lose my video? Yeah. Oh, that's odd. Oh, okay. Here, let me put it back on. There we go. You there it goes. Back. Yep, back. Okay, he didn't seem... Okay, well, all, all I was saying is, yeah, I mean, this is a couple of pieces of... I, I do a full concert, so, man, like, it's... it's the double speakers and keyboard and sometimes there's a drummer or a band, you know, it just depends on what city or state we're in, you know, as far as the physical engagement, you know. And, and then, so what is, so with um, assuming that, you know, COVID stuff's going to kind of, uh, you know, eventually get worked out, what's, what's in store for you and your co-founder Thor, Thor, who, um, um, with Battery Tour, what's, what do you guys uh, Yeah. Well, I, I mean, there's two things, right? There's A, Y, me. I'm like an artist and musician yep. and all that stuff, right? And so there's this whole thing going on now with being, a, you know, a young world leader. Uh, the, the UN just made the appointment. So on the 18th, there's that national or global, like, announcement. And that's going to really push a lot, thing, a lot of things forward. But when it comes to Battery Tour, we're really happy. We just got out of the Clean Tech Open Accelerator with Battery Tour. So we've been doing that the last nine weeks. We've built out like the digital piece and the digital offerings for the battery tour, which are really awesome. XR, VR, AR stuff. I mean, it's incredible. It, it will allow, uh, it's, I can't talk too much about it, man. But uh, with that being said, we've identified our customers, which are utility companies specifically starting off with, with the battery tour for profit side. And we've been able to partner with eSource, which is like the leading service provider in America for utilities. And so we're launching into the utility space, helping utilities be a voice for, uh, uh, helping utilities as a voice for their sustainability, essentially helping them with their messaging for Generation Z and millennials, helping them uh, with providing them with content to engage their customers. Uh, to do actions, you know, whether it's energy efficiency stuff or it's some of this beneficial electrification programming that they try so hard to execute, you know, battery tours essentially, whether it's physical engagements or through our digital uh, platform that we're launching here, uh, we are just really happy to be able to like, yeah, to launch this uh, like with, with the best in the, in the, in the business. So, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. That's what's new for Battery Tour. And then as, you know, as we, you know, as we continue to grow and as things are growing and as this announcement happens, I mean, ultimately the goal for Battery Tour is always to get the world plugged in. There's over a billion people that lack access to energy. So we've got a lot of work to do, man. <laughs> you know, you think about like, you know, earlier I was talking about people who don't have access to internet. There are people that don't have access to electricity. Yeah, and if you don't have the basics. We were talking about this, I think, this morning. You know, electricity and clean water, or, or yesterday. Um, yeah, I mean, how can you expect to get, you know, to give someone a fair chance in life? You know, uh, um, well, you can. I mean, and it's crazy. Like, uh, I've spent a lot of time in developing nations. I mean, Haiti, Honduras, all these places. I've not only brought music, which most of them never had, had experienced music other than their cell phone, but they have cell phones but they might have to walk eight miles to get a charge and they pay for their food on their cell phone, but they don't have access. So it doesn't even make sense, man. So, you know, uh, when I talk about getting the world plugged in, when I talk about making the battery cool again and using the battery tour as a vehicle to, to do and drive these things, I, I'm a huge believer in energy being the base resource. I, again, like we talked about getting people energy, then you can get people internet, you know, like I said earlier, and then, yeah, educating people, you know, this is how we can educate people on what's going on in space and what's possible. You know, you're, you're I haven't even read your book yet. And by the way, congratulations, bro. This is awesome. If Thank anyone's you. listening, give them a clap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank clap you. it up. You're, you did it, bro. This is amazing. And I can't wait to like advocate for this thing and just like read all of it. Uh, Cause you know, uh, I don't read as many books as I used to, you know, when I was an Eagle Scout, you know, but uh, you know, this one I'm going to read, you know, so. <laughs> well, you can also do the audio. We're going to have the audio book. Dana, who is talking right before you was the, is the narrator for the, uh, the audio book. So some people like that, you know? Um, yeah. I like old fashioned books, but uh, I like the book. <laughs> I like yeah, the book. I like, it's just like sometimes just making the time. I usually will have several books open at one time. <laughs> 
Yeah, did you hit you? We connected when the freaking the United Nations is like about to re release my name to the world and be like, this is a young leader. Like, so yeah, I'm really. So, so what can what can you what can you share what can you share about that um, about that group that they that they're about to announce and kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Can you share a bit of shit more? Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> We're actually talking to the uh, the UN envoy and the Secretary General tomorrow morning at seven o'clock. So that's going to be an interesting call. We've had a couple so far, but essentially it's this, man. It's the United Nations saying that hey, these seventeen people are changing the world and are going to change the world, right? They're going to help us achieve these SDGs, like these crazy global goals of universal access to energy or uh, universal education or all these different goals that are actually called the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, right? And so it's like, well, how does that function? Okay, you know, I wondered that too before our first call. Like, what are they going to do? Uh, well, essentially, they're an extension of self. They literally said, hey, AY, you know, we're here for your music. AY, you know, your music, your career, and we're here for your startup battery tour. And, you know, whatever you need, whoever you need to speak to, however we can elevate this, that's what we're here for. We have a dedicated team for that. So it's almost like we hired the UN. I'm like, oh, crap. So we even have a work plan that we're putting together that I can't wait to put together with your oversight, Robert, and your uh, knowledge as we uh, you know, work in this two-year this two kind of thing of like, hey, I'm a voice for the youth of the world. You know, how can we, uh, you know, take those steps uh, that are needed in all these areas? Thank you. And, you know, today you're, I think, our first, uh, and that's, that's awesome. I hope, the, I hope you're able to leverage all of that because, I mean, having access to, you're going to be meeting so many different types of high-level people and other leaders from around yeah, the world. Yeah, tons of high level people. So actually, really the, yeah. maximize, maximize the crap out of it, you know, because um, it'll probably go by pretty quickly, you know. Um, uh, right. Oh, well, so, that, that's, that's one reason why I'm so adamant about this work plan and getting some of this stuff baked in. Because uh, my, my macro vision is so large. And so I'm not going to let that get ahead of me. But go, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Uh, another question. <laughs> So you're you're in um, you're in Kansas. I think you're in Kansas City right now, allegedly. Um, right. No. Right now. Okay. Right, right now. now. <laughs> okay. So, do you ever hear? Or do people ever locally ever talk much about like space? Like whether it's you hear about SpaceX or Virgin Galactic? Do do, do you ever hear any people sort of say that's a thing? They don't yeah. care. I would definitely say that in the Midwest. In Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, like this area, uh -huh. not r rarely at all. Uh, my partner, Thor, who I feel like is a genius, he's talked about that kind of stuff nonstop. He, he, you know, he talks about atmospheric water generation and, you know, all this waste to, you know, waste of food, business model stuff and turning uh, waste to energy. And, you know, he's, he's into some really awesome stuff, which is why I think you guys love each, would love each other even more. But not too much, man. But you, you have to understand, you know, I was doing, you know, 200 renewable energy powered concerts in Kansas City, Missouri, in and around it, you know, in 2012 and roughly every year, 2013, 2014. And it wasn't until like, I feel like 2000 and and 17 around in this area where people were like, hey, that's that's sustainable. And I was like, what's sustainable? I didn't even know what that was oh, then, Matt. You know, this stuff built really quickly and I, I learned like through doing it. So like I would definitely say this is a more conservative, like the, the Midwest is a lot different than like, say, California and New York, where they get their fashion from or right where the artists come out of or L.A. or, or, or Atlanta. Right. So I was but I would definitely say if you're in the right spaces, no matter where you are. Right. You're going to have. And maybe I'm not in all the right spaces. I mean, we do have multiple universities. I know there are people that this is their life or what they think about, you know, at, at UMKC, at these different places. So I know it exists, but I, I, you know, what I would say is the general public isn't plugged in. It's the same thing with energy storage. It's like the general public that cares about Cardi B or like popular culture, you know, might, might know of Elon Musk, but maybe not as deep as what you're saying. And we, I think we should fix that. Yeah, because I, I think we kind of need these things. It's like the energy storage, access to space. I think they're actually somehow linked, you know, because even if let's just say Elon says, oh, we, we're, we're able to go to Mars right now, you're going to need energy storage there. You're going to need energy 
you know, uh, the energy storage and, 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 and transmission of it and, uh, are, are all going to be necessary other places. Um, and that was so, my question to you. What do you think about that? Because I'm hearing well, rumblings of like eventually sending groups out to live there and da da da. Well, like, is it going to happen? Yeah, I think it's going to happen. It's just not, I, it depends on when. Right now, so Elon wants to have like a million people by the end of the century on Mars, maybe. But it's all dependent on all these other things. We still don't know. Like Mars has has less gravity than Earth. We don't really know, and it has a weaker magnetic field. And so, getting there is everybody going to get cancer <laughs> and like die along the way because of you know they don't have enough shielding? Can they thrive in a place with um, in in the, in the harsh conditions of Mars? There's, these things were still kind of like they need to be tested. I think eventually they're gonna like we'll have people there. I suspect my personal belief is that we're going to have to have larger artificial space stations that are using one that are spinning and basically creating artificial gravity. And that would be a way. So oh, wow. Yeah. Have, I think people living in like comfortable park like environments, you see some of the old, there's lots of uh, space artwork showing these big space stations where thousands, if not more people are being imagined. Um, I think that's kind of maybe where it is. The timeline's always tricky. Some things come really fast. Some things are really slow. So difficult to predict. Although, that sucks. I, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be alive then, bro. We're going to be gone, bro. Well, like, I, think, but look, it could be uh, that. Well, it would be, I mean, look, people like Jeff Bezos want to do these things. So maybe him and Elon will go fast enough so we can get to see some of these things. It's possible. I, I would say don't rule it out, but... Um, but um, I think it probably all has to go a lot faster. And there's areas of research that they're not doing enough of, like can an embryo grow in zero gravity? They don't think so. They think it needs, they think to have a baby, you kind of need gravity. So for, for full term, so there's- Yeah, like, that makes sense. These, yep. are these kind of outstanding questions that have to be figured out. But then you have to also have people that are thinking about um, if we're all living in an underground city how's our psychological state going to be and if it has to be underground what do we have to do to make it pleasant exactly i don't, don't want to live in a i mean being in a cave for a couple days might be kind of fun but i wouldn't want to spend like decades months exactly. even months like just living like a world you know in yeah a cave. i was i was telling my friend that too i was like you know it, you wouldn't be able there wouldn't be an outside to go to though right you would yeah would, i mean the, the worst place you can think of on the planet, you just think it's in your mind, was some place you just don't like. It is nicer than any place on Mars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, basically what you have to do is create, it's like a movie or it's like the, the one film, there's like a TV show on Netflix, I forgot what it's called, but uh, 24. So, I don't know, these people like go to space and live in space, but you got to make yeah. a utopia spaceship essentially, yeah. right? Yeah, you have like, to have like things where like people are in a shirt sleeve environment, parks and trees, and I think things like that. Sounds, sounds massive. It like it a massive, sound... massive project. Yeah, yeah. But this is why part of the this is um, the requirement is that you can make the access to space low cost. And then once you do that, it's not taking all the material all the, the the stuff to space you're also talking about using robot robots to make other robots and to make machines so you're going to do a lot of manufacturing within space that's pretty much oh. good. you're not just going to have a bunch of like 10,000 astronauts all kind of like on a construction site building a stadium it's going to be probably a lot of robots with a few human oversight probably i mean sure i guess i could be wrong but that's my, my guess yeah no that's cool still um, yeah. So it's it's just uh, um, and I would love you know for for those who are um, passionate about you know climate change and 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 improving our lot on Earth, you know, look at look at just go even if you don't read my book, go to Google or whatever search engine you use Bing or whatever if anybody uses that, and you can type in you can just you can use um, type in NASA spinoffs. And they used to print a magazine. Now I think it's just a website. And I think they update it about quarterly. 
and it lists technology spin-offs, and this is technology developed at NASA that eventually somehow gets commercialized or put into some type of use, water purification, air purification. There's thousands of these things, and you can go to their website and explore that. For those who say, oh, what is this doing for me? How is this helping the planet? And we'll see how, how um, you know, if anything, we need NASA as like for R&D. As, as the commercial providers are starting to help NASA out on contract. But um, NASA has, still has an important place. And, 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 and I think we're going to start seeing um, more benefits, applications being developed in space. Because right now, or for many years, the astronauts on the space station were basically glorified janitors. <laughs> they were like, uh, who's cleaning the toilet today? Like, you know, they, they had limited time to actually do real um, science work because they were busy with maintenance. And, you know, but as we get commercial space stations, there's a company called Axiom Space, uh, a real company, private company out of um, Houston, and they are developing a private uh, commercial space station. It'll initially attach to the International Space Station, but eventually detach and they'll make their own independent free flying one. And they want to make this so that whether it's companies or or other countries that's that don't, amazing that don't that don't want to build their own space station they basically it's like a real estate play you know send somebody up for a month or a few weeks so they can do this important uh, type of work so there's a lot of important infrastructure that's being built in space that's going to allow and then allow other creatives to do things and early Thing that's happening or i think it's in progress is the actor producer tom cruise is announced that he wants to do or is intending to do a film he's got a budget on the space station and i think it's going to be him and his director are going to go to the space station and shoot on it <laughs> he would be the one man like he would tom cruise like does it all bro i don't he think really he does. has a script yet or i don't even know if it's a yeah. story but people are just interested in the concept of it but as yeah, the he, price he, yeah, of these awesome. things become more affordable, people will come up with all sorts of very creative uses with this with this domain. So it let this not be just a place strictly for like the elites. Yes. I mean, part of my yes. goal is just like that 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 we're already on spaceship Earth. We're already citizens of the of Earth and the solar system. So we should you know. We, we can all participate. It's just um, taking some time, you know, to, to even out. So, Mike, I have a question then. So, yeah. do, so do you think the future is space or sustainability? If that's the question. I think it's kind of both because you need sustainability to be, I think, a, in, for, certain, for many smart space activities. And uh, I think you kind of, it's kind of, I think you need, I think, a mindset should be how do you optimize with what you have and plan for the future that so that you um the um like in like when we burn fossil we say we or we're using fossil fuels and the externalized caught you've got this the smokestacks and you've got potential acid acidification of the oceans acid rain um other climate change related issues maybe polluted waterways but many, for many years, those costs weren't taken into account. They were externalized costs, but they were like, not my problem. So, okay, kids get cancer. Um, we also now know that many um, uh, poor communities, it was actually typically in many uh, African-American communities were suffering from more air pollution than wealthier communities. And literally they have found that the design of these um, cities um we're affecting the way pollution flows i mean uh, and literally from like the design um and if we so so back to back to creating energy i think with energy if you if now people are even conscious going oh okay yeah i could get asthma i could get cancer i could have polluted water people are now just realizing that's an issue so going okay we have to start addressing those things and i think some of the comparable in space is a little different because you know, you could do, you can do dirtier activities in space, and it's not as much of a problem. But yeah, and see, I, I had a question with that because people talk about moving some of that polluting stuff. You know, yeah, out of so Earth. That, like, what about getting rid of our trash there? Like, what I mean, what do you it, think it's about? It's not really, that? A, it's not really. A, I mean, it's not efficient enough just to like take our garbage up to space. 
we'll probably have to do something smarter with just instead of just burying it in landfills. And I've thought about that, like how do we repurpose the things or, or say we're putting less stuff. But one area of like pollution in the, 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 the earth is in orbit where we have dead satellites that sometimes collide into each other and they break apart and it creates um, space junk or it's called space debris. And now, right now, what they're doing for, for years, they've been doing and they're getting better at this is tracking the pieces. They can track it down to essentially like a paint chip, if not a little smaller, but it's moving so fast that if it hits a person or a, um, a spacecraft, it can be a, a bad day. So they're now trying to figure out, okay, how do we, first of all, count and monitor everything that's the current garbage? How do we reduce the amount of stuff that's going to become garbage? And then there's actually now for-profit companies looking at how do we recycle the spacecraft? There's actually some projects that are going on right now to either recycle materials in space and repurpose them. So that, because we need to make sure that we're good stewards of the, um, they call it the lower earth orbit environment. That's like about up to about a couple thousand miles altitude because that's that's it's really sacred territory. We need to, to, uh, to treat it well. Awesome, that's dope. Hopefully, um, well, I want to thank you so much for, for joining us, AY. I want to tell our, our guests listening live and archive with AY Young. Again, he's a musician, performer, and founder of a Battery Tour. Um, and um, where do we have, uh, I'm like looking at some of the, you know, Instagram, AY Music, and it's music with a K, AY Music, and yes, BatteryTour.com, and, um, and also uh, AY Music or excuse me, ay-music.com. Is that right? I get that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the website, I think you can just put ay-music.com. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's perfect. Or just search A-Y Young, you know, however you can find me, man. Um, beautiful. Well, again, thank you so much for, um, it was a great way to sort of, I think, uh, close out the um, awesome um, this virtual launch party. So um, I'll, I'm going to just, talk a little more before I end the stream. I want to thank all of my guests today. It was uh, a really um, fantastic afternoon, uh, morning into afternoon um, around the world. Um, we had so many great guests today. I'm going to go through a few names. We, we just had A.Y. Young. Uh, we started off the day with Janet Ivey from Janet's Planet. Um, we had um, the great people at Draper University. We had T. Burr, Tanya Ridgely, Rachel Lines, Executive Director from Space for Humanity, um, Scott Farr, Rick Tomlinson, Nahum, Frank White, David S. Rose, who wrote my the forward to the book, Space is Open for Business, um, Alan Clary, um, Sean Whitehead with Scout Tech, uh, Mary Liz Bender, Ryan Chinlinski um, from Cosmic Perspective, Kartik Kumar, who works with Sat Search, Keegan Kirkpatrick of Space Advisors, Redworks, and uh, Brave New Space Podcast. Van, Van Espabodi from Starburst. Um, ben Haldeman from LifeShip. Dr. Armin Ellis of Exploration Institute. Um, Pamela Hoffman of Everyday Spacer. Leandro Taub uh, on his own, but also collaborating with, with me and all my team. Um, we had Elizabeth Kennick from Teachers in Space. Ryan Holmes from Space VR. Dana Day, uh, my book narrator. I want to encourage people to share the uh, share about the book. Um, oh, I've got my little guest to my my kitten out. Oh, here she is. She's not too pleased about being handed off. This is Luna, a little space kitty. Got to have a space kitty. Woo! Space kitty. Yeah, she's cute. She had her six month birthday yesterday. And um, my wife Michelle for thanking for for um, doing art design on, on the book cover and uh, some narration on the uh, book preview video and setting up, um, helping set up my desk space today and getting me, keeping me food and hydrate, kept me fed and hydrated. And let's see my editor uh, again, Vanessa DeHorsey and the video editor who's helped out some uh, Shen, she rocks. And uh, also there's Hayward Bracey. Also, uh, he wasn't on with us live today. He's been a bit, he's a total digital ninja. Um, awesome um, UX and digital designer, Hayward Bracey. I think he's got a presence on Beyonce. Um, 
uh, my team with Jonathan, Tab, and Leandro helping really smart precision around the, the marketing and e-commerce have been helpful. Um, earlier on, I had, I had some uh, marketing help from Yasmin Denari and uh, Danny Salinas. So thank everyone so much. And so many of the contributors who had contributed to the book directly or indirectly um, living no longer with us. I want to thank, um, thank everyone for their uh, significant contributions and um, you know the early book reviews and all that. So please share the word, spread the message about Spaces Open for Business. Um, the URL is just spacesopenforbusiness.com. We have some fantastic bonuses. So go to spacesopenforbusiness.com slash bonuses or slash book. Um, essentially, you'll, you'll, you can see variations. Um, share with your friends. Uh, get this into libraries and other places. And, um, and again, you know, the subtitle of the book is The Industry That Can Transform Humanity. And I think that's uh, I think it's a resonant part of this. I want to appreciate everyone for hanging on uh, for this live um, uh, broadcast today, September 15th, 2020. Um, and I'm going to end the stream. For those that are still in Zoom, they can hang out for a bit. But those in um, Twitter, Facebook, and I think YouTube, we will say um, good night. So let's see here. I'm going to shut off the stream.